Everyone is busy going through their busy lives. Sung Woo steps out of a crowded bus. He seems to be pretty exhausted from his travel. He has to go through this rough bus travel daily because he's commuting from his home. His friend Han Ho makes fun of him because Sung Woo completed his harsh military service as a special forces reserve sergeant. And now he can't even bear two hours of commute. Sung Woo gets back at Han Ho by reminding him that he did not even complete his military service because of a girl, Mi Young. After hearing this insult, Han Ho becomes completely silent, and they head towards their class. On their way, Sung Woo feels a bit bad about the silence of his friend and asks him if Han Ho is crying. Han Ho points towards the sky at the top of the library building and tells Sung Woo that he saw a message in the sky saying, Downloading monsters, and that message disappeared after the timing reached 100%. Sung Woo thinks Han Ho is sad about his previous girlfriend and he is seeing things in the sky because he spends most of his time playing video games. Sung Woo tells Han Ho to snap back to reality and they both head towards their respective classes. During the lectures, Sung Woo becomes a bit dizzy and it's hard for him to stay awake. Suddenly, a blackout happens and all lights went out. A system message popped up in front of everyone in the class. It was written in the system message to pick a class which can help them in the apocalypse. After that, a 15 seconds timer started and different skill cards with stars appeared in front of the class. Some students panicked and asked others not to pick anything because it could be dangerous. Song Wu is skeptical about them and thinks not choosing a card within the 15 seconds is going to be even more dangerous. Song Wu tried to pick a warrior card with two stars, but a fat kid Min Su picked it before him and a sword appeared in his hand. Sung Woo became a bit panicked and picked a random card with the most stars. The card he picked belonged to the 5 stars necromancer class and the skill card went inside him. After the timer was up, Sung Woo and the fat kid Min Su were the only ones who had chosen any cards. The fat kid Min Su is amazed by his new sword. After a while, a student rushes in the class and there's a small monster on his back which looks like a goblin and he's constantly stabbing the shoulder of the student who is crying for help. He keeps crying for help until the goblin kills him in cold blood. Everyone starts running away from the goblin, leaving Sung Woo at the front because they think it's their turn next. Some students request Min Su to do something because he's the only guy with the sword. But Min Su is a coward and he's not quick enough to adapt to this situation. Sung Woo also thinks that depending on Min Su is useless and he has to get out of this situation on his own. The goblin plunges towards Sung Woo with his small dagger. Sung Woo thinks that he will also be done for if he gets caught up like the previous kid the goblin killed. Sung Woo kicks the goblin with all of his might which throws the goblin a bit back. Sung Woo realized that the goblin barely felt like it was 30 pounds and he can easily kill it. He picks up a chair and smashes the head of the goblin with all of his force. The goblin is defeated and he receives 10 gold from the system for defeating the goblin. Everyone is shocked after watching this. Sung Woo is quick to adapt to the situation and realizes that the world has fused with the game. While Sung Woo is busy understanding the current situation, a system message pops up which tells Sung Woo that he can command the dead under his authority. He touches the goblin skeleton option in his command list and the dead goblin behind him reanimates as a skeleton. At this point, he understands that his necromancer class allows him to summon the undead beings. Two more goblins rush inside the classroom. Sung Woo orders his undead skeleton to kill those two goblins. The skeleton plunges at one goblin and stabs him in the shoulder. The stab wound is not deep enough and he gets pushed back by the goblin. Both goblins gang up on him and start chopping off his bones one by one. Sung Woo thinks that he needs to help his skeleton and getting rid of these two goblins is easy but he needs a proper weapon so he asks Min Su for his sword but Min Su is a coward and rejects him. Sung Woo thinks he's pretty pathetic and asks him to use his sword to peel potatoes. Sung Woo picks up another chair and throws it towards the two goblins who were attacking his skeleton. The goblins are knocked back a bit by the chair and the undead skeleton seizes this chance to end them both with his knife. Sung Woo receives 20 gold for defeating both goblins. After the fight ended, Sung Woo received another system message that he has maxed out the number of minions under his authority. His classmates ask him about what he had done and he has also no idea about the ongoing events. Other students think that the same thing is happening all over the campus because they can hear screaming voices of others. But when Sung Woo opens the curtains on the windows, he witnesses fires all around the city. Some students decide that they need to leave the campus if they want to survive. In the corridor, they encounter more goblins which start chasing them, but they are all subdued by Sung Woo's undead skeletons. While Sung Woo's skeletons are fighting the goblins, he asks the other students to run away while they hold the goblins. 
Sun Wu also realized that this world is now working like a game, and he can get more stronger if he keeps killing goblins and grinding levels. Meanwhile, one of his undead skeletons gets defeated, and his head comes flying near him. Luckily, the goblins are exhausted, and his two other skeletons manage to kill them, which earns him 20 gold and a level up. He is now on level 2, and he has access to his status window. Five random skill cards appear in front of him, and he can choose one as a level up gift. He chose a card which increased his maximum number of minions by one. He can now control up to four undead skeletons at once. But he has used up most of his mana because he called up so many skeletons. Sung Woo looks outside the window and it seems like the situation outside is worse than the campus itself. While he's going downstairs with the skeletons, Han Ho gets freaked out by one of his skeletons and stabs it in the head. Han Ho becomes relieved after seeing Sung Woo alive. Sung Woo tells him that these skeletons are part of his skill. Sung Woo asks which class did Han Ho pick and Han Ho replies that he picked one star rogue class. They are both heading down the stairs with the skeletons but suddenly a message pops up saying that they have received synergy with a dagger. It turns out if 5 members of a party have a dagger equipped, they will receive a 10% fatal blow chance and 10% additional gold. While they are moving down the stairs with the skeletons they encounter another pack of goblins and there is a goblin chief among them. The goblins become affected by a skill called Scent of Death which weakens their stats by 30%. Scent of Death activates automatically when there are 4 to 5 skeletons present in a party. Skeletons start attacking the goblins but the goblin chief activates a skill called Wild Berserker which buffs all the goblins under his command. The goblins become more powerful and start pushing back the skeletons. Sung Woo knows that they are being pushed back because of the skill of the Goblin Chief, so he ordered one of his skeletons to cut off the arm of the Goblin Chief, which he is using for the Berserker skill. The skeleton manages to chop off the arm of the Chief, which weakens the Goblins, and the skeletons finish them off with ease. Goblin Chief is enraged, but he is easily killed by the skeletons working in synergy. Sung Woo receives one-handed crudded spear and the bracelet of the Goblin Chief, which he was using for the Berserker skill. He becomes a bit happy and praises one of his skeletons who starts making weird creepy noises with his bones. When they reach the entrance of the campus, they see a lot of survivors. Sung Woo orders his skeletons to hide in the copy room because people will freak out after watching them. Situation on the entrance doesn't feel any good. They are locked inside the campus and they can't go out. While Sung Woo tries to head outside using the main door, he is stopped by one of the student council members, Jin Suk, who was previously famous for being a bully and a harasser. He tells them that he is a shield master with two stars and he already killed one of the goblins. He further elaborates that everyone with a weapon should work together to defend the other students. Min Soo comes running towards Jin Suk and reports that he heard faint sound of goblins near the entrance. Jin Suk orders the students to get inside the cafe so he and the other guys with skills can protect them. Sung Woo tells Han Ho to come near the entrance of the gate. They see a message on the entrance that the entrance door has been sealed by a magical force and they need to defeat the boss monster within 2 hours and 11 minutes. If they fail to defeat the monster within a given time frame, the monsters inside the building will grow even stronger. Sung Woo now knows what he needs to do next but he is stopped by Jin Suk who wants them to hold the monsters in there until backup arrives. Sung Woo tells Jin Suk that this same thing can be happening around the whole country and waiting for a rescue team is useless but Jin Suk refutes by saying that the Korean military is more stronger than the monsters. Sung Woo has enough of this bullshit and starts heading towards the stairs but he is stopped by an approaching group of 5 goblins. Sung Woo orders his skeletons to come out. After watching the skeletons everyone freaks out because they think skeletons are part of the monsters unit. But Sung Woo tells them that they don't need to be scared because they belong to his class which is stronger than the idiot Jin Suk. Goblins get scared by the death scent skill of the skeletons and it reduces their stats by 30%. Sung Woo orders his goblins to start the hunt. Skeletons start attacking the goblins and Sung Woo helps them using his spear. Two goblins try to run but Sung Woo orders the skeletons to block their way. Sung Woo is fighting himself because he wants to show the others that defeating them is not impossible so he can persuade them to join him in boss hunting. One goblin is killed by a skeleton while the other one tries to run away but Sung Woo throws his spear which pierces the back of the goblin. Everyone is overjoyed by watching the fight. Sung Woo received a roulette ticket by the system for killing 20 monsters and he's the 34th person to complete this achievement and his rank will be increased to infinite status and there are only 100 people who are eligible for this ticket. He praises his skeletons for their work and they again start making that weird voice with their bones. Sung Woo heads inside the cafe and tells everyone that no backup is arriving and they will be killed by stronger monsters if they cannot find and kill the boss monster within the given time period. One of the students tells Sung Woo that he saw the boss monster on the rooftop and it killed his professor. 
Now he knows his next destination, but no one comes forward to join his party. Even his friend Han Ho wants to stay behind, but he forces him to come with him because he needs the knife buff for his skeletons. A 23-year-old girl, Jisoo Yoon, comes forward. She has a three-star class called Tiger Hunter. Sung Woo asks Jin Sok to come up with them, but he's a coward, so he makes an excuse that he needs to stay behind to defend the other students. Jin Sok and his party start heading towards the rooftop. They encounter some goblins on the stairs. Sung Woo heads upstairs with the skeletons to fend off the goblins, while Jisoo Yoon takes care of the two goblins coming from behind using her fast sword. Sung Woo and Han Ho are both impressed by her skill. On the upper floors, they encountered an injured Professor Huang. Professor Huang tells Sung Woo that most of his students are dead because they tried to head to the rooftop, according to the instructions of emergency evacuation manual, but they encountered the boss monster there and most of the students were killed. Professor Huang instructs Sung Woo to never go towards the rooftop and these prove to be his last words. Sung Woo receives a new exclusive quest after the death of his professor. The quest says that he can appease the grudge of the dead by defeating the boss monster within the given time limit, and this choice is going to affect his destiny. Sung Woo gets more furious and heads toward the rooftop to fight the boss with his companions. Rooftop is in a terrible state. The goblins are pillaging everything valuable from the dead bodies of the students. Sung Woo and Jisoo Yun become furious after watching it. Sung Woo uses his bracelet skill Berserker to increase the stats of his skeletons, and an all out skirmish starts on the rooftop. Everyone is fighting, which pumps Hano a bit, and he throws his knife, which hits the head of a goblin, earning him his first kill. He becomes more encouraged, which makes him feel like a character from JoJo. After encountering Scent of Death, the surviving goblins became scared and run off to their boss, the Goblin Captain. After hearing the roar of the Goblin Captain, the goblins' morale rises and they start attacking Sung Woo's party, but they are still no match for his skeletons. On the other hand, the Goblin Captain starts smashing skeletons one by one. Sung Woo can make more skeletons from the corpses, but it depletes his mana. Hano throws two knives at the boss, which are blocked by the shoulder of the boss. This makes the boss more furious, and he starts charging towards Han Ho. The skeletons try to save him, but two of them get easily smashed by one hit of the boss. One of them survives and manages to land a hit. While boss is busy taking care of the last skeleton, Jisoo Yun takes advantage of this opening and slashes the boss, which wounds him a little bit. Sung Woo starts fighting more strategically and uses his skeletons as bait, while he throws his spear towards the boss, which slashes his cheek a bit. The boss becomes more agitated and smashes some of the skeletons of Sung Woo. Now Sung Woo has barely enough mana left for a last skeleton summon. Sung Woo sees a sword stuck in the rubble, and he now knows that he needs to end this quickly or they are gonna die. Sung Woo picks up the sword and orders his two skeletons to charge at the boss. The boss smashes both of his skeletons and the third skeleton jumps up towards the boss and he has a sword. But the boss deflects his attack. It turns out Sung Woo was after the synergy of swords and now Sung Woo, Jisoo Yun, and his skeleton have a sword which activates sword synergy. This synergy decreases the weight of the swords by 50% and increases attack speed by 10%. Sung Woo charges towards the boss with a chair and his other party members also start attacking the boss. Hano manages to hit the arm of the boss with a knife. Sung Woo orders his last skeleton to attack the boss. This skeleton was the first goblin monster killed by Sung Woo, and it surprises Sung Woo by beheading the boss with a sword in one hit. They receive 255 gold for defeating the goblin captain. Sung Woo gets leveled up. Now he is a level 3. The skeleton also absorbed the mana of the goblin captain, which upgraded his class, and now he has a tattoo on his forehead. He is now a level 2 elite goblin, and he has also a commander attribute. Sung Woo thinks his commander attribute is going to be useful once he gets more skeletons. Han Ho has leveled up to 2, and Ji Seon leveled up to 3, and all of them received options to choose a random card. Sung Woo chose a card, and he got a basic skill to create weapons from bones. This skill costs 10 mana, and he can create swords, clubs, spears, and bows using the bones of the corpses. Because Sung Woo completed an exclusive quest of avenging his professor, he will receive an exclusive reward and his destiny has been altered slightly. His maximum number of minions have increased by 1, and now he can summon up to 5 minions. Han Ho received a hood as a reward and it increases his chance of hiding from the monsters by 50%. He can use this hood to run away from the monsters, but now he knows how to fight, so he is going to use it to fight against the monsters. Jisoo Yun received a fire whetstone. If she sharpens her blade with it, there is a chance that her sword will catch fire during an attack. Sung Woo tells them that they can test their skills later and they need to head back down. On the entrance, Jin Suk is pissed at everyone because they keep saying that Jin Suk should have gone up along with Sung Woo. Jin Suk gets angry and starts spouting bullshit that Sung Woo was an idiot and he must be dead by now. Suddenly, skeletons appear behind Jin Suk and he becomes scared. 
Sung Woo heads towards the entrance and it opens up after he touches it. He also tells Jin Sok that he is very pathetic. All students start making fun of Jin Sok for being arrogant and a fool. Sung Woo heads outside and asks the students to follow him. There are dead bodies all over the place and Sung Woo thinks that goblins did that. Hano spots a group of survivors along the way. Sung Woo can easily tell that these people have fought and survived against these goblins, and they have a bit of experience in this field. Jin Suk knows the leader of this group of survivors. His name is Taesong Park, and he's also the president of the student council. Taesong tells the students with Sung Woo that he also fought and survived against the goblins, and he can guarantee their safety if they tag along with him. But he seems to have some ulterior motives. He tells Song Wu that he can also join him if he destroys all of the monsters he is controlling using his class because he thinks they are creepy and they can be a threat to other survivors. But Ji Yun intervenes and tells Da Song that he is full of shit and they don't even want to join his group. She also tells everyone that Da Song is a hypocrite and he embezzled student membership fees during the festival by fabricating an event staging company and its receipts. She was the one who reported him on the university website. Taesong becomes embarrassed after hearing it. Ji Su Yun leaves along with her party members. After a while, Ji Su Yun starts telling more details about Taesong to her party members. It turns out Taesong was a rich, spoiled kid and he used to take advantage of girls. Some of her friends were also abused by him. That's why she knew about the true nature of Taesong. Han Ho becomes enraged after hearing about the true nature of Taesong. Sung Woo suggests that they should take the path by the hill to escape the campus. There would be less monsters present there because there is low human activity in that area. Along their path, they spot an orc which is even bigger than the goblin boss. After spotting them, the orc makes a loud scream and plunges towards a Sung Woo's party to attack them. Sung Woo is a bit excited because he has found a new material for the skeletons. The orc proves to be quite strong and he's about to hit Ji Su Yun, but a goblin skeleton takes the hit instead of her and perishes right there. The one armed skeleton warrior attacks the orc and the orc receives massive damage because of the effect of 88% blade damage of the one handed sword warrior. Sung Woo party flees into the forest and he uses his skeletons to bait the boss. When the orc is in the forest, he gets attacked by flying knives from Han Ho and the skeletons. The orc manages to deflect some knives. He starts smashing the skeletons but there are a lot of goblin dead bodies around and Sung Woo can make them again and again until he runs out of mana. Two skeletons take hold of the arms of orc. Sung Woo and Ji Su Yun charge at the orc together. Ji Su Yun manages to slash the leg of the orc and one of his arms is chopped off by Sung Woo. The skeleton warrior finishes him off with a sword stab to the neck. Sung Woo's party receives 110 gold for defeating the orc patrol leader. Orc patrol leaders are a bit stronger than normal orcs. Sung Woo tries to make the orc patrol leader into one of his skeletons but he fails to do so because of his low summon level. Some of Sung Woo's mana is recovered so he uses his great bone weapon skill on the dead orc leader to forge some low level bone clubs. He equips his skeletons with the bone clubs to reach a 5 member synergy with the same weapon to get extra buffs. He gives the sword of the one-armed skeleton warrior to Han Ho and tells him to return the sword back to the skeleton warrior if the need arises. When they reach the entrance, they again see a blocked path message which says that they need to defeat the boss monster within 8 hours or if they fail to do so, the monsters in the area will grow even more stronger. A message pops up in front of them which says that an orc unit is beginning their hunt and they need to choose a suitable location to fight them. Orcs mostly use their sense of smell to track their prey, so it means that more people you have in your party, the more stronger orc unit will be dispatched to get rid of them. Sung Woo's party seems to be a bit safe because they are only a 3 member party and they will get less of a challenge as compared to Desung's group. Suddenly, they start hearing screams from Desung's group. They seem to have caught the attention of the orcs due to their large number of survivors. The first attack on Sung Woo's group has also begun and it seems like they only need to take care of 5 orcs. Soon they spot 5 orcs which seems to be searching for them. Sung Woo has an idea to lay a trap using the empty cars and his skeletons. When the orcs get close to the cars, Han Ho starts making fun of them by calling them greedy pig bastards. The orcs become enraged and start rushing towards him. Once the orcs are within the vicinity of the abandoned cars, the skeletons attack them by surprise with their clubs and they get knocked out due to the synergy effect of the clubs. Sung Woo, Han Ho and Ji Su Yun finish off the knocked orcs with ease. They received a total of 231 gold for killing the 5 orc hunters. They also receive an additional award of 100 gold for killing the first wave of ambushers. 
Sung Woo got up to level 4 and he chose a random card which increased his maximum number of skeletons by 2. Now he can have a total of 7 minions at the same time, but his mana capacity is still only 50. Han Ho also received a high speed stabbing skill which he can only use with the dagger. Jisoo Yoon chose a strength card and gained 2 stat points. She's also feeling a bit stronger than before. Sung Woo asks Han Ho to give the sword back to the one armed warrior skeleton because now Han Ho needs to use that dagger in order to fully monopolize his skill. On the way, they see seven orc hunters attacking a bus. The people inside the bus are retaliating with a spear, but they cannot hold the orcs for a long period of time. Jisoo Yoon suggests that they attack the orcs from the front while the person with the spear attacks them from behind. But Sung Woo is skeptical about whether or not the person inside the bus will cooperate with them. He suggests a new better plan. Inside the bus, two persons, Kyun Su Lee with a spear and the other with a shield and sword, are trying their best to fend off the orcs, but they seem to be scared. Meanwhile, a car with skeletons crashes into the orcs. The skeletons start massacring the orcs. The survivors inside the bus mistake them for worse monsters than the orcs. They are startled when they see Han Ho banging on the bus's door and calling them out. The spear guy tells Song Wu's party that there is a machine which they can use to buy items with the gold they acquired by killing the monsters. It's basically an E-rank shop and when Song Wu turns it on, he has three roulette options including bronze, silver and gold. Han Ho has 360 gold and Jisoo Yun has 584 gold, so they can only go for the bronze option. Sung Woo has 1552 gold and he can try the silver roulette. But he also has an unlimited rank roulette ticket he received early on in the lobby of the college building. Sung Woo taps on the gold roulette option and it starts spinning. He gets first place item due to his luck. It is a legendary class item called Tear of the Sea Spirit and it increases the total mana by 200 and it boosts the mana recovery speed by 200%. Sungwoo is quite happy after receiving this item because he can summon a lot of minions again and again if enough dead bodies are present. Sungwoo spins the silver roulette using his 1000 gold and he receives a second place item Vanguard Shield. Ji Seyun receives a second place sword in the bronze roulette called Leader of the Expedition Force Meanwhile, Han Ho receives a C rank potion bundle. It looks like Daesung's group is still fighting in the sports field. Sung Woo decides that they are going to help them using a bus instead of a car this time. Normal students are getting massacred by the orcs while Daesung and his other awakened friends are trying to escape the orcs by themselves. The bus arrives in the sports field and it crashes into the orcs. Kyung Soo Yi, the spearman, is driving the bus and he's quite happy because he's receiving a lot of gold for killing the orcs. Meanwhile, Han Ho and the skeletons are also getting rid of orcs by throwing knives at them. The bus stops near the survivors and Sung Woo tells the survivors to get inside the bus. Jisoo Yoon slashes an orc and the orc catches fire due to the effects of the fire whetstone which he has received after killing the first boss of the campus building's rooftop. The remaining orcs are easily killed left and right by Sung Woo and his minions. After the battle ended, Daesung and his awakened friends try to get on the bus but they are stopped by Sung Woo. Sung Woo knew that they were trying to escape using the other students as bait. Daesung is quite pissed after hearing it but their conversation comes to a halt when they hear a roar and they receive a notification that the orc chief is infuriated by the failed hunt. Sung Woo gets a bit afraid after hearing the roar. He knows that he needs as much help as he can to defeat the orc chief. Sung Woo tells Daesung's party that they can join him if they are willing to listen to his orders. Daesung eats his pride and is about to enter the bus, but Sung Woo demands that Daesung should hand over his chain mail if he wants to hop on the bus. Daesung asks how he can protect himself without the chain mail. Sung Woo replies that he will protect him, and this is a small price he needs to pay for his protection. Sung Woo is now on level 5 and he can summon mid level monsters like orcs. The skill card he chose allows him to summon 2 more minions. Now he can summon up to 9 minions. Sung Woo gave the chainmail to the one armed skeleton but he seems to be struggling with it. The one armed skeleton is his oldest minion, that's why he gave him a nickname, Righty, because he only has a right arm. While Sung Woo is removing chainmail from Righty, Han Ho tells him that he thinks they need another bus if they want to keep rescuing more survivors. Sung Woo says that there is no need for that. He tells the survivors that they are going to engage in combat with the orcs very soon because the orc chief is pissed and he decided to wage an all out war on the humans unlike previously where they were only attacking in waves. One of the survivors breaks the silence and tells them that he saw over 100 orcs in the gym. This scares the survivors and they receive penalties because most of the survivors have lost their will to fight after hearing it. But Sung Woo is sure that there are less than 100 orcs left because they already killed a lot of them. He tells everyone that he's going to fight the orcs alone. Daesung and his lackeys become more gaki after hearing it. They think Sung Woo was just lucky until now and he's soon gonna dig his own grave. 
Jis Yoon tells Sung Woo that killing 100 monsters is not going to be easy, even for him. Sung Woo replies that even if they flock together, they are not going to be useful because the majority of the survivors are weaker than his skeletons. He tells his companions that they are helpful, but things are going to get more dangerous. That's why he is not going to take them with him. Jisoo thinks Sung Woo has a rational mind, but this time he is being a bit reckless. After escorting the survivors in the safe building, Sung Woo starts heading towards his next destination along with his minions. His party members are watching him from the bus and they will rush over with the bus if something happens to Sung Woo. In the sports ground, Sung Woo comes face to face with a large number of orcs. There is an enraged red-haired orc who is commanding them. Sung Woo thinks that he is a mid-level boss. The red-haired orc orders the other orcs to attack Sung Woo. Sung Woo heads towards a small staircase where he and his minions make a stand. There is only one narrow staircase where the orcs can attack him, making his place easy to defend. Orcs start approaching the stair and Sung Woo uses his bracelet skill Wild Berserker, which will give him and his minions a 10% attack increase and a 20% speed increase against all goblin type enemies for 10 minutes. Skeletons start throwing their knives towards the orc and they start falling like flies. The red haired orc blocks the knives and Sung Woo orders his skeletons to start attacking using the bone clubs, but they are easily overwhelmed by orcs. The one-armed skeleton becomes enraged after watching his skeleton friends getting decimated, but Sung Woo stops him because it's not his turn yet. Sung Woo resurrects the dead orc in place of the fallen skeletons. They will also receive a weapon synergy buff because there are more than 5 orcs with the same axe weaponry in the party. The skeleton orcs start decimating the orcs. Even if some skeleton orcs fall, new are resurrected to take their place and they don't even get tired like the orcs. Sung Woo knows that this is the correct way of utilizing his necromancer class. The survivors watching from the windows of the building are amazed after witnessing the onslaught of orcs by Sung Woo. His party members who are in the bus are also quite happy after watching him slaughter the orcs. Meanwhile, Sung Woo is impressed by his new legendary item, Tear of the Sea Spirit. It increases his total mana by 200 and his mana region by 200%. The remaining orcs are still holding up fiercely so Sung Woo orders Righty to jump into the fight. Righty takes care of the remaining orcs in a few seconds, and Sung Woo receives a new roulette ticket for slaying 100 monsters. It turns out Sung Woo is the 21st person to complete this achievement and his rank will also increase to infinite status which is only limited to 100 people. Sung Woo witnesses some fools crashing a bus into the main gate. On the other hand, school president Desong's group is being kidnapped by orcs. Sung Woo heads towards their direction to save them and other awakened people who were watching got pumped up and started following him. Sung Woo heads inside the building where orcs have kept Desong's group captive and a shaman orc which seems to be their new boss is present there. There are also many dead bodies of other monsters present in there. Sung Woo tells everyone to get ready but the situation of Desong and his henchmen is not looking good. Desong begs Sung Woo to save them but Sung Woo replies he will try his best but he is not a miracle worker and they got themselves into that situation in the first place. When Sung Woo's party charges at the orcs, they start killing the Desong group members as some sort of ritual to enhance the power of the boss monster and Sung Woo's group stops after watching this cruel scene. The boss gets a power buff after the sacrifice and he uses Breath of Abyss on Sung Woo's party and they all fall into a state of confusion. Their mana is also burning at a faster rate now. The reinforced boss monster makes his full appearance. He is a junior black magician, Orc Chief. Han Ho drinks a potion to heal his status effect and he offers it to Sung Woo. But Sung Woo is not affected by the boss's breath of abyss. On the contrary, his mana has increased up to 4000 due to the effects of the breath of abyss. So he tells Han Ho to give the potion to Jisoo. Sung Woo's other stats have also increased temporarily due to the breath of abyss. Now he can summon 50 minions at the same time. The boss did not expect it to happen and he is also confused by it. Jisoo and Hanho starts rushing towards the boss, but Sung Woo stops them. He resurrects all the dead bodies inside the boss room. Sung Woo receives a lot of synergies due to this large number of minions possessing the same type of weapons. Sung Woo is now overflowing with power, and he's ready to show the true power of death to the boss. Magician or Chief smashes a lot of skeletons, but it is of no use because they keep reviving. Sung Woo's physical form has also temporarily changed, and the boss gets scared by him. He tries to run away, but the pass is blocked from all sides by Sung Woo's minions. The boss makes his last ditch effort to reach Sung Woo, but Righty chops off his head in one clean slash attack. Sung Woo receives 1055 gold for killing the Orc Chief. 
Righty's rank increased up to level 3 after killing the Orc Chief. His defense and commander characteristics have also increased. Hano points out an item coming out of the boss's mouth. It's an item with devil attribute, and once a devil attribute has been accepted, it requires a lot of sacrifices in order to remove it. Songwu still accepts it because it is not that much different from his necromancer class. He receives a legendary rank devil's bloodstone orb. This item grants the user a devil attribute which steals the enemy's mana by 2% during the fight. And if the enemy runs out of mana, it starts leeching their physical strength. Songwu returns to his normal state because the effects of the Breath of Abyss have been lifted which granted him temporary power up. Everyone is happy when he comes out and they cheer for their hero. The seal on the gate is also lifted and their tutorial is completed. So they leave campus but the situation outside is also the same as the campus. Spearman Kyung Soo Lee tells Sung Woo that there are two buses available and he can take all of them to a nearby military base. But Sung Woo makes an excuse that his house is nearby. All survivors leave on the bus but Han Ho and Ji Soo stay behind to tag along with Sung Woo. Sung Woo says to Han Ho that he can allow him to tag along if he lets him cut off one of his arms so he can reach maximum synergy with his one-handed skeleton righty. Spearman Kyung Soo stops his bus because he notices some dragons moving towards the bus which are moving. The dragons pick up the other unlucky moving bus and kills everyone inside it. Sung Woo and his friends can clearly see the scene. Sung Woo tells his companions that from now on they are gonna find the monsters to hunt them and get more stronger or their fate will be the same as the people on the bus. With this said, Sung Woo and his party get ready to start their next hunt. Goblins are on the run from the onslaught of Sung Woo and his minions. After killing them, Sung Woo levels up to 6. This time he chooses a guaranteed strength boost card which increases his strength by 3. Sung Woo goes out where Jisoo just finished up killing 9 goblins. Sung Woo asks Han Ho to pack up the daggers and he tells his teammates they are going to switch to hunting orcs because they give much more experience points and better awards. They start finding clues for orcs but instead find a few military vehicles with dead bodies of soldiers laying around and it seems like they tried to fight back using their field shovels. There is a surviving soldier but he is a bit confused about the skeletons with Sung Woo's party. Sung Woo clears his doubt about his minions. Soldier tells his sergeant Kim about Sung Woo's party. Sergeant Kim is in a very bad situation. His leg is injured and he can't leave his vehicle. It turns out he was slashed by a little goblin but he managed to beat the goblin somehow. Sung Woo inquires why the military is using shovels instead of their guns. Sergeant Kim replies that the guns no longer work. That is why the military is in this bad condition. Han Ho asks Sung Woo if he can hand over the healing potion to the sergeant. But Sung Woo thinks giving away things for free is not a good choice. Sergeant Kim tells him that he has some information that he can exchange for the potion. He tells them about wolves which were as big as bulls and whole squads of military were wiped out by them. There are also two blue QR codes which Sergeant Kim saw. He tells them one of the QR codes is in the bus station and the other one is in the subway transfer center. If a player scans the QR codes, it will install an app on their phones. All other communications are down and this app is the only way to communicate with other survivors. Sung Woo hands him the healing potion. Sergeant Kim tells them that he is going to rejoin with the main unit and he can take them with him but Sung Woo thinks it will not be safe with them. Sung Woo gives them a last warning as a farewell gift. He tells them about the dragons which follow moving vehicles. Sergeant Kim and the soldier became more scared but they thank Sung Woo for this crucial information. Both of the parties part ways. Sung Woo and his party reaches the bus station and they scan the QR code which installs the app on their phones. Sung Woo clicks on the official announcement and it is written that the game is officially launched today. In the first round of class selection, 2,967,821 people were chosen as players. And there are 1,341,122 players who are still alive. The second round of class card selection will take place in 3 days and the writer of this message is looking forward to the humanity's performance in the next card selection round. Sung Woo opens the message board but there is no post yet because it costs 1000 gold to make a post and it requires 100 gold just to comment on that post. Suddenly a post pops up. It turns out some players have reached level 8 and they are currently building a safe zone in H apartment complex in Hwasong city. H apartment is near Han Ho's place. Sung Woo thinks that they need to head over there. Sung Woo is a bit skeptical about it because they have reached level 8 and Sung Woo is still on level 6. 
After Song Woo and his friends start heading towards the H apartments, someone deletes the post and a new post pops up which says that someone posted that bullshit. That's why he deleted the post and he tells the readers to disregard their previous post. We see a glimpse of the writer of the post and it seems like he has long teeth just like a vampire. In the city, a father is trying to protect his daughter from the goblins using a baseball bat. He calls for help but there is no one around to help them. The goblins are about to attack the father and his daughter but a flying knife hits the head of a goblin from behind. It turns out they are Sung Woo's minions and they finish the goblins with ease. Sung Woo tells them that he will take them safely to their house but the father tells him that his house is close by and they came out to find food. Sung Woo shares some of his food with the survivors. There are two remaining goblins which run into the basement. This basement is a dungeon. Han Ho asks Sung Woo if they need to chase the goblins inside the dungeon or not. The father tells them that they should not go down into that basement. A friend of his used to run a karaoke bar down there and he heard there is something more terrifying than those green beasts lurking down there. Sung Woo thanks him for the tip and they enter the Elder Slime's shrine. They encounter some slimes and each slime gives 140 gold after being defeated. These slimes are corrosive and they dissolve the metal but they can't melt bones which makes Song Wu's minions their natural predators. Suddenly, the boss elder slime appears behind them and it easily crushes one of Song Wu's orc skeleton. Song Wu pierces the slime boss with a basic bone spear. Song Wu can't summon skeletons because there are only bones around them but he can create basic bone weapons with those skeletons. Jisoo Yun throws a skeleton towards the boss and Sung Woo creates two more bone spears with that skeleton and they pierce the boss slime. The boss slime tries to kill Sung Woo but an orc skeleton gets caught in this place and Han Ho pulls him back with him. Slime monster made a big mistake. The bag orc skeleton was carrying had a lot of bones. Sung Woo uses his skill to make a lot of bone spears which pierce the boss and his minions start cutting the slime into pieces so it cannot regenerate. Righty delivers the last attack on the boss. They receive 2,255 gold for defeating the boss slime. Slime's mucus is an extremely strong acid. Sung Woo orders his minions to collect the mucus in empty bottles. Sung Woo also received an elder slime's core. It's covered with a thick shell. Its interior is composed of a concentrated strong acid which is capable of dissolving anything. It is mostly useful for dissolving or fusing objects together. Meanwhile, Han Ho tells Song Woo to check a new comment. It looks like the situation in the post have become more chaotic. Anyone who arrives at the H apartments gets his comments deleted. Han Ho is an idiot but he also knows that something fishy is happening in H apartments and Song Woo has an idea of what is really occurring there. During the night, some thugs are discussing about their sinister plan to kill other players. If they kill a normal human, they receive 500 gold and if they kill a player, they receive 1000 times the gold according to the level of the player. Inside the car, a bulky thug inquires about the identity of their real boss from his bald boss. The bald guy is scared and he tells his comrade that the serial killer Professor Red is their boss. Professor Red spared his life because he wanted Bald Thug to work for him and the bald thug can feel something changing inside him. Meanwhile, back in the slime dungeon, Sung Woo asks Han Ho if he can kill a person because from now on, things are about to get more chaotic. Bald Thug remembers his past where he completely turned into a minion of a vampire lord after being bitten by him. He was a low rank vampire. He killed and drank the blood of his own henchman. Professor Red was quite happy after witnessing it. In the present, a henchman of the bald vampire knocks on the car's door. His henchman reports that they just got a confirmation that their new prey has arrived. According to the comments, there are three of them and they are waiting in the park. They start heading towards Sung Woo's party on their car. Bald Vampire tells his lackey that it's their 17th prey. The H apartment is quite big and complex. That's why it's easy to lure people there. The apartment residents stay quiet saying it's none of their business but once they run out of prey, they will target the apartment residents. They spot three targets and the bald vampire orders his lackey to run them over. Those three targets were actually disguised bone skeletons. Sung Woo turns them into bone spear weapons which pierce the car. Sung Woo punches through the window and drags the bald vampire outside. 
bald vampire tries to imitate Sung Woo and Sung Woo kicks his chin. Sung Woo asks him about the number of people they got upstairs. Bald vampire turns into a complete vampire and tries to kill Sung Woo, but Riley chops off one of his hands. Bald vampire's lackey becomes scared after watching him. Sung Woo asks his lackey about their number and he tells Sung Woo there are 8 people upstairs. He was about to reveal more information but bald vampire beheads him. Han Ho and Jisoo becomes disgusted after watching bald vampire kill his own ally. Bald vampire's wrist bones are morphing into a pointed blade. He starts drinking blood from the head of his lackey. It turns out he got healed after drinking blood and his stats have also increased. He was originally a 3 star ninja but he became a low rank vampire after Professor Red bit his neck. Once someone becomes a vampire, they are stuck at level 1 but that's not much of a hindrance because if they kill humans instead of monsters, they can absorb their stats by drinking their blood. Bald Vampire activates Berserk Mode which increases all of his stats temporarily by 20% but there is a big penalty of Berserk Mode which occurs after exiting Berserk Mode. It reduces their stats by 50% for 10 hours. Sungwoo thinks that this vampire class is even more gruesome than his necromancer class. Sungwoo tells Han Ho and Jisoo to get behind him. He also orders his minions to attack the vampire but he is quite fast and he easily manages to dodge the attacks of the skeletons. He goes directly for Sung Woo, but Sung Woo blocks his attack with his shield. Jisoo Yun attacks him with her swords, but Bald Vampire easily dodges it and they both start exchanging blows. Han Ho throws daggers but the vampire blocks them. Han Ho keeps throwing daggers like a Gatling gun which pisses off the vampire. He dashes towards Han Ho but Righty successfully parries his attack. He tries to slash the neck of the vampire but vampire somehow dodges it. Sung Woo comes from behind with his shield but Vampire destroys his shield with one slash attack. They both start exchanging blows and the Vampire is quite confident at this point. Jisoo Yun tries to sneak attack him from behind with her burning sword but the Vampire is too fast and manages to dodge it. Righty was at the back of Jisoo and he jumps at Vampire and manages to cut off his arm again. Sung Woo orders his minion to attack the Vampire but his backup arrives in time. Thugs also become afraid after watching their boss's true form. His arm is getting regenerated but Jisoo chops it off again. An orc skeleton tries to attack Vampire but he smashes him and it turns out that orc skeleton was just a mere bait. Sung Woo stabs his sword through his orc skeleton which pierces the Vampire's neck and Sung Woo finally chops his head off. Sung Woo's party receives 1000 gold for killing a level 1 player. Now, Sung Woo knows exactly what was going on in H Apartments. They were killing off other players for their gold and experience. Vampire's lackey gets surrounded by Sung Woo's minions. Sung Woo tells them to drop their weapons or he will kill them all. Thugs are afraid and they drop their weapons. They tell Sung Woo about their true boss but they also have limited information about him and this was their first time watching their bald boss's true form. Sung Woo realizes that their real boss has a 5 or more stars class because he can make other players into monsters. Sung Woo asks the thugs about how many people they killed and one of them tells them that they killed 21 or 22 people. Sung Woo becomes enraged and orders his minions to kill all of them. They receive a total of 5000 gold for killing all of them. Even Han Ho and Jisoo Yun become surprised after watching it but Sung Woo tells them that if they don't kill them now, they will start killing other innocent people. Han Ho and Jisoo Yun agree with Sung Woo's decision. The next morning, someone posted that the people in apartment H were murderers and he barely escaped with his life. He was observing them from afar but some other player finished them all off with his skeletons. Sergeant Kim becomes happy after reading it because he knows it must be Sung Woo's party. Sergeant Kim posts some appreciation comments about Sung Woo's party and other students Sung Woo helped back in the school are also posting good stuff about Sung Woo but no one knows his real name. In a depilated building, we see a glimpse of a mysterious figure who became happy after reading the comments and they head off to an unknown location. Han Ho tells Sung Woo about a new post by a guy named Prosecutor. Someone posted that if people want to post something and they lack gold, they can just comment down below this post and help each other. He also provides some other minor information like how they can use this setting to change their nicknames. Most of the comments are about missing family members or useful information about synergies and wolves which can jump two stories high. Sung Woo's party arrives at Han Ho's place and Han Ho hopes his parents are still alive. 
Inside the building, there are quite a few dead orcs laying around on the stairs. Hanho prays for his parents' safety. After arriving at the room 202, Hanho desperately calls for his mom and his parents rush out to see their child. It turns out his parents didn't pick a class card. Hanho is skeptical about his dad because he used to play card games all the time. Sungwoo asks them about how they managed to stop those orcs. It turns out those orcs ran away after Hanho's father used pesticide spray on them. Everyone becomes shocked after hearing it. After they finish eating food, Hanho's mom thanks Jisoo and Sungwoo for bringing their good-for-nothing son back to them. She also prepared some green tea for them. Hanho tells his mom about the awesome things he did to help his party, but she asks her son to shut up. After watching the lights from outside, some biker guys give off a grin smile. Meanwhile, inside the building, Jisoo is happy after taking a shower, and she thanks Hanho's mom for the pajamas. Sungwoo and Hanho are taking shower along with Raidi. Sungwoo is happy to see Hanho's parents alive. He thinks that Hanho's father was quite lucky. He used pesticides against orcs, whose biggest strength is their sense of smell. Sungwoo knows that Hanho must be overjoyed because he found his parents. Sungwoo tells them that this is not a safe place to stay. The orcs which came before were just mere scouts, and it will turn into an all-out war if their main group arrives. But the main problem is that they don't know where to go next. It turns out Prosecutor again made a post. He tells the survivors that one of his friends is a Three Stars pioneer, and they created a small safe area inside Yongdung Po Station, where monsters can't enter. But the survivors need to provide gold or rations because pioneer skills take up a lot of resources to maintain. Sungwoo is skeptical, but he knows what the Prosecutor guy said can be true because the world has become a game. But they can't take Hanho's parents there because it is quite far away from their location. There is another comment by a guy called Section Chief Ku, who claims to be a three-star pioneer, but he can only let in others if they give him rent. This guy is in Hwasong Fortress, which is 20 minutes away if they travel on a bus, and Sung Woo's party decides to head over there. The next morning, they start heading over to Hwasong Fortress along with Hanho's parents. Hanho's dad informs them about some delinquent who steals resources from other survivors. Sung Woo is a bit worried about these third-rate delinquents running amok. Soon, some delinquents arrive at their location on their bikes. A cocky delinquent girl addresses them as Jeezers and tells them to hand over their resources and gold, which pisses off Sung Woo. Sung Woo is about to order his minions which are hiding in a building behind him, but suddenly they hear a sound, and all delinquents make a run for it. Soon, a pack of giant wolves arrives, but they are not attacking Sung Woo's party mindlessly. Sung Woo's party is at a disadvantage, so he tells his companions to slowly back away. After getting inside the building, one of the wolves tries to attack them, but Sung Woo uses his brain and throws a slime-filled bottle at the face of the wolf. His minions start throwing bone spears at him and the wolf dies. The second wolf tries to run away, but one of Sung Woo's minions tries to stop him. Wolf bites the minions, but it was a trap, and Wolf's mouth becomes filled with slime liquid. Righty leaps towards the exhausted wolf and finishes him off with one strike. The last wolf becomes afraid after watching it, but he soon gets pierced by spears. They receive 240 gold per wolf they slayed, and Sungwoo's level has risen up to 7. Jisoo Yun is a bit worried because she thinks they are becoming a burden to Sungwoo, but he tells her that they are quite helpful, but he is skeptical about Hanho's growth. Sung Woo tries to resurrect the wolf, but his level is quite low for that. The next morning, a helicopter is being followed by some wyverns. Suddenly, a field boss wyvern alpha male appears in front of them, and it easily destroys the helicopter. Sung Woo and his friends were watching it from a window, and they think even army is no longer a match for these monsters. Sung Woo's party can't go forward because some wyverns are sleeping ahead on rooftops. Sung Woo suggests to take a break for now, and they will leave once the wyverns go away. Night falls and the wyverns are still sleeping on the rooftops. Suddenly, a message pops up which tells them that they should pick a class card, which will help them survive in this apocalypse. Hanho tells his parents to choose a card with the most stars this time. A 15 second countdown starts and cards appear in front of them. These same cards are also presented to other survivors too, and they disappear after someone chooses them. Hanho is trying his best to find a card with the most stars. But Sung Woo thinks simply picking a card with the most stars is not a good option, and he should pick a card which combines well with his Necromancer class. Sung Woo picks a 3-star Dark Mage Link card, and it combines with his Necromancer class to grant him new skills. He got a skill called Death Aura, which buffs his minions and debuffs his enemies. 
Han Ho was trying to pick a 4 star card but someone else picked it before him and he accidentally tapped on a 1 star priest card. He got a new skill which shields him from his enemies for 10 seconds after he kills an enemy. Han Ho's father picked a 3 star pioneer card and he can now make safety zones. Sung Woo is quite happy because now they don't need to go to Hwasong Fortress anymore. Han Ho's father is quite overjoyed by his new pioneer class. Han Ho's mother picked a 1 star chef card and Han Ho tells her she should have picked a class which could have helped them during their fights. Han Ho parents become sad after hearing it because they raised Han Ho for 20 years and now their son wants them to fight. Jisoo Yoon picked a 3 star hitman card. Her new passive skill, Supreme Sense, heightens her senses whenever she's in danger. Jisoo Yoon thinks she needs to become stronger so she can be more helpful to Song Woo. Song Woo asks Han Ho's father to explain the skills of Pioneer. This skill costs 10 mana after every 10 minutes to create a safe zone whose surface area is 2,150 square feet and its height is limited to 33 feet. Once the user runs out of mana, this skill starts consuming 100 gold per every 10 minutes. The shield around the zone regenerates over time, but it can be destroyed by powerful attacks. Sung Woo tells them that they can't afford to use this skill right now and they will only use it for emergencies. Sung Woo further tells them that the other groups with Pioneer will try to abuse their power and Sung Woo's party will stay away from them. Meanwhile, the Wyverns have rested enough and they take off. Sung Woo asks Han Ho to check the location of a store or a roulette machine on the forum because he needs to spend his gold and get stronger. Soon, they hear motorbike sounds and they become alerted. Sung Woo has an idea. They will ask the motorbike punks about the location of the store. It turns out these delinquents were stuck in a meat shop while they were waiting for the wyverns to go away. Their leader, Taesong, is a level 6 fighter and he needs a little bit more gold to spin the silver roulette this time. Taesong arrives at his hideout but is suspiciously quieter than usual. When he gets inside a room, he finds his friends there but they are quite sad about something. One of them tells Taesong that their friend Yujin had not collected enough money so the vampire made her into a lesser vampire. Taesong becomes quite sad after seeing his friend as a lesser vampire. There's another vampire present in the room and he asks Taesong why he killed his previous leader Wu Sok. Taesong replies that he had no other choice because their previous leader Wu Sok had turned into a complete vampire and he killed many people. The vampire informs Taesong that he will kill all of them next if they fail to gather 10,000 gold within two days. Suddenly, Song Wu comes in with his party and he is not happy with the customer service provided by these thugs. Vampire asks what they want and Song Wu replies he wants everything they have. Vampires becomes pissed and his fangs become visible. After seeing his fangs, Song Wu mistakes him for the real boss of thugs in H apartments. Vampire rushes at Song Wu and his minions get a hold of his hands. Song Wu stabs the throat of the vampire and he warns the vampire to not move or else his head will fly off. Song Wu asks him if he is the vampire lord and he starts laughing. Vampire is quite powerful and he breaks the skeletons holding him with his hands. He also mends the sword piercing his throat with his bare hands. He tries to go for Song Wu again but this time he gets hit by Han Ho's daggers. Jisoo rushes at the vampire and chops one half of his arm. Vampire tries to regenerate his arm but he gets burned halfway due to Jisoo Yun's fire whetstone effect. Jisoo attacks the vampire once more and this time she completely severs the burned arm of the vampire. Vampire is about to get back at her by throwing the sword piece stuck in his throat but she manages to dodge it thanks to her newly acquired skill, Supreme Sense. Due to the new skill of Song Woo, his minions become more buffed and the vampire gets 10 times weaker. Orc skeletons start mashing the vampire with their bare hands. Vampire can't bear any more beating and he yields to Song Woo's party but in reality he is just pretending to give up so he can somehow finish Song Woo once he drops his guard. Song Woo is not a child and he sees through his lie. Song Woo makes bone spears which pierce the vampire rendering him motionless. Song Woo asks the vampire if he had enough or he wants more piercing. Vampire tells Song Wu that even though they managed to defeat him, but soon the day will arrive when their boss's true plan will come to fruition and the likes of Song Wu will be wiped out. Song Wu had enough, so he tells Jisoo Yun to finish off the vampire and she receives 322 gold for killing a player. Taesong is quite surprised after witnessing the fight and he begs for mercy. He tells Song Wu that he had nothing to do with that vampire. Song Wu tells him that it doesn't matter and they should hand over everything they got. Han Ho tells Song Wu that these third rate thugs had less gold than what he expected. Ji Si Yun thinks that maybe this vampire was connected to the vampire at H Apartments. Song Wu tells them that the vampire boss is growing in power and he is quite crafty. 
He is using these lesser vampires to collect gold for him. Sung Woo is afraid because the vampire they killed had the ability to turn other humans into lesser vampire. And soon the vampirism will spread like a virus. Sung Woo needs to become stronger because they can barely defeat a single vampire. And if they get attacked by multiple vampires at once, they will be wiped out. Sung Woo asks Taesong if there is a store nearby, and Taesong happily leads the way, but suddenly a red system message window pops up. There is a question in this message, and it is asking about what should be done to those people who were arrogant enough to not pick any card during second class selection for players. Sung Woo has a bad feeling about it. Suddenly, a delinquent named Min Sik becomes afraid because he had not chosen any card during second class selection. He never trusted the system, that's why he didn't choose anything. He tells Ta Song that he is not only the one. Che He also didn't pick any card. Another red system message pops up. The system is going to turn all those people who have not picked any cards into monsters. Min Sik is about to be turned into a monster and he tells others to run away from him. Sung Woo is afraid because once they completely transform into a monster, they will not stand a chance against them. Sung Woo tells others that this is their only chance and they should attack them. Righty and his other minions rush at both of them before they can complete their transformation. Sung Woo is a bit hesitant but he has no other choice. His minions start attacking them but a skeleton soldier dies with a clumsy hit from a werewolf and it proves that Sung Woo was right and they need to die before they can fully transform into a monster. Finally, Sung Woo's minions manage to kill both of them and Sung Woo receives 6,000 gold for killing them and his level rises up to 8. Sung Woo is astonished because the werewolves they killed outside Hanu's apartment were just 240 gold coins and these werewolves which were not even fully transformed are worth 3,000 gold each. Song Wu selects random stats cards as his level up award and his speed increases by 3. Hanho is afraid because now they have to fight against powerful monsters like these werewolves. Song Wu has a plan. Up until now he has never tried to make a dead human into his minion because he thought others will have a bad impression of him. But now the situation has changed. Song Wu successfully turns both werewolves into his minions. He thinks both of them are at least on par with vampires. Taesong is a bit worried because Song Wu turned his dead friend into his minion. Song Wu again asks him about the store and he tells Song Wu that the store is in a used car complex. Taesong's group only used to steal gold from others but the group occupying a used car complex is working directly under the vampires and they kidnap humans for the vampires. When they arrive at the car complex, Song Wu feels like something is wrong because this place is too quiet and there are no guards around. Taesong's vampire friend is also tagging along with them. They hear screams from close by. They start silently observing the situation. There is a bear monster and a vampire going toe to toe. Bear is punching the vampire like a training bag. Someone notices chains on the hands of the bear. It turns out that bear was a human and he couldn't select a class because his hands were tied. And then he turned into a bear and killed the other vampires. The last vampire again attacked the bear with its fangs and manages to injure it a little bit. At this point, both the vampire and the bear are at their limit. Both of them plunge at each other, but they get instantly wiped out by Song Wu's werewolf minions. He receives 3,500 gold for killing the bear, and he turns him into his minion. Han Ho spots the same bus Kyung Su, the spearman from school, was driving. Jisoo thinks they were kidnapped by these vampires. Taesong is about to tell them the store's location, but his friend Yu Jin, which was previously turned into a vampire, has been possessed by real vampire boss. He is here to watch who has been killing his children. Vampire Lord gets to the point and tells Song Wu that he is a mere insect. He then uses his ability to inflict a lesser curse on Song Wu. Now Song Wu needs holy magic to analyze and neutralize this curse. Vampire Lord starts spouting bullcrap and Song Wu kicks him with all of his force. There is a small red curse mark left on Song Wu's hand, but it is not affecting Song Wu for now. Hano is a priest, so maybe he can help Song Wu with his curse. Hano tries to lift Song Wu's curse, but his ability is too weak. Song Wu has been marked by the Vampire Lord's exclusive skill, Trace of Blood, and his location will be exposed to the Vampire Lord after every 12 hours. Song Wu's unique circumstances have triggered a special quest called No Country for Wicked Men. He has to eliminate the Vampire Lord and he will receive 30,000 gold and a C rank item ticket for completing this task. Vampire Lord will not stop scheming against Song Wu until one of them dies. They move to the D rank store and it seems to be a bit different than the roulette machine they found in school. Sung Woo goes first and he has one unlimited rank roulette ticket. It was the reward he received after he killed 100 orcs in the school, but he is saving that ticket for later. 
Sungwoo clicks on 10,000 gold option and three more options pop up. Sungwoo clicks on first place prize ball and he receives five balls. After using them, he receives a legendary rank master craftsman rank skill coupon. After using the coupon, he got an exclusive master class skill called Refuge in the Void. This skill costs zero mana and it creates a space for his minions to rest and recover. He can summon his minions to his current place at any time. There is also a sub skill called the Great Spirit. If Sungwoo summons multiple minions simultaneously, it will trigger the Curse of Death to spread in the area. Its range and effects will increase as his number of minions increases and this skill has a cooldown of 1 hour. Hanho and Ji Seun are amazed by Sungwoo's luck. Sungwoo uses his skill to return his minions to the void. This skill is quite useful and now he can move around without making others afraid of his minions. Hanho and Ji Seun are not as lucky as Sungwoo. Ji Seun got B rank survival package and Hanho got a normal armor called Tough Bullhide Cuirass. Now we move to another location where Spearman Kyung Soo Lee is standing around many dead bodies. He is regretting his decision of parting ways with Song Wu party outside college campus. They managed to arrive at the military base in the past but it was already destroyed. Other survivors started panicking after watching the current situation of military base. All of their criticism was pointed towards Spearman Kyung Soo because he was the one who suggested the idea of going to the military base. One of Kyung Soo's friends tells him about the Hwasong Fortress and Kyung Soo decides to head over there. But it was a bad decision because what awaited them were monsters in human guise. One of the vampires kicks Spearman Kyung Soo and tells him he will take him to the kitchen and make him into food if he stops working. Spearman Kyung Soo is skeptical because he knows these vampires are going to get rid of him once they find some other replacement for him. Vampires are putting the human survivors in a building, but suddenly their path gets blocked by no one other than Righty. Righty challenges one of the vampires. Vampires think of Wright as just a new weak type of monster, and they rush toward him. It was a trap, and the vampires started getting nailed by bone spears. One of the vampires is still confused about the current situation. Soon, Sungwoo minions jump out of the void. Spearman Kyung Soo becomes happy after watching Sungwoo, and Sungwoo is also happy after seeing him alive. Kyung Soo thinks Sungwoo has grown much stronger than the last time they parted ways. The vampires are still confident they can win. Sungwoo tells his minions to kill everyone and just leave one vampire alive so he can interrogate him. Spearman Kyung Soo thinks even Jisoo Yoon has gotten stronger, but he is skeptical about Hano's growth, who is hiding behind Righty. Last remaining vampire begs them to spare her life. Sungwoo asks the vampire about the exact number of players and vampires inside the factory, as well as details about their levels. They have a level 5 vampire manager inside. There are 12 players working with them, and the highest one is on level 4. Sungwoo thanks her for being honest, but he is still not going to spare her. She keeps begging for her dear life, but Spearman Kyung Soo stabs her from behind. After taking revenge for his friends, Kyung Soo starts crying, and he's missing his friends who were killed by the vampires. Sungwoo tells him that he did the right thing. The world has changed, but they cannot let scums like these vampires roam free. Inside the factory, some hunters tell the vampire manager that they have been capturing humans as they ordered, but they don't know how much longer they can keep this up. Vampire manager tells them that these humans are easy to capture and they are their means of food and experience. Once the real plan of their leader comes to fruition, they are going to become the apex predators in this new world. The human players become happy because they will also be turned into a vampire if they keep it up. Sungwoo comes inside and tells them that they are all delusional creeps. Vampire manager asks him about his identity. The school survivors in the cages become happy after watching Sungwoo. Vampire manager becomes pissed and tells them to shut up. Vampire manager tries to be cocky but Sungwoo is ready to pit him into his place using his skills. Soon the vampires and players become engulfed by black smoke. Vampire manager and players are confused about the current situation and they become inflicted by curse of death which reduces their stats drastically. Sungwoo's minions start rushing towards the players. Vampire manager tells them to calm down and they just need to get rid of Sungwoo and his skeletons will stop working. Vampire manager tries to go directly for Sungwoo but Han Ho throws a bottle filled with slime liquid to his face. Ji Su Yun rescued the survivors by cutting their cages with her sword. Spearman Kyung Soo comes inside riding his bus and he tells the survivors to get inside. Vampire manager is pissed by the current situation but Righty jumps on him and cuts off one of the arms of vampire manager. The vampire leader was observing the fight through vampire manager and he lends some of his strength to him. 
Vampire Manager turns into a high-level vampire and he activates Berserk skill. Hanho becomes afraid after witnessing the true form of Vampire Manager. Vampire Manager tries to rush at Song Woo, but his minions surround him. Vampire Manager destroys one Orc Skeleton with a single attack, but he also gets attacked from behind by a Werewolf Skeleton. Vampire Manager punches the Werewolf Skeleton with all of his might, but he gets slashed from behind by another Werewolf. Jisoo Yun jumps toward him, and she manages to slash the back of the Vampire Manager. Jisoo grabs Raidi and throws him in the direction of the Vampire Manager, and he manages to land a little slash attack on the Vampire as well. Two Orc Skeletons try to attack him from behind, but they get easily wrecked by the Vampire. Sung Woo revives other dead monsters in their place, but he is worried because he thinks he's going to run out of corpses before Vampire Manager's Berserk skill runs out. He's just a subordinate of Vampire Lord, but Sung Woo and his party members are having a difficult time dealing with him. Sung Woo gets a bit lucky because he notices a dead Cerberus corpse lying around. He resurrects the Cerberus and all of his werewolves receive a lot of buffs because of Cerberus skills. Werewolves manage to pin down the Vampire Manager. Sung Woo tells him to convey his message to their boss and that their business in Ha Song has gone bankrupt. Sung Woo receives 10,000 gold for killing a special player. Sung Woo tries to resurrect the Vampire Manager and he succeeds in his first try. A message pops up that Sung Woo can now revive the memory fragments of the deceased. Sung Woo gets a flashback from the memory fragment of Vampire Manager Kim. In the flashback, Vampire Lord asks the managers about the true purpose of this game, but the managers have no answer for it. Vampire Lord tells them that he also has no idea about the game's true purpose, but he is sure about something, that they need to evolve into a completely different species and make a new world order. Vampire Lord tells the managers that he got a new quest. He needs their help with the quest and he orders manager Kim to procure food and farming supplies. They are going to lure in survivors and perform a great feast. Sung Woo becomes pissed after hearing the plans of the Vampire Lord. Suddenly, he receives an exclusive quest called Master of Death. He needs to prevent or take advantage of a massacre. There are going to be many massacres in this world, but this one is specifically tied to Song Woo's destiny. He can either save others or he can take advantages of the corpses. Han Ho is trying to wake Sung Woo, but his consciousness is inside the memory fragment. Han Ho thinks Sung Woo died because he revived the vampire and he starts crying. Sung Woo wakes up and tells Han Ho that he will not die before him. He also tells them about everything he saw in the vampire manager's memory fragment. Vampire Lord is a bit frustrated because Sung Woo killed his vampire manager even after he lent some of his strength. Madame Yang asks him if Sung Woo can pose a threat to his plans, and Vampire Lord replies that Sung Woo can't kill him with his puny skeletons. Madame Yang starts blushing with fear after hearing it. Vampire Lord tells her that after the Great Feast is over, he will search Sung Woo using his curse and get rid of him. The next morning, Han Ho informs Sung Woo that something big is happening on the online forums and it seems like the vampires are trying to lure as many players as possible. The post has been made by a guy named Manager Gu and it is written in the post that they are welcoming all survivors and no one even needs to pay gold to enter their camp and they can also guarantee their safety. Han Ho is about to post a comment against that post but Sung Woo stops him. If people become alerted after reading the comment, then the vampires will be forced to alter their plans, and Sung Woo will lose his advantage because he is already aware of their current plans. Jisoo Yun informs Sung Woo that she found a lot of useful potions in the vampire manager Kim's warehouse. Meanwhile, Han Ho found a wireless charging battery item. They start charging their mobile batteries with it. Jisoo Yun found a white colored potion and it's called Treatment. This potion can apparently treat and alleviate various infections. Sung Woo thinks this potion will come in handy right away. Sung Woo used the potion on Taesung's friend and she became partially normal. Taesung and his delinquent friends are quite happy about it and they thank Sung Woo from the bottom of their hearts. Sung Woo tells Taesung to keep an eye on their friend because if she causes trouble or gets possessed by the vampire lord, he will get rid of her. Sung Woo further tells him that he didn't heal her for free and Taesung has to do something later for him. Sung Woo asks Han Ho's dad, Mr. Lee, to use his skill. Mr. Lee gets ready to use his skill. After he uses his skill, a shield forms around their area and this area can now heal all wounds as well. Mr. Lee has full authority within this area. Everyone starts feeling better because their wounds are healing. Hano's mom prepared food for everyone and this food can give different buffs to the consumers. It turns out no one other than Song Woo had received any exclusive quests. Song Woo tells Jisoo Yoon that she can stay behind if she wants because this exclusive quest is not related to her. Jisoo tells Sung Woo that even if she stays behind, she will be killed by something worse than vampires. That's why she needs to improve her skills. 
While they are talking, a new notification pops up. It turns out all survivors are on Chapter 1 of this game. The admin congratulates all players who have survived till now. Many lives were lost in the process and those who couldn't adapt to this new world were turned into werebeasts. However, their trials and tribulations are just beginning. They need to fight back against monsters and humans alike. Only those who are bold enough will be able to survive. There are four further warnings in the message. This event is going to run for seven days. And during this time, they are unable to leave this region of Suwon and Hwasong Fortress. The amount of gold that players will be awarded will be doubled during this event. Every time a second round player is able to defeat a werebeast, they will be given a chance to receive a combo card at random. A boss monster will spawn in every region and players can get powerful items after defeating the boss. Sohan is quite pleased after hearing the conditions of this quest. Hanho is mad because Songwu is forcing him to tag along on his dangerous quest. Songwu tells him that he's weak and he will not even survive a single day without him. Hanho changes the topic and tells Songwu that people are responding to his post on the community forum. Songwu received all sorts of comments, but one comment is more captivating, and that is done by prosecutor of Yong Dong Po, the same guy who made a base with a level 3 pioneer skill. It seems like they made their own guild called Independence. Their guild's top priority is the survival of their group. They are making their safe zone stronger by hunting monsters and rescuing survivors. Sungwoo thinks this prosecutor guy is too ambitious. Sungwoo asks Hanho about his level and Hanho replies that he's on level 5. Sungwoo thinks Hanho is too weak and he needs to grind levels as well. Spearman Kyung Soo stops the car and tells them that they have arrived at their destination. Sungwoo's party steps out of the car and Sungwoo tells them that this is their new hunting ground while a lot of monsters are hiding behind cars and various blockage. These monsters are called kobolds and they can use magic as well. They are not that much of a threat and they get easily wiped out. The main purpose of this hunt is to help Han Ho level up and to find new minions for Sungwoo. A single werewolf is capable of defeating 3 or 4 low level vampires, even though these kobolds can use magic but they are not strong enough to be used as minions. There are a lot of dead bodies outside the parking lot which is looking a bit similar to the college campus. Sungwoo thinks that same tutorial must have taken place in all densely populated areas. Spearman Kyung Soo tells them that he thinks countryside places and small mountain villages like Jeju Island can be safer because they have low population. Ji Soo Yoon's family lives on Jeju Island and she tells them not to worry because her family members are big shots, so they must be fine. Sung Woo and his party enters the mart, but their exit gets sealed with magic and this mart has now become a large-scale dungeon called the Sorcerer's Fortress. They can now only escape by defeating the boss of this dungeon. Suddenly, a huge magic circle forms beneath them and they all get teleported to different locations inside the dungeon. Han Ho falls down from a circle on the ceiling. There are a bunch of kobolds and they are telling each other that a single human has fallen into their trap. Han Ho is amazed after hearing them talk. Han Ho tells them that he may be alone, but he can wipe those puny kobolds by himself. But when Han Ho realizes he is really alone, he becomes afraid. All kobolds rush towards Han Ho, but he is too scared to fight back, but he manages to kill one kobold by accident and the other kobold starts beating him. He is crying because he was forced to come here by Sung Woo and now he's going to die, but soon he realizes that he cannot feel any pain. Han Ho remembers that one of his priest class skill protects him for 10 seconds after killing an enemy. The kobolds become afraid as Han Ho starts laughing. Han Ho starts feeling like a character from Fist of the North Star and he tells those puny kobolds that he hates weaklings like them. Spearman Kyung Soo and Jisoo are both together and they are trying to find their party members as fast as they can. Soon, they see blood coming out of a corner. Once they come close, they realize that it was Han Ho who just finished a bunch of kobolds. Jisoo Yun still can't believe what she saw and Han Ho tells her that he has finally awakened his hidden potential. All three of them are now together and they don't think they need to worry about Sung Woo because he's more powerful than all of them. Meanwhile, on the other side, Sung Woo and his minions are massacring the kobolds. Sung Woo finally reaches a place with a lot of kobold dead bodies and a survivor is lying there. His wounds are too severe to be healed by mere potions. The survivor points toward a box. Sung Woo picks it up for him. There is a mysterious egg inside and it's an exclusive item which can be hatched. With his last breath, the survivor tells Sung Woo that the boss of this dungeon has the owner token for this egg. This egg originally belonged to the survivor and its token was stolen by the boss monster somehow. Sung Woo knows that the survivor was a 5-star dragon knight and this mysterious egg has a real dragon inside of it. More kobolds appear but they get slaughtered by Sung Woo's minions. 
Now Sung Woo is determined to find that token and take revenge for the survivor. Sung Woo notices that something is strange about these Gumbolds. They just keep charging at him without thinking, as if they were buying time for something. Soon, Sung Woo spots a Gobold sorcerer. One of his minions easily kills him, and the other Gobolds also die without much resistance. Sung Woo levels up, and this time he chooses a skill card. He receives a new basic skill called Corpse Explosion. This skill requires 10 mana to explode a corpse. More Gobolds start charging at him, and Sung Woo tests out his new skill, which causes a big explosion. Four Gobolds are hiding inside a room. Righty comes in and easily takes care of them. Sung Woo praises Righty for it, and Righty becomes happy. Further inside the room, they spot the boss, which is a high-level Kabold Sorcerer. There is a force field around him, and it cannot be broken until three cores are smashed, which are spread around the dungeon. Boss Monster is angry after witnessing the massacre of his underlings. He uses a low-level instant death spell. If this spell isn't stopped within an hour, any player in the dungeon with a level lower than 10 will die right away. Sung Woo becomes afraid because everyone in his team is below level 10. His minions keep attacking but they can't do anything to the force field. Sung Woo thinks normal attacks are not going to work so he orders his minions to gather all dead bodies near the boss. Sung Woo leaves the room and he detonates all Cabal dead bodies which results in a big explosion. But once Sung Woo comes back, there's not even a single scratch on the boss. The boss becomes enraged and sacrifices some of his health to reduce the spell casting time. And now there are only 52 minutes left. Sung Woo becomes really pissed and the boss starts smirking. Sung Woo received memory fragments after reviving some kobold sorcerers and now he knows the exact location of the cores. First core is located on their floor and Righty destroys it, but there are only 19 minutes left. They move up to the next floor and there are a lot of dead kobolds in there. Sung Woo thinks Jisoo must have killed them. When he gets closer to the second core's location, he witnesses Han Ho destroying the kobolds. Both Sung Woo and Righty can't believe what they just witnessed. Ji Seung tells Sung Woo that they also received that spell notification and she destroyed the core located on their floor. Han Ho tells them that they are wasting time and they should head toward the last core. Sung Woo and his party is wrecking havoc as they are heading towards the last core. Finally, they spot the last core, but kobolds are desperately trying to protect it with their lives. Sung Woo gives Righty a hand, and Righty jumps above the kobolds and manages to cut the last core into two pieces. The force field around the boss has been dispelled, and now they only need to kill the boss within 9 minutes. Sung Woo is quite pissed at the boss, and he's going to wreck him. Hano also transfers back to his normal state. There are only 2 minutes left, but Sung Woo and his party arrives on time. One of the kobold sorcerers of Sung Woo uses Fireball on the boss, and he gets knocked over which results in cancellation of the instant death spell. The boss becomes pissed, and he starts transforming into his true form, which is a fallen tree spirit. After transforming, it starts smashing Sung Woo's minions with ease. It tries to attack Sung Woo and his friends, but they manage to dodge it in time. Jisoo uses a fire sword attack to burn one of its branches, but it starts regenerating right away. Sung Woo orders one of his werewolf minions to throw dead kobolds at the boss. When the dead bodies come closer to the boss, Sung Woo detonates them which results in a big explosion. The explosion damages the face of the boss, but it is regenerating at a faster pace. The boss gets hit from behind by kobold sorcerer fireball which is quite effective against him. Sung Woo's party starts attacking boss with fire attacks, and soon he runs out of mana because of Sung Woo's legendary item, the Devil Bloodstorm Orb, which leeches the enemy's mana by 2% after every attack. The boss became weaker after losing his mana. Sung Woo and his party retreats, and Sung Woo detonates all the dead bodies of the kobolds, which were piled upon each other by his minions just below the boss. The boss dies because he had no mana left to regenerate himself. Sung Woo received 12,840 gold for defeating the Fallen Tree Spirit, and he also leveled up to 10. Sung Woo also receives another roulette ticket from the system because he's the 69th person to reach level 10, and his rank has increased to infinite level. Sung Woo's maximum number of minions has also increased by 5. Sung Woo chooses a skill card, and he gets a death response skill which consumes 100 mana, and it summons 10 zombies which disappear after 10 minutes, and these zombies are not included in his total number of minions. Sung Woo can now command 25 undead at the same time, which will be a huge advantage against the Vampire Lord. Sung Woo received the Dragon Token, which is a masterless sword, and he is now confident enough to face the Vampire Lord head on. This new masterless sword increases its user's strength by 6, and it is required to open the Dragon Egg, but Sung Woo can't open the egg because his class is not synchronized with the Dragon Tamer class. He can still hatch the Dragon Egg if he can keep it closer to him for 5,000 days, or if you can slay powerful foes with the masterless sword to reduce the maximum number of days. 
Hanho tells him that 5,000 days are equal to 13 years, and he will be a middle-aged man by the time the egg hatches. But he gets to lay powerful foes with the sword, which will decrease the egg hatching time. Sung Woo receives a message from Tae Sung, who was sent to Haegung Square Inn to spy on the vampires. He tells Sung Woo that there are hundreds of people present there, but there are no signs of vampires yet. He also informs Sung Woo that private messages like this cost 300 gold. Sung Woo thinks Tae Sung is doing a good job by sneaking in with the survivors. Meanwhile, Orc Skeleton spots something. When Sung Woo arrives, there are two werewolf corpses which seem to have been killed by the tree spirit. Sung Woo revives them, and now he has five werewolves under his authority. Sung Woo has a total of 15 minions, and he thinks right now is the best time to head towards Hua Song to finish off the vampires. The survivors are in a confused state because the guys who invited them there are not in sight. At the same time, the vampires are watching the survivors from a nearby building. Second in command vampire master comes around and tells them to get ready because they are going after the guy who attacked their factory. Vampire Lord wants the guy dead before he can interfere with their grand feast. Tae Song spots them heading outside and he informs Song Woo about them. According to the Vampire Lord's curse skill, they were at the elementary school. After reaching the spot, they spot a werewolf dead body lying on a car. They think this werewolf was killed by Song Woo's minions because his wounds are still fresh. There is a trail of blood nearby and it leads to the auditorium nearby. All of them start rushing inside the auditorium. The vampire leading these low-ranked vampires is a vampire master and he can handle two werewolves at the same time. And he works directly under the vampire lord. Some vampires rush inside and they spot Sung Woo with his minions. Vampire are quite confident they can easily take him down. Sung Woo and his minions start running away from the vampires. Sung Woo stops after leading them to a dead end. Vampires become a bit afraid because they feel something is wrong. Sung Woo summons his remaining minions from the void. He also uses death response to summon zombies and vampires become afraid. Zombie starts massacring the vampires. Raidi uses his command skill on the skeleton minions which gives them a small buff. Most of the vampires have lost hope because of curse of death. Sung Woo is quite pleased with his formation and strategy. A female vampire tries to go directly for Sung Woo, but she gets hit by fireballs of kobold sorcerers. Raidi finishes her off by cutting her into two pieces, and Sung Woo receives 2,000 gold for killing her. Vampire Master is the last remaining vampire, but he is quite strong. Normal skeletons and zombies are getting easily wrecked by him. Two zombies manage to bite him, but he easily gets rid of one of them. Vampire Master tries to go directly for Sung Woo, but while he is in the air, Sung Woo explodes the remaining zombie, which deals a huge amount of damage to the Vampire Master. He falls to the ground and Rovo starts munching on him. Sung Woo kills the Vampire Master with the Nameless Sword. He receives 20,000 gold for killing a special player, and the egg hatching days are reduced to 4,949 days. Sung Woo revives all of the dead vampires with complete limbs. Sung Woo also received another synergy because he has more than 5 vampire skeletons in his party. This synergy adds 5% bleed damage to all of their attacks and they activate the berserk mode after dying, which boosts all of their stats by 10%. Sung Woo is now sure that he has the best deck possible in this level. Jisoo and Han Ho have also sneaked in with the survivors. Jisoo has sent a private message to Sung Woo because the vampires have just started acting more suspicious. They are asking people to hand over their weapons as a requirement to enter the safety zone. Sung Woo is sure that Vampire Lord must have sensed the deaths of his underlings. That's why he's speeding things up. Meanwhile, in the survivors' camp, an old player spots some werewolves which are piked on the rooftop. The survivors become amazed after watching it because these werewolves are powerful enough to tear apart normal wolves with ease. Jisoo and Hanho's turn comes up for handing over their weapons. Jisoo thinks these players who are working for the vampires are pathetic. Meanwhile, Taesung comes from behind. He tells Jisoo Yun that he hid her twin swords in the spot she told him about. It was quite easy for them because their gang member Yong Shik is a two-star thief. They also got the stuff Hanho requested. After going through the weapon screening process, they are moved with other players. Soon, the Vampire Lord comes out with his lesser vampires. They are all wearing masks, and the Vampire Lord seems mad because of Sung Woo. Han Ho and Jisoo Yun both know that the one leading this group is the true Vampire Lord. And now they just need to wait for Sung Woo to arrive. The vampires surround the survivors, and the Vampire Lord start addressing them. He tells them that humanity has stopped evolving, and this disaster has happened because of the shortcomings of humans. He goes on to say that they will be killed here, so that the next stage of evolution can happen. 
All of the vampires remove their masks, and Vampire Laura tells them that the vampires are the only chosen one who are destined to ascend to the next stage of evolution. Survivors become scared, and the vampires start massacring them. The survivors can't escape because there are electric fences around them. Spearman Kyung Soo comes driving in and he crashes the school bus into the electric fences. Jisoo and Han Ho come out with their weapons and they start guiding the players to safety. Vampire Lord becomes more enraged but Sung Woo steps out of the bus and tells him that he is here to crash the Mosquito King's party. Vampire Lord welcomes Sung Woo to the party and Madame Yang heads out with the human collaborators to round up the escaping survivors. Vampire Lord tells him that the survivors will be dead by the time he deals with him, but Sung Woo is sure that his party members can take care of them on their own. A werewolf jumps on the Vampire Lord and he easily smashes the head of the werewolf, but it was a trap and there are goblin dead bodies filled inside the werewolf. Sung Woo detonates the goblin corpses which results in a huge explosion. The vampires become more agitated because their leader has been hit with a deadly attack. Sung Woo runs back inside the bus and the vampires start following him. There are a lot of dead monster corpses inside the bus and Sung Woo seems to have escaped through a hole in the bus. Sung Woo explodes the bus which results in the death of a huge number of vampires. Vampire Lord Han starts emitting red energy which means he is somehow regaining his strength. Meanwhile, Madame Yang is chasing down the survivors along with the player collaborators, but suddenly the player collaborators start dying one after another. Madame Yang feels an ominous presence behind her, and she manages to dodge a deadly surprise attack from Jisoo Yun. Both girls are pumped up and they get ready to go toe to toe against each other. Han Ho and Tae Song manage to escort the survivors to a safe location, but a vampire appears who was stationed there by the vampire lord himself. Han Ho tries to stop Tae Song but he starts attacking the vampire because he thinks this vampire looks weaker than others. The vampire manages to dodge all of his attacks and he's about to bite the neck of Tae Song but he gets interrupted by Han Ho's daggers. The vampire jumps up in the air while dodging the punch of Tae Song. Han Ho throws some daggers which successfully hit his face and he falls down to the ground. The vampire is not dead yet and he is pissed because they damaged his beautiful face. On the other side, Sung Woo has taken care of the low level vampires with that explosion, but he knows that his real adversary is still alive. The vampire lord jumps on the bus and he seems to have changed his form after drinking the blood of his own lesser vampire. Sung Woo summons his minions from the void and the vampire lord starts rushing toward him. The vampire lord jumps in the middle of the orc skeleton formation and he starts crushing them to pieces. Sung Woo realizes that these orc skeletons can't stop the vampire lord for much longer. Sung Woo activates death response and zombies come out of the ground. Vampire lord easily gets rid of them and Sung Woo detonates the zombies but this time vampire lord blocks the explosion with his blood field skill. Sung Woo changes his strategy and he sends the werewolves for the Cerebus synergy. This synergy effect increases their strength against a single enemy. Vampire Lord is quite confident and he takes care of three werewolves in just a single slash attack. Vampire Lord tells Song Woo that he is losing badly because he belongs to an unevolved species. He further elaborates that the strong ones are destined to rule over weak. The Vampire Lord was a serial killer even before the class selection happened. After selecting the Vampire class, he knew for sure that the guy who turned this world into a game wanted him to evolve into an apex being and he's going to lead the world to its next evolution. Sung Woo tells him these things are not even gonna matter because Vampire Lord is destined to die today. Soon Vampire Lord gets a telepathy message from Madame Yang and she needs his help. Madame Yang has suffered several injuries at the hands of Jisoo Yun. Madame Yang is pissed because she couldn't land even a single hit on Jisoo. Jisoo Yun got a lot of practical experience by hunting herself, while Madame Yang just bit chained players to get stronger. That's why she's badly losing to her. Jisoo Yun manages to land a critical double slash attack on Madame Yang. Madame Yang falls to the ground and Jisoo Yun finishes her off. Meanwhile, on the other side, Han Ho and Tae Song are not doing well. The vampire gives them a once in a life opportunity to become a vampire like him. He tells them this new world is unfair and they can increase their survival chances by becoming a parasite and sticking to someone stronger like the vampire lord. Han Ho says he is right and sticking to someone stronger is the best strategy in this world filled with monsters. That's why he is sticking with Song Wu. A rider comes from behind the vampire and he gets distracted. Han Ho throws a dagger while the vampire's attention is on the motorbike. The vampire manages to dodge the dagger and it goes directly into the chest of the rider but he is saved because he had a goblin sitting in the front. 
It was all part of Hanho's plan, and he was aiming for the goblin in the first place. Hanho grows bigger because of his skill, which makes him invincible for some time after each kill. The vampire attacks him with all of his force, but his attack had no effect on Hanho, who is currently invincible. Hanho stabs him again and again with his high speed slash skill. Tessong and a spearman also attack him at the same time. Vampire tries to go for Tessong, but Hanho blocks his attack. Vampire becomes pissed and he keeps attacking him. Spearman and Tessong go for another attack and they manage to inflict serious damage on the vampire, while Hanho is working as their shield. Hanho starts losing power and the vampire notices it. Someone throws a goblin and Hanho kills it with his knife. It turns out one of Tessong gang members is tasked at throwing goblins at Hanho whenever his skill runs out. Hanho tells the vampire that he can power up as many times as he wants because he has a lot of fresh goblins in stock. All players gang up on the vampire and they manage to defeat him. The vampire lord was observing their fights and he gets even more pissed at his elite vampires. Someone tells him that his elite vampires lost to humans and it is his turn next because he already knows about all of his weaknesses. Sungwa tells him that his first weakness is that he can't use any weapon. Vampire's second weakness is their low defense level and their high regeneration ability. Their third weakness is that they have no mana and they need blood for all of their abilities. All this time, Sungwoo was using Devil's Bloodstone item which was leeching off his health by 2% with each successful hit. Vampire Lord starts feeling weaker. Sungwoo tells him that his fourth weakness is that he talks too much, and instead of focusing on his minions, he should have gone straight for Sungwoo. Vampire Lord activates Blood Field around him and he starts heading directly towards Sungwoo. Righty blocks his way and he tries to attack Righty, but he uses his parry skill to divert the attack of the Vampire Lord. Righty throws a bottle filled with slime liquid directly to his face. Vampire Lord's face starts melting and his vision is getting blurry as well. He has used too much blood and now he has not enough regeneration power to heal his eyes. Sung Woo orders his minions to finish off the Vampire Lord. He can hear their footsteps but it is still dangerous for him and he could easily die. He starts wrecking low ranked orc skeletons rushing at him but he needs blood to regain his power. Soon he smells blood somewhere and he starts heading over there. He is going after the blood of werewolves they hung at the building for survivors to watch when they entered. Vampire Lord reaches the rooftop but a werewolf minion stabs him from above. Sung Woo tells him that he's an idiot and Sung Woo was getting his werewolf minion supply from that building in the first place. Vampire Lord receives massive damage as he hits the ground. Sung Woo is gonna finish this party with fireworks so one of his minions throws the Vampire Lord in a room filled with monster corpses. Sung Woo detonates the building and the Vampire Lord finally dies with that explosion. Sung Woo receives 10,000 gold for killing a special player, but he also completed No Country for Wicked Men special quest, so the system awards him with 30,000 gold and a C rank item ticket. His destiny has been altered as well because he completed an exclusive quest and he will receive an exclusive skill in return. His party arrives and Sung Woo is glad to see them alive and they start celebrating their victory. The next morning, everyone is quite happy to see their saviors. There are also some people in the mix who were saved before by Sung Woo's party, but soon the survivors become confused with the arrival of a whole regiment of soldiers. Sergeant Kim is leading them and he was spectating their fight from a distance. Sung Woo is wondering what they are doing here. Sergeant Kim tells him they were monitoring the group which was claiming that they have made safe zones, but they never imagined something this disastrous could happen. Sung Woo is glad that they didn't try to fight the vampires because they look much weaker. Sergeant Kim informs him that the Korean army is alive and well and there is someone who wants to meet him. The army returns to their base without Sung Woo and their leader seems to be pissed about it. During nighttime, Sung Woo opens up his status window. He received 150,000 gold alone from his last battle against the vampire lord. He got a new skill called Create Bone Armor and now he can make armor using the bones of corpses. Sung Woo uses his skill to make a bone armor for himself. It automatically becomes equipped on Sung Woo's body and it is also quite comfortable. He can equip his minions with this armor as well which will greatly boost their defense. Finally, he received a heroic rank drawn, repeating crossbow which can be fired without reloading. This is a perfect weapon for Sung Woo because he stays behind most of the times while his minions do the fighting. Sung Woo is feeling quite confident about his current state but suddenly he sees a house engulfed in flames. His mom and dad are burning inside and they are calling for his help. Sung Woo tries to help them but he realizes that he is in a body of a kid. Kid Sung Woo becomes afraid and he starts running away from his burning parents. 
He wakes up from his dream, and Han Ho informs him that Sergeant Kim is here to see him with some soldiers. Sung Woo starts preparing to meet them, but he is still afraid after watching that dream. A bold officer rushes inside while Han Ho tries to stop him. He introduces himself as Lieutenant Major Taeyong Park of the Army's S-1 Division, and Sergeant Kim is also accompanying him. Lieutenant Park gets straight to the point and he tells Sung Woo that he wants him to collaborate with them in their future missions. Sung Woo inquires about which type of collaboration they want, and Lieutenant Park tells him they want him to join the army. Sung Woo and Righty become a bit disappointed after hearing it, and he asks Lieutenant Park why he wants him to join. Lieutenant Park tells him that they want him to help them in reclaiming a territory. He further informs him that the prosecutor of Young Dong Po denies the government authority and he created a renegade group. Plus, he created the first guild in Korea and he formed a safety zone to re-establish order. He also defeated a boss monster in their area. Lieutenant Park becomes enraged as he thinks the entire nation should be rallying behind the army. But Sung Woo disagrees with him because government was completely ineffective when the survivors needed their help. Lieutenant Park is about to burst with anger and Sung Woo tells him he can work as a mercenary for them. He further tells him that government does not mean anything in this new world. Lieutenant Park grabs his collar, but Sung Woo pushes him away and starts leaving. Lieutenant Park tells him that he will not survive long enough without the support of the army, but Sung Woo is ready to take his chances in this new world. The survivors are feeling safer with the soldiers around. Ji Soo Yun tells Han Ho that people tend to rely on stable organizations, such as military, but the expressions of these soldiers are not looking well. Han Ho has watched many army-related movies, so he is quite impressed by them. He asks one of the soldiers about the Private Kwan, whom they met back with Sergeant Kim. The soldier tells him that it's a classified information, so he can't share it with him. Both Ji Soo Yun and Han Ho realize that these soldiers are acting weird, and some information about a private soldier can never be considered classified. Meanwhile, Sung Woo wanted to cooperate with the army, but he can't bear that arrogant Lieutenant Park. Sergeant Kim approaches Sung Woo and he's feeling bad for the Lieutenant Park's aggressive behavior. In truth, the army is in a real pickle and they need his help. Sergeant Kim tells him he wants to show him some top secret thing. Both of them head toward a parking lot of a building. There are a few soldiers stationed around there. They make their way around them and reach a room. Sergeant Kim shows a prophecy stone to Sung Woo. These prophecy stones are scattered around the world, and whoever touches them can see a vision of the future, but not everyone sees the exact same thing. He further tells them that this game is totally unbalanced because those people who have access to these prophecy stones have an advantage. Sung Woo is a bit hesitant, but he touches the Season 2 prophecy stone. It shows him a glimpse of the future where everyone including him and his party had been turned into undead creatures by a being known as Lich King. Lich King looks at Sung Woo and he starts burning. With that, the dream is over, but Sung Woo is still getting goosebumps from what he just witnessed. The Prophecy Stone gives an announcement that Season 2 will start on 1st January. It turns out Sergeant Kim also had seen something similar when he used the Prophecy Stone in the past. Sung Woo receives another objective-based exclusive quest called Who is the Master of Death? He needs to seize the Grim Reaper Scythe and as a reward, he will receive Wave of Death skill which he just witnessed after touching Prophecy Stone. The location of the Grim Reaper's Scythe will be revealed to him when he reaches level 15. The choices he makes during this quest will affect his destiny. Sung Woo is worried because Season 2 will start in just two months, and if he fails, everything will just turn out like what he saw in the Prophecy Stone. Sung Woo inquires about the location of the boss of this area from Sergeant Kim. It turns out boss monsters have started appearing after the start of Season 1, but Sung Woo was dealing with the vampires at that time. Sergeant Kim has information about one boss monster, and it is the same boss monster that Lieutenant Park wanted Sung Woo to kill. Sung Woo tells Sergeant Kim to inform Lieutenant Park that he was able to convince Sung Woo to help them get rid of the boss, but Sung Woo also wants gold for his service. The next day, Sergeant Kim informs Lieutenant Park that Sung Woo is ready to help them, but he wants 100,000 gold for his service. Lieutenant Park becomes angry after hearing it. Company commander informs Lieutenant Park that there is no one on the same power level as Song Wu, and he also witnessed his power when he defeated the Vampire Lord. Lieutenant Park tells them that they still have First Class Sergeant Kang, who is quite powerful. Company commander informs him that First Class Sergeant Kang is powerful, but the players under army command are not that much useful while Song Wu has an army of skeletons, which can sacrifice their life for him at any given moment. Song Wu can easily wipe out a whole battalion with just his low-ranked skeletons. The army brings in around 60,000 gold per day by defeating monsters, and they can hire Sung Woo with their two days of gold earnings. The boss monster has taken control of Airstrip, which is a strategic point for the military. 
The army had previously sent dozens of players, but only First Sergeant Kang returned alive from there. Traveling by air is the safest means of transportation if they can avoid the wyverns. Plus, Lieutenant Park will be promoted if they take back control of the airstrip. Lieutenant Park is still angry, but he agrees to hire Sung Wu. The company commander pays Sung Wu, and he tells Sung Wu that he needs to defeat the monster within three days. Sergeant Kang will be accompanying them on this mission, and he is the only survivor who returned alive from the failed boss hunt. Sergeant Kang is a bit disappointed because he will be working as an assistant of Sung Wu. Sergeant Kang asks about the level of Sung Wu and he informs him that he is on level 10. Sergeant Kang and the army players become shocked. They have been killing orcs non-stop but they still haven't reached level 10. Sung Wu tells them that he needs to kill stronger monsters than just mere orcs. Sergeant Kang angrily tells him that the boss is on a whole different level. Meanwhile, the number of survivors in Sung Wu's camp has also increased. Spearman Kyung Soo suggests that they should build a town with the help of these survivors. Those people with support skills will help build the town, while the players with fighter classes will be responsible for hunting and defending the town. Their goal is to increase their gold and military strength. Han Ho's parents praise Kyung Soo for his idea, but it tells them that it was the idea of Sung Woo in the first place. Kyung Soo thinks he is not a reliable person because all of his friends died at the hands of the vampires due to his rash decisions. Hano's father tries to motivate him and tells him that he has all the qualities of a true leader. Meanwhile, Sung Woo and his party is wrecking havoc on the streets. Not even a single mob can stand their ground against them. Even low-ranked monsters are now afraid of them. Sung Woo's party heads inside a building and they find a smith shop in there. The smith shop gives option to Sung Woo to combine three of his legendary rank item into one at the price of 100,000 gold. Sung Woo starts preparing his three items for the combination, but there is a 2% chance of losing his items, so Jisoo starts praying for Sung Woo. Sung Woo proceeds with the combination and the three items start merging. Sung Woo gets a legendary rank item called Chaos Crystal. It grants Chaos Attribute to its user and boosts mana by 500 and mana regen by 250. It can also steal mana and health by 3% during simultaneous attacks. Both Han Ho and Jisoo Yun congratulate Sung Woo for his new item. Jisoo Yun checks Smithy and it turns out she can also combine her Fire Whetstone with Incendiary Blade. And this combination requires 15,000 gold. She combines her items and receives an Ignition Blade which causes burns whenever she strikes an enemy. Hano becomes angry at the system because there is nothing available for him to combine. They head back to the store in a car complex to buy more items, but the store has already been destroyed by someone else. There is a message written on the wall which says that all pathetic humans are going to die because the age of a new species is coming. They realize that this message was written with monster claws. Sung Woo thinks that maybe it was done by a new kind of intelligent monster. With that said, they start heading back to the town. On their way, they meet Sergeant Kim who is performing a group quest with other soldiers. If they complete a group quest, their commander receives a completion reward and the soldiers defense and attack power increases by 10% for the next day. But Sergeant Kim is wondering that they have been killing orcs and goblins for a very long time, but they keep appearing like they are responding from somewhere. Sergeant Kim hopes that it must not be the case or their sufferings will never end. The low rank soldiers are just being used as slaves by the army to mine gold, and they don't even let the soldiers use the online forum. Sung Woo is thinking that army is still using same old rules, that's why the prosecutor guild has a better chance of growing in this new world. Sung Woo tells the soldiers to rest at their own town because it is close by. Meanwhile, the town is getting invaded by werebears and the survivors can't seem to hold their ground against them. In the end, Spearman Kyung Soo becomes scared after facing the werebear. The bear does a swing attack but Kyung Soo jumps over the bear. He slashes both of the eyes of the bear with one swing attack. Kyung Soo is happy because he bides some time for others, but another bear manages to catch him. Kyung Soo is about to be crushed to death but Righty chops off the arm of the bear. Ji Si Yun finishes off the bear with a single stab attack. Another bear is about to attack her from behind, but Han Ho blocks his attack with his invincible skill. Sung Woo arrives there and he's quite happy because these powerful bears are about to become a part of his army. The soldiers become amazed after witnessing Sung Woo's power from their very own eyes. Sung Woo received the bears and he received a wild tyrant synergy for having more than 4 bears in his party. This synergy decreases enemy defense by 10% and it increases all allies defense by 10%. Sung Woo tells Sergeant Kim to inform his commander that he is ready to fight the boss and reclaim the airstrip. The next morning, the survivors from the last werebear attack are getting healed. Han Ho and Ji Soo Yun congratulate Spearman Kyung Soo for holding down the werebears on his own. Sung Woo and Righty praise him as well. Sergeant Kang arrives there and he mocks the condition of Sung Woo's town and Sung Woo is not happy with his attitude. 
Sun Wu tells them that they are in a rough condition because they were attacked by werebears last night. Sergeant Kang tells him he knows those bears are very tough opponents because he defeated one of them in the past. Sergeant Kim informs Sun Wu before that Sergeant Kang has a 3-star striker class. He uses martial arts instead of weapons, but no one knows about what he chose during the second class selection. Sergeant Kim informs first class Sergeant Kang that Sung Wu is ready and they can leave right away. Sergeant Kang becomes more pissed. He angrily grabs Sergeant Kim and tells him that he should shut up because he is not bringing in the required gold from daily quests. Sung Wu thinks these low rank soldiers are nothing more than slaves for the army. Sergeant Kim bursts out in anger and he tells Sergeant Kang that a lot of his companions died because of him. Sergeant Kang strangles him and tells him to just shut up and keep bringing in gold like he's supposed to. He further tells him that his troops died because of the incompetence of Sergeant Kim and he should not have chosen a useless class like a warsmith. Sungwoo tells him that he wants to leave right away and he don't have time for Sergeant Kang's circus. Sergeant Kang angrily leaves with his troops. Sergeant Kim also leaves with his troops because they need to prepare for the boss raid. Sungwoo and his party members feel sorry for Sergeant Kim but there is nothing they can do to help him. Sung Woo and the military guys arrive at the airstrip, but the airstrip is in a very bad condition right now. Sergeant Kang is a jealous person and he hasn't told Sung Woo any useful information about the boss, but Sergeant Kim already informed Sung Woo about it. Finally, the boss monster Giant Troll appears at the airstrip, but it is much bigger than what Sung Woo expected. Troll finally spots Sung Woo's party and he starts running toward them, but Sung Woo uses death response on him and his zombies take a hold of his legs. Troll easily gets rid of all of them in a single slam attack. The whole ground starts shaking because of his attack. Sung Woo detonates the zombie and the explosion engulfs the troll. After the smoke subsides, the troll seems to have suffered a minor injury, which is getting healed with his regeneration ability. This boss monster has no special abilities like the boss monster Sung Woo faced in the past, but his strength alone is enough to make up for it. Boss gives a loud roar. Han Su and Ji Si Yun get prepared because it's their turn to fight the boss. Meanwhile, on the other side, company commander informs Lieutenant Kang that the prosecutor of Yongdong Po is gaining more influence by absorbing the small groups of survivors. Company commander asks Lieutenant Park for his permission to write a post on the public forum to make the public calm, but Lieutenant Park stops him because the higher ups think trusting this system too much will be dangerous for the army. Company commander is a bit skeptical about the higher ups decision because the game's influence in the real world is now too big and they should play by its rules. Lieutenant Park is a pathetic person and he orders his troops to kill Sung Woo after the boss monster gets defeated. First Sergeant Kang is accompanying Sung Woo and he will perform the execution right after the troll gets defeated. Lieutenant Park orders company commander to head over there and steal all gold and valuable items from Sung Woo before killing him. Company commander is not happy with the decision of Lieutenant Park, but he has no other choice but to follow the orders of his superiors. Meanwhile on the battlefield, Han Ho is soaking up all of the damage from the boss with his invincible skill. Han Ho is a bit disappointed in the boss because his attacks are not even tickling him a bit. Boss is a bit tired after all of his attacks, and Ji Si Yun jumps on him from behind. She manages to stab the back of the boss. She jumps away from the boss after leaving her sword stuck in him. There is an invincible rope attached to her sword. Han Ho starts circling around the boss with the rope. First Sergeant Kang is amazed because he thought Sun Wu's friends were just useless idiots, and they were using him to gain levels. They are both able to easily face the boss without suffering any major injuries. Han Ho's invincible ability is about to go on cooldown, but Sergeant Kim has got a fresh supply of goblins for him. Han Ho kills the goblins by throwing a knife and his force field reactivates. Finally, Han Ho is able to tie down the boss with the invincible rope. The boss monster falls to the ground and now it's Sung Woo's turn to face the boss head on. One of Sung Woo's minions gives him Dragon Knight's masterless sword and he starts charging toward the boss with his minions. All of them start bashing and piercing the boss. One of the orc skeletons punches the boss from behind. The boss monster eats the orc skeleton but there were many dead bodies inside the skeleton's bag and Sung Woo detonates them which results in a big explosion inside his mouth. Sung Woo walks up to the boss and he stabs the head of the boss with masterless sword which results in his death. He receives 220,000 gold for defeating the boss and his level has risen up to 11. All of his stats have increased by 2 and he received a received a special item chest. Killing the boss monster with masterless sword decreased egg hatching time by 98 days and now there are 4,850 days left until the egg hatches. Sung Woo chose Great Bone Weapons card as his level up skill and now he can make more variety of weapons with the bones. First Sergeant Kang is amazed by Sung Woo's feet but now he needs to get rid of him. 
Sergeant Kang is a bit hesitant, but Sung Woo tells him that he's a bit late for the surprise attack, meaning he knew everything from the start. Sergeant Kang attacks him with his Magnum Blow skill, which results in a big explosion, but Sung Woo used a new shield bone to block his attack. Their surprise attack failed, so Sergeant Kang orders his soldiers to attack Sung Woo's minions while he takes care of them. He starts charging straight towards Sung Woo. He blows Sung Woo's bone shield with a single Magnum punch. Sung Woo tries to attack him with the Masterless Sword, but Sergeant Kang kicks it out of his hand. He becomes more cocky, but Sung Woo slashes his face a bit with a bone dagger he just created from his bone armor. Sergeant Kang is still confident that he can win, but he realizes that he is surrounded by all the dead skeletons that he just mashed. Sung Woo creates spears with those bones that pierces through Sergeant Kang. He calls for his soldiers' help, but they were already in cahoots with Sung Woo. Sergeant Kim comes up to him and tells him that they will no longer be slaughtered for the delusional creeps like First Sergeant Kang. Company commander arrives there and he tells them that they are making a mistake and they can't survive in this ruthless world without the army. Company commander starts throwing threats at the soldiers. Meanwhile, First Sergeant Kang got out of the spears, but he finally snapped. Company commander tries to stop him, but he uses a mysterious injection on himself. After taking the injection, his body mass starts increasing. It was a drug that turns humans into uncontrollable werebeasts. Sergeant Kang kills company commander first. He has fully transformed into a tiger-type werebeast. Both Jisoo Yun and the tiger start advancing toward each other. He does a frontal attack, but Jisoo Yun manages to dodge it with her supreme sense skill. She jumps at him to attack him with her ignition sword, and she manages to stab one of his paws. But her sword is stuck inside his hand, and he throws her away with a single punch. Sung Woo activates his Cerebus Synergy, which gives his minions a lot of buffs if they are fighting against a single enemy. Sung Woo is really pissed and he's determined to finish him off right here. His wolves and bears easily manage to take down the Were Tiger with their huge numbers. Meanwhile, on the other side, a soldiers report to Battalion Commander that their troops are back. Sergeant Kim arrives there and Battalion Commander Park inquires about their mission. Sergeant Kim reports that they have defeated the boss. Battalion Commander is happy, but he asks about Company Commander and Sergeant Kang. Sergeant Kim replies that they are both dead, and Sung Woo arrives there. He is here to talk about the mission where Sergeant Kang tried to kill him. Sergeant Kim arrives at their main headquarter with Sung Woo and his minions. The soldiers become afraid after seeing the skeletons. Sergeant Kim informs his companions that they are going to be free very soon. Sung Woo rushes inside the building. He throws Lieutenant Park inside their commander's office. The commander is disappointed in Lieutenant Park because he failed to stop the rebellion. Sung Woo thinks this commander is pathetic because he drives his troops to their deaths. Commander informs him that they only survived up to this point because they followed the military rules. Sung Woo tells him that he is pathetic and he forced his troops to fight for him and they are on edge right now. Commander tells him that on the first day of this apocalypse, they battled hard against the monster and many soldiers sacrificed their lives in the process. They were granted a hidden synergy effect for fighting hard as a group. This synergy effect grants the commanding officer with the commander class. The commander can order anything from his troops and if they disobey him, they will receive punishment in the form of a restriction on all of their stats. His troops are granted a group quest at 6am every day and they receive a small amount of buff upon the completion of the quest. If a soldier disobeys or leave the area, he will be branded as a deserter and all the monsters within the vicinity will start hunting down that soldier. Sung Woo tells him all this time he was sending his soldiers to their deaths. The world right now is just like a survival game and all humans are just chess pawns on the board of the creator of this game. Sung Woo gets to the point and inquires about why he ordered his troops to kill him. Commander tells him that he is a thorn in his side and he cannot let rude groups like his flourish in this world and topple the government. Commander keeps accusing him of many things, but Sung Woo realizes that the commander is not even trying to mince his words to not offend Sung Woo, and maybe the commander thinks he can take care of Sung Woo with his little crossbow. Sung Woo tells him to release the soldiers from his synergy and hand over all of his gold to him. If he does that, Sung Woo will leave this area once season 1 ends. Commander becomes pissed and he tells Sung Woo that all gold and soldiers belong to the military. Sung Woo sets the record straight and tells him that he is not here to make a deal. Either the commander should hand over everything himself, or Sung Woo will retrieve them after killing him. The commander becomes afraid and he agrees to Sung Woo's conditions. Commander hands over 45,000 gold to Sung Woo, but Sung Woo thinks it's too less. Sung Woo inquires about the werebeast vials from the commander, but he refuses to tell him because it was not part of their deal. Sung Woo blackmails him by saying that he will not leave after the first stage ends. The commander tells him that he buyed the vials from the wandering peddlers and they never told him their main location. 
They also told the commander that powerless and pathetic people buy stuff from the roulette stores. Sung Woo remembers that this same catchphrase was written on the destroyed store wall, and he thinks they are responsible for destroying the store. Sung Woo starts leaving with his minions, but commander tries to attack him from behind with his crossbow. Another soldier rushes in with the crossbow and he fires at Sung Woo, but he manages to block it with his bone shield. Sung Woo had enough and he throws the bone spear shard at them, which led to their deaths. Sung Woo receives 14,000 gold for killing both of them. A minion tries to go for the commander, but he tells him to stop, or he will detonate a bomb. This bomb is called Abyss Concentrate, and he buys it from the wandering peddlers. Sung Woo becomes happy and asks him to use Abyss Concentrate on him, because it's the same skill Arc Shaman used against him back in the school. The Rare Tiger smashes through the window and he crushes the commander's hand. Sung Woo tells him to send his regard to the Vampire Lord in Hell, and the Were Tiger beheads the commander with a single attack. Sung Woo receives 6,000 gold for killing a level 3 player. He thinks the commander was a pathetic loser because he was still on level 3. Commander had only a little gold left because he spent all of their resources to buy something else. Were Tiger opens up a locker and there are many products inside which the commander bought from the peddlers. The description of the Were Beast vials say that they were originally created by an unknown player by boiling a human who just turned into a Were Beast. Injecting this vial into the muscles will turn the player into a were beast for 20 minutes. Meanwhile, on the outside, Jisoo Yun is getting healed by Hanho's new healing skill. They are using Hanho's skill instead of potions because they gave them away to the wounded soldiers, and Hanho needs to increase his healing skill level. Hanho is a bit hurt because even Sung Woo's minions look down upon him, but Riley comes up to him and pat him, which gives him some courage. Sung Woo comes out and inquires about Jisoo Yun's injuries. She tells him that she is alright and she rushed at the Were Tiger because she thought her class can easily match the Were Tiger. Sung Woo tells him that it is alright because there are many other monsters she can easily kill with her skills alone. Sung Woo is glad that Han Ho learned a healing skill because soon they will need to face the Lich King's undead army and the priest class is the perfect counter for the undead class. Han Ho can even one day beat Sung Woo if he utilizes his class well. Hanho asks about Sung Woo's new cool looking robe. Sung Woo tells him that he received it from the chest he got after killing the troll. It's a legendary rank coat called Shadow King's Robe. It reduces damage by 10% and it allows the wearer to remain hidden in the shadows until he attacks an enemy or someone uses a detection skill to catch him. Hanho becomes disheartened because he never received any legendary rank item. Sergeant Kim informs Sung Woo that some soldier decided to depart to look for their families while the rest of them are going to Sung Woo's town. There were also some who refused to cooperate to the very end, and they will fend for themselves now. Sung Woo tells them to head back to the town. Sung Woo needs to keep grinding levels because there are only 3 days left until the end of stage 1. Back in the town, everyone is busy grinding levels and raiding dungeons. Meanwhile, Sung Woo leveled up to 12 after defeating an orcs camp, but his level up progress has slowed down because he is only encountering weaker monsters. Sung Woo selected a strength card as his level up option, and his strength increased by 3, and now his total strength is 13. But it's still not enough. He needs to level up to 15 as soon as possible and acquire the Grim Reaper's Scythe. A new notification pops up which informs the players that chapter 1 of the main story has ended, and the double gold event bonus is also invalid now. Plus, the restriction on travel between different areas has also been lifted. A main story start guide pops up. It congratulates the player for surviving up to chapter 2. The system further tells them that they will soon find out the purpose of this game, and now the survivors need to build up their strength to face this new world. Three more warning pop up which tells them that this event will last for 20 days. Raid boss monsters will appear throughout the world which will provide major awards and these raid bosses can attack the safety zones as well. The last warning says that signs of angels or demon caps are scheduled for a later update. Players can start looking for the traces of both species which are scattered across the world. Sung Woo realizes that there are two important things in this new update. First are the raid bosses and second are demons or angels, but he has no information about them. Han Ho informs Sung Woo about something major in the mobile app. It turns out they published the ranking for the Korean server. Sung Woo is on third place on the whole Korean server. Sung Woo is amazed by the guy on first position because he's been killing monster non-stop, but he's still on level 12. He thinks maybe the guy on rank 1 is a hardcore gamer. Jisoo realizes something strange about the fourth and fifth place players. Judging by their ID names, they both belong to the same group, but they're still in the top 5 together. 
Hano tells Sung Woo to check out the online forum. It turns out Second Place Prosecutor of Yong Dong Po wants to meet him and he made a public post about it. He wants to request an official meeting with Sung Woo. He has the Korea's largest survival community with 500 players working under him. Their goal is to overcome this crisis and reveal the truth behind this game. The prosecutor has heard many good things about Sung Woo and he wants him to join his guild. The prosecutor will come in person if Sung Woo agrees to meet him. Sung Woo is sure that this prosecutor guy wants something different from him, that he is not showing to others. Now Sung Woo has one more thing to worry about. Meanwhile, on the other side, prosecutor and his guild members are burning some monsters. One of his players informs him that travel restrictions have been lifted, and this is the perfect opportunity to expand their territory. A female hunter stops him because there are raid bosses, demons, and angels outside, and they first need information about them. Prosecutor tells them that their mission is to slay monsters and save people. They need to prevent the annihilation of their civilization. The players become motivated after hearing it. The female player tried to track the number one player so they can recruit him, but there is no trace of him anywhere. That's why she made that post to recruit Sung Woo who is on the third place. They need good reputed players like Sung Woo to increase their strength because this world is filled with selfish and corrupt people. The survivors are praising Sung Woo non-stop on the online forums and he has become more popular than Prosecutor. The Prosecutor needs to meet him as fast as possible and make sure that he is not a threat to their future. The female player informs the Prosecutor that Sung Woo replied to their post and he is ready to meet the Prosecutor. Prosecutor tells his players to get ready to travel to Hwasong Fortress in Suwon. The next morning, Sung Woo tells his companions that he needs to meet Prosecutor to share some important information and he wants to know about tips to level up quickly or they will be killed by the Lich in the future. Taesong Biker Groups arrives there and he informs Sung Woo that they were attacked by some strange people who took his friend Yong Sik with them. They were looking for something called Golden Deer, but once they found out Taesong Group knows nothing about the Golden Deer, they started attacking them. Ji Soo Yun thinks that they are just a bunch of outlaws from another area, but soon they will find out about their town once they investigate Yong Sik. Sung Woo asks Taesong to lead him to those bandits. Meanwhile, the bandits are beating Yong Sik, but he is not giving away any information to them. He knows they will finish him off if he tells them the information about their town. One player is about to kill him, but Sung Woo's party arrives there on time. Bandits ask them the same question about the Golden Deer, but Sung Woo tells him that he has no idea about what they have never heard of anything related to Golden Deer. The bandit is a pervert, so he asks them to hand over Ji Soo Yun to them. Ji Soo Yun snaps and she wants to kill him. The bandit rushes toward her. He uses a skill with his weapon, but Ji Soo Yun dodges it. He keeps swinging his weapon at her, but she easily dodges all of his attacks. Finally, she decides that it is enough, and she cuts one of the arms of the bandit. His henchman throws a fireball at Jisoo, but she easily manages to parry it. Jisoo rushes at them with her sword, and she burns them alive with her skill. Two more bandits get nailed by Hanho's daggers. One of the bandits took Young Shik hostage, and he is threatening them to back off. Sung Woo appears from behind him, and he finishes him off with his dagger. Some bandits manage to escape in time on their motorbikes. Taesong asks Yong Shik if he found out about anything on the Golden Deer from the bandits and he replies that it gives players some epic items. Soon, Jisoo spots a Golden Deer near them. A hidden quest appears and now they need to catch the Golden Deer to acquire one of the tickets to a hidden stage. Sung Woo uses his technique right below the Golden Deer and his zombies start appearing out of it. The Golden Deer managed to escape from them. Sung Woo sends his werewolves after the deer. They chase the deer into an alleyway, but their path seems to be already blocked by a werewolf. The werewolf becomes scared after watching Sung Woo's party and it starts running away from them. The golden deer gets easily crushed by Sung Woo's werewolves. Sung Woo receives a part of the ticket to the hidden stage. But Sung Woo is worried about something because all werewolves instinctively attack their prey while this one used his head and ran away. He is worried about it, but they need to head back to the town for their meeting. Meanwhile, back in town, everyone is happy because they are going to see the prosecutor which is quite famous on the online forum. Sung Woo is quite impressed because prosecutor made it this far using a helicopter without worrying about the wyverns. Sung Woo and the prosecutor meet each other for the first time. The prosecutor introduces himself as Jong Chun Che. Sung Woo notices that people of his town saw the prosecutor for the first time but they are acting overly charmed by him. They are acting the same way the lesser vampires acted for their vampire lord. Even Han Ho's eyes are sparkling after meeting the prosecutor. Sung Woo takes him to his office and prosecutor tells him that the people of his town are very lively. 
Prosecutor further elaborates that they are not doing too much well because survivors are flocking in Yongdongpo and the total number of people in Yongdongpo has exceeded 30,000. Sungwoo thinks that having more people must make his guilt stronger, but prosecutor tells him that it is not the case because most of the survivors are children or elderly who cannot go out in the fields to hunt. That is why he needs strong people like Sungwoo to join his guild. He knows Sung Woo is quite capable because he made it to top 5 in the rankings, which is a tough task in itself. When the game started, his parents were killed by the monsters. He somehow made it out alive due to his power. The prosecutor despises this game and he wants to take his revenge on the entity who created it. That is why he wants Sung Woo to join him because he wants reliable people with good reputation like him. There is also something else which made him personally come to Sung Woo. Prosecutor shows him another prophecy stone and he asks Sung Woo to touch it. After Sung Woo touches it, he is shown another bad ending for the Korean server. This ending shows future glimpse of Yoido Island. Some roots start sprouting out of the ground and they turn into a big world tree. Its roots start finding and killing players around the area. The prophecy stone's notification informs him that this tragedy will occur if they fail to stop the fallen ones who will plant the seed of the world tree in a certain area and cause it to mutate by offering human sacrifices. Prosecutor tells him that they need to work together to stop this tragedy from happening. He further informs him that the world tree has planted its roots on Yoido Island and there happens to be a boss raid in there. Prosecutor becomes pumped up and he tells Sung Woo that they need to raid the boss as soon as they can. Sung Woo also agrees with him because the fate of their world is at stake. But he hesitates to share the information about the Lich King because that tragedy will only occur if Sung Woo fails to obtain the Grim Reaper's scythe or maybe Prosecutor will kill him thinking that it will cancel the exclusive quest. Sung Woo agrees to cooperate with him but he will not join his guild. They will form a temporary alliance and the rewards from the raid will be shared equally among them. They are about to shake on these conditions but Han Ho bursts in the room and he informs them that a group of raiders is heading toward their town. Prosecutor tells him that it is a great opportunity to show off their guild's fighting prowess. The raiders are drawing close by and Prosecutor already knows about Sung Woo's class, so he tells him about his class. Prosecutor has a Crusader Commander class. He can receive a powerful synergy by appointing Crusaders and forming an Order of Knights. One of the raider lackeys spots Sung Woo's party and he informs his leader that they killed his men. The leader tells them that he was originally looking for the golden deer, but now he will get a lot of gold and resources after massacring the whole town. Prosecutor can just tell by one glance that these raiders are used to killing people. He orders his crusaders team to charge at the enemy. The raider leader orders to shoot down the crusaders with ranged attacks. The ice and fireball skills are about to hit the crusaders but prosecutor forms a shield around them which manages to soak up all of the ranged attacks. The leader of the raiders tells his lackeys to engage in close ranged combat. One raider tries to bash a crusader with his iron mace but he gets chopped in half by him. The crusaders are successfully managing to keep the raiders at bay. Raiders try to mash two of their trucks into the formation of crusaders but prosecutor uses his cross spear skill which obliterates both trucks in an instant. Sung Woo is impressed because prosecutor just took out two trucks with one attack. The raiders are getting pushed back by the crusaders but the leader of the bandits threw his axes at them which dealt massive damage to some of them. The leader recalls his axes to himself which proves that he is quite powerful and those axes are not ordinary weapons. The leader tells them these are vortex axes and no armor can block them. Prosecutor calls his weapons mere toys and he gets ready to face the leader of the raiders. The raider leader becomes angry after hearing it and he throws his legendary vortex blades at the prosecutor which results in a big explosion. After the smoke subsides, the prosecutor is standing above the vortex blades and they have been destroyed by his sword. The bandit leader becomes more angry after losing his legendary rank weapon. The female player under prosecutor informs Sung Woo that the prosecutor receives a defense boost based on the number of knights in his party and he probably has the highest defense in the world. But Sung Woo and Ji Soo Yun are skeptical about it because they think Han Ho has the highest defense in the whole world. Prosecutor uses a Crusader's Splendor skill which heals his units and gives them a buff equal to the amount of damage that he blocked. His knights are buffed and they start rushing at the raiders, but the raider leader is still not done with his schemes. Meanwhile, the townspeople are hiding because of the ongoing raid. Han Ho's father is curious to know how the Liberation Guild looks like. Spearman Kyung Soo is also curious so both of them go out to take a peek but the condition of the crusaders is not looking good. They were all knocked out by what looks like poison gas. The raider leader tells them that he bought his abyss concentrate from the wandering salesman. 
On the other hand, prosecutor wanted to demonstrate a small bit of the fighting power of the Liberation Guild to Sung Woo. Prosecutor starts getting ready to use a secret technique which he wanted to keep a secret but Sung Woo asks prosecutor to stand down because he has seen enough and now it's his turn to show his new power he just got from the Abyss Concentrate. The leader of the raiders throws another bottle of Abyss Concentrate at Sung Woo but he becomes even more powerful after absorbing the essence of the Abyss Concentrate. Sung Woo realizes that this Abyss Concentrate is a lesser form of the skill Orc Shaman used at him back in the college campus. One of the bandits removes his mask thinking that the poison is defective, but he gets knocked out in an instant. Sung Woo activates death response in the midst of the bandit's formation and bandits get scared because they now know they are up against the third rank necromancer from the Korean server. Sung Woo's minions start massacring the bandits. Hano's father and Kyung Soo are both happy after watching Sung Woo wrecking havoc. Hano's mom comes up to check on them, which scares them and they give out a loud scream. The bandit leader notices it and tells his underlings to take them hostage. The bandits start rushing at them but Jisoo Yun blocks their way. She starts slashing them with her skill and the bandit leader realizes that he should not have messed with these people. But he's too late and he gets stabbed from behind by Sung Woo. Sung Woo receives the other half of the Golden Deer ticket as a reward which completes his quest. Another notification pops up which tells him to get ready because he will be teleported to a hidden stage where only ticket owners are allowed. Soon he gets teleported there and Prosecutor is curious about this gate. He tries to enter it but he gets stopped by the system because he has no ticket. One of his underlings says that Sung Woo was more powerful than Prosecutor but Prosecutor stops him from spreading such rumors and it looks like he's being jealous of something. Prosecutor asks Jisoo Yun about the gate Sung Woo just went into but Jisoo refuses to tell him anything. The prosecutor was using a passive skill called War Hero Aura on everyone around him till now. This skill creates an aura around the prosecutor which instills feelings of likability and respect for him. This skill works well on lower level players. It can also affect high level players if they are in a state of anxiety. Jisoo Yun is not affected by this skill. On the other hand, Dum Han Ho is completely affected by it and he is about to tell a prosecutor about the event but Jisoo Yun shuts his mouth. Prosecutor tells them that he wanted to inquire about his gate because he's worried for the safety of Song Woo. These words put Jisoo Yun in a state of anxiety and she spills the beans that this gate leads to a hidden stage. The prosecutor thanks her and he tells her that they don't need to be worried about Song Woo because he's one of the top ranking players. He further informs Jisoo that her skills with sword are on another level and he wants her to be a part of the Liberation Guild. But Jisoo straight out refuses his offer. Hanho is ready to join them but Jisoo Yun drags him away. Prosecutor is quite impressed because most of the people he met before were easily affected by his skill. On the other side of the gate, Sung Woo arrives at the hidden stage. A notification pops up which tells him that he will receive a special award for clearing the stage even if he fails. He will be transported back to his original location and if he dies, he will still get transported back to the real world. Some gold colored goblins start surrounding Sung Woo. These goblins are quite cocky and they think Sung Woo is their prey. Sung Woo summons Righty only and orders them to get rid of these low ranked pests. Meanwhile, just outside the gate, Liberation Guild is taking care of their injured members. Normal healing potions were not effective so they had to use antidotes which proves that it was a low rank debuff curse but it can't be healed with antidotes. Prosecutor is still wondering why such a powerful curse had no effect on Sung Woo. The glasses guy in Prosecutor Guild has a 3 star scouter skill and he informs Prosecutor that Sung Woo was buffed by the curse during the fight. The female player tells Prosecutor that she will write the contract for their alliance herself which will be more beneficial for them. Prosecutor allows her to write the contract but reminds her that she should not do anything which can turn Sung Woo against them. Prosecutor is wondering that everyone who first touched the prophecy stone became afraid after witnessing a glimpse of the end of the world but Sung Woo seems nonchalant about it. He tasks the female player to find out if Sung Woo had come in contact with the prophecy stone before. Meanwhile, Sung Woo's minions are wrecking havoc inside the secret dungeon. He resurrects some golden orcs and realizes that these monsters are a bit stronger than the ones in the human world. But it poses no threat to Sung Woo and he is enjoying this hunt. Inside the dungeon, he has no one to protect so he can go all out without worrying about anything. He is also thinking that he is a one man army and he has no need for any teammates. His expression starts changing but he becomes normal after hearing someone call his name. There is no one around but he thinks he needs to get out of here as soon as possible or he will lose his mind. He moves further into the dungeon and he finally arrives to a location where he has two options. He can go for a bigger treasure or a smaller one with less danger. 
Sungwoo is quite confident at this point and he chooses the bigger one. Sungwoo reaches the treasure chest but he is skeptical because no one tried to stop him. He orders his minions to attack the treasure chest. After getting attacked, the treasure chest turns into a Mimic boss monster. Mimic's teeth are very strong and his bite attack can deal a massive amount of damage. Sungwoo thinks that its mobility must be low because it has no legs or arms. Sungwoo orders his werebears and werewolves to attack it but the boss monster easily pushes them back and Sungwoo gets caught up in the impact. Sungwoo starts coughing blood. Mimic becomes more active after smelling the blood and he starts chasing Sungwoo. At this point, Sungwoo realizes that he really messed up this time and he should not have taken the boss monster lightly. He is also missing his teammates because he is always extra careful when they are around. Mimic is about to chomp Sungwoo but his minions somehow manage to hold it back. Sungwoo activates death response inside the mouth of the Mimic and his zombies start rushing inside its mouth. Sungwoo gets back and his minions close the mouth of the Mimic with their weight. Sungwoo detonates the zombies and even his minions get knocked back by the impact of the explosion. After the smoke subsides, Sungwoo receives a total of 1434 points for defeating the Mimic and completing A plus ranked mission. The Mimic has no damage on its outer shell which means it could not be defeated from outside. Sungwoo takes a note of it and he will be extra careful from now on. After getting healed, Sungwoo heads towards the next room. This classroom is a reward room and there are many lockers inside which can be unlocked using the points he just got from defeating the boss. The items inside these lockers are not available in the normal stores and they can boost experience and stats of a player. Sungwoo buys an oath parchment item which can allow him to make a pledge with another player. Both players can each purpose one condition and failure to meet the condition will result in death. Sungwoo chooses three more C rank items which includes an upgrade stone, strength upgrade vial and an experience card. Sungwoo leveled up to level 13 as a reward for completing the hidden stage and all of his stats are boosted. He also received 150,000 gold. Sungwoo chooses a guaranteed 3 point agility card because if he had enough agility he could have easily outrun the mimic. A portal to the real world opens up and Sungwoo heads inside it. Sungwoo and the prosecutor meet up again and Sungwoo tells him that he is sorry for wasting his time. The prosecutor presents him some potions as a gift. The prosecutor wants to announce their alliance to the public so he suggests that they should post a picture of both of them and their contract on the forum. One of his guild members has a photographer class. He has skills and items that allow him to post picture on the online forum. He further elaborates that people need hope so they look up to heroes like Sungwoo and Prosecutor. This can make Sungwoo an easy target for other player but he needs a positive image so he agrees to it. After that, Prosecutor leaves with his guild. Ji Su Yun tells Sung Woo that they need to grind more levels before the raid and Sung Woo agrees with her. The next morning, a group of goblins and orcs get attracted by a smell. Both groups start charging at each other and Sung Woo detonates the ones who just died which results in a big explosion. They are hunting with this method and it is quite fast for gaining experience. This item they are using to attract monsters is called rancid wolf meat. It was a failed recipe of Hanho's mom and it smells a lot so Sungwoo asks him to put it away. Hanho's father set up a sentry post with his new Korean sentry skill that provides a buff to the safety zone. Now Sungwoo has no need to worry about the town's safety. Taesong arrives there with his biker gang. They have an urgent news for Sungwoo. They found a store in Hangnam but it was already destroyed by someone. Sungwoo thinks that this is turning into a really serious problem. They basically have to hunt or forage for their daily necessities and there is no way they can attempt things like farming anytime soon. Sungwoo tells him to inform Spearman Kyungsoo to assign guards on every single store they find or this problem can soon threaten their safety. Sungwoo asks Taesong why his female friends are standing so far away. Taesong informs him that he kicked his friend when she was possessed by the vampire lord and now they think Sungwoo is a brute who beats women. Taesong leaves with his gang and Sungwoo gets ready to grind more levels. Suddenly Ji Su Yun's skill activates which informs her of incoming danger. She tells everyone to get ready for action. Suddenly two werewolves rush out from the windows of buildings. Sungwoo's minions try to hold them back. Sungwoo is about to shoot a werewolf but another werewolf appears behind him and he tells him not to shoot. Sungwoo becomes amazed after hearing a werewolf talk. The werewolf starts attacking them even after he asks them to not shoot. A werewolf takes hold of Hanho's bag and all three of them start eating the rancid wolf meat like crazies. While werewolves are busy eating the meat, they get surrounded by Sungwoo's minions. Sungwoo asks the werewolf to give him a good reason to not shoot this time. Two werewolves are scared and they ask their leader what they should do. The werewolf leader starts rushing at the location with weakest orcs. He starts killing them and he tells the other werewolves to run away while he buys time for them. 
Sungwoo shoots two arrows which successfully stop him, but his two companions manage to get away. Sungwoo informs the werewolf leader that he showed a stunning display of camaraderie, and he asks him why they attacked his party. The werewolf leader informs them that they lost their minds after they smelled the meat Hanho was carrying. That's why they attacked them. Sungwoo inquires about how he came back to his senses. He informs them that they were given a quest to hunt and devour 10 humans. After completing the quest, they came back to their senses. Sungwoo thinks that they must be the ones responsible for destroying the stores, but the werewolf informs them that they are not responsible for it, and they try to avoid humans as much as possible. He further informs them that there is another group that is extremely hostile towards humans, and they are responsible for destroying the stores in order to put players at a disadvantage. He further informs them that there are humans in that group as well. They are called the Mad Scientists, and they are basically the leaders of that group. They are all collaborating together to create dangerous items. Sungwoo realizes that they must be the wandering salesmen. Sungwoo thanks him for being honest, but he informs him that his friends are not going to come back to save him. Werewolf has no worries, because when the class selection happened, he was skeptical about the system, so he didn't choose any card, and he didn't allow his family to choose anything either. But his son was into games, so he chose a card. His son was the first human he devoured, and he wanted to die the moment he regained his senses. The werewolf wishes Sungwoo and his party the best of luck for their future adventures, and Sungwoo stabs him. Hanho is feeling bad for the werewolves, but Sungwoo tells him to get ready because they are going after the two werewolves who just got away. Sungwoo needs to interrogate them so he can find more information about the werebeast's territory. Sungwoo is a bit hesitant, but he knows werebeasts are designed as monsters, and they can get out of control at any given moment, so he can't show any mercy to them. Sungwoo's party has come quite far as they were searching for the werewolves. They hide after hearing some voices coming from nearby. It turns out both of the werewolves were captured by kobolds. One of them suggests that they should make sausages out of these wolves, but their team leader tells them not to eat them because they are presents for their queen. Kobolds start stabbing the werewolves with spears which are coated with some sort of paralyzing poison, and they drag them to their hideout once they lose consciousness. Sungwoo and his friends are confused because kobolds are low-ranked monsters and they easily manage to capture two mid-tier werewolves. This dungeon has a store as well, which means that the store must be still intact because it has not been cleared yet. Sungwoo tells his party members that they need to secure this store for the survival of their whole community. They receive a notification which states that this is a large dungeon called the Venomous Spider Queen Chambers. This is a killer dungeon as well because it has taken the lives of 124 players. They will receive additional 50% rewards for clearing it. Hano is afraid because they didn't bring any live goblins with them and this dungeon is designed to be favorable for monsters. Further inside the dungeon, they witness people who are tied with spider webs and they are calling for their help. Ji Seyun uses her fire sword technique to cut down the webs and free the players. One of the players is quite thankful but suddenly some spiders burst out of his mouth which results in his death. Sung Wei explodes the dead bodies of the players to stop spiders but it alerts the kobolds who seem to be working with the spiders and they start swarming them. Han Ho kills one of them by throwing a knife which activates his ability. Han Ho is now ready to show these little critters what real pain and despair feels like. Han Ho activates his berserk mode and he is easily bashing the spiders and kobolds. Even the monsters become afraid and they think of Han Ho as a true demon. Han Ho uses his punches to smash the heads of the monsters. One of the kobolds instructs them to change their strategy and tie Han Ho with spider webs. They surround Han Ho with spider webs from all sides, and they finally manage to tie him up, but Han Ho easily bursts out of the webs. Han Ho is quite pissed at them, but a kobold orders the spiders to keep spraying Han Ho with webs, and they finally manage to completely immobilize him. Han Ho becomes scared, and he calls for Sung Woo's help. Sung Woo explodes all dead bodies, and the monsters get caught up in it. Sung Woo, Ji Si Yun, and Raidi remind Han Ho that he got into this situation because he was too cocky. While they are talking, more monsters swarm them. Sung Woo activates death response to summon zombies. He then explodes them to get rid of the invading monsters. After some time, they cleared the whole subway station, but their path to the next station is blocked. Sung Woo just remembers that this subway was connected to a mall above and maybe the queen is present there. After clearing the whole mall, they reach the boss room. They are about to enter it, but a notification pops up which informs them that it's a killer dungeon which has taken the lives of 124 players, and they will receive a small reward if they give up now. Han Ho and Ji Si Yun ask Sun Wu to reconsider it, because it looks like a tough boss is ahead, but Sun Woo informs them that the boss raid is going to be even more tougher, so they should face this queen now to get stronger. 
When they enter the boss room, a kobold shaman is present there who welcomes them, and he is the boss of this dungeon. Hanu is surprised because this kobold shaman can perfectly mimic human language, unlike other kobolds who only know a few human words. Kobold shaman informs them that he ate 20 human brains, which gave him speech ability. Sungwoo now knows that the game is designed two ways, and monsters can also become stronger by killing humans. Kobold shaman tells them that he will soon have 23 human brains. The ground starts shaking and another boss monster called Giant Venomous Spider Queen makes her appearance. Both monsters unite their forces and merge into one. Sung Woo uses death response for his usual explosion skill. Spider Queen uses her steel webs to capture the zombies and Sung Woo's minions. Instead of finishing them, she throws them away from her. Kobold Shaman already knew about Sung Woo's explosion skill because he was observing them through his scouts. Sung Woo is worried because this kobold knows human speech, plus he has become intelligent like a human. Han Ho throws his daggers at the kobold, but they get blocked by Spider Queen. Kobold informs them that after merging, he has become the brain while Spider Queen is the body, so now she will protect him at all costs. Spider Queen attacks them with more webs, but Ji Yun uses her ignition sword which easily manages to burn the webs. Ji Yun attacks the spider and one of her legs catches fire. Kobold Shaman uses his aqua skill to spray water on the spider's leg. He then starts holding back Ji Yun with his aqua skill. Sung Woo instructs his minions to stand together and block the boss monster. He further instructs Han Ho to stay with Jisoo Yun. Sung Woo seems to have cooked up a plan for the boss. The boss is smashing the minions one by one and he is eager to eat the human brains. Sung Woo resurrects all of the dead monsters which were captured above by the queen before. Sung Woo tells him that his dinner time is over because this boss nest filled with dead bodies is a perfect combination for his necromancer class. The newly reincarnated minions start rushing towards the boss. Spider Queen easily slashes some of them in half with her leg attack. One of the minions manages to slash one of her legs. The queen becomes more agitated and she throws poison at the minions. But the minions are not affected by the poison because they are just made up of bones. Kobold Shaman also realizes it and he instructs the queen to not use poison on the corpses. Queen somehow manages to bash the first wave of skeleton minions, but someone reincarnates more dead monsters. Most of the dead bodies in the boss room belong to werebeasts because Spider Queen is a picker eater and she prefers stronger monsters. The Kobold Shaman becomes agitated by the continuous waves of werebeast minions so they jump up to go directly for Sung Woo. Spider Queen lunges at Sung Woo with all her might but he manages to block her attack with his bone shield. Spider Queen keeps destroying his bone shields and Sung Woo keeps making them again and again. One of her attack manages to hit Sung Woo but he is holding her back as much as he can. Kobold becomes really pissed at the minions who keep attacking him from behind. The queen grabs all the corpses and the kobold shaman burns them using his fireball skill. Sung Woo realizes that this kobold is getting more smarter as the fight goes on. Sung Woo's minions dash toward the kobold shaman but he blocks them using an air boom skill which creates a force field around him. Kobold shaman becomes more cocky because Sung Woo has a limited number of minions remaining and he can't summon more. Shaman lets his guard down and Jisoo Yun jumps from behind him and she tries to strike the shaman but her attack gets blocked by Spider Queen's legs. Hanho appears along with zombies and it turns out both Jisoo and Hanho were planning something behind the scenes. Kobold shaman makes fun of Hanho for being weak and pathetic but Spider Queen seems to be hesitating for some reason. Hanho pulls out a rancid meat dish. It turns out Hanho was preparing rancid meat all this time. Both Spider Queen and Kobold Shaman can't resist its smell. All zombies have been loaded with rancid meat so the queen grabs them and they start chomping on them. Sung Woo says his final goodbye to the copy Kobold Shaman as he detonates the zombies which results in a huge explosion. On the other side, Prosecutor is facing a bad boss monster and he manages to cut it into two with his sword slash attack. His troops start celebrating their victory. It turns out Prosecutor can receive 10% experience points from his Crusaders too, but he's still worried about how Gang Sok Han became the first ranked player. Prosecutor has the best guild in Korea under his command, but he still cannot catch up to the mysterious guy on first place, and he can be a threat to him in the future. The scouter of his party informs him that the Korean rankings have changed. It turns out Sung Woo reached level 14 before him and he is now on second place. Prosecutor bursts out with anger after watching it as he is obsessed with staying on the top rankings. After the explosion, Goblin Shaman is still hanging on to his dear life, but Hanho throws a knife which gets stabbed in his head, and they receive 300,000 gold for defeating the Kobold Shaman boss, plus 50% extra awards for clearing the killer dungeon. 
Hanho is glad because he finally pulled his weight, but the Spider Queen is still alive and she tries to go for Hanho. Righty stabs her in the eye and she dies on the spot. Sungwoo levels up to 14 for defeating the boss and Righty's rank increases because he defeated a powerful boss monster. His fighting power and his commanding abilities increased as well. Sungwoo draws another card as a gift for leveling up and now his total number of minions have increased by 2. He is now ready for the boss raid, plus his first awakening is not far away either. After some time, they manage to find the C rank store in the dungeon. This store works like a slot machine and there are gold, platinum and diamond options in it. They need to spin the slot machine and they will receive a reward if 3 same things match on the screen. Hano is quite pissed because he knows this is a gambling machine and he has the most bad luck out of all of them. Jisoo and Han Ho both have 300,000 gold coins, while Sung Woo has 1,600,000 gold coins, so they can try again and again until they get something good. This time Han Ho tells them that he's going to use the machines first because the first person has the most luck, but Sung Woo tells them that there are three machines and they can all try together. All of them keep trying but none of them succeeds. A machine message pops up which informs them that they will receive a guaranteed low ranking item even if they fail 5th time in a row, and Hanho is pissed about it. Sungwoo and Jisoo Yoon keep trying like they are addicted to the gambling system, while Hanho finally manages to hit a jackpot. He received a legendary magic scroll which allows the player to use a random skill, and there is a 50% chance of failing for this item. Finally Jisoo Yoon had enough and she gives up while Sungwoo is completely addicted to it. Sungwoo gets the first place item after a few tries, and even he can't believe it. He got a legendary item called Shadow King's Ring. It increases its user's agility by 3 and health by 2. It also summons a Shadow Clone which deals 50% damage. Sungwoo got a new special quest called Shadow King's Heir. He needs to gather all of Shadow King's relics and he will get a Shadow King's Crown for completing this mission. Jisoo Yoon didn't get anything so Sungwoo gave her the Wind Spirits Bracelet. Sungwoo returns to the town to inform others about the newly discovered system shops. Sungwoo and his party spend the next few days to make the system of the town more self-sufficient. Sungwoo and his companions are now ready to leave for the raid. Hanho informs Sungwoo about a new development in the app. It turns out there is a new broadcasting station feature and one of the broadcasts is live right now. Jisoo Yoon thinks it's a test stream because they can only see an office. Sungwoo knows that this can be a good way to manipulate public opinion. Prosecutor is not a bad person but he is too ambitious and he will use this feature to rally more men under his guild. Sungwoo has become more popular after advancing to level 14 before him which has thrown a wrench in the prosecutor's plan and he will try to keep Sungwoo in check. Sungwoo has oath parchment he got from the hidden stage and he knows it is going to come in handy pretty soon. A helicopter arrives to pick them up. Min Him Sung introduces himself as the lieutenant of the crusader team. While they are on their way, Sungwoo asks him if it is okay to fly like this with all the wyverns around. Min Hum Sung tells him that nothing is impossible for the Liberation Guild and the pilot gives them a thumbs up. They have guild members all over Seoul who are tracking the location and route of each wyvern in real time. Sungwoo wonders that having a bigger guild has many advantages like this. Suddenly, a notification pops up which tells them that the raid group has been assigned a quest. It's a competition type quest and they need to slay the raid boss on their own. They will be given a special item as a reward. There are a few groups participating in this raid so it can turn into a friendly competition which can produce better results. The final raid boss lizard man Warlord will receive the gladiator's blessing which can reduce the damage from most concentrated attacks by 90%. This buff will be deactivated during a one on one combat, plus the person who will defeat the boss alone will receive a special title. Min Hum Song becomes a bit taken aback after reading it because it was not part of their plan, but he is sure his sister or prosecutor can't take care of it, which makes Han Ho think that they are both cut from the same cloth. Song Woo was not expecting this because raid boss monsters are supposed to be defeated with combined efforts. Raid bosses are quite formidable foes, he is sure that someone is watching them. They put in a lot of work to get ready for this raid, but at the last minute, someone made it much harder. Sungwoo is now out of other options and he will have to compete against the leaders of other groups. In the player guidebook section, Prosecutor uploaded a message in which he stated that 12 different groups and a thousand players will be taking part in Yoido Island Raid. This whole process will be broadcasted live. 
after Yoido Island Raid Liberation Guild plans to hunt down monsters throughout Korea and ultimately across the whole world. The human players become happy to know about this announcement, but there are also some people in the mix who think Song Woo should be leading this expedition instead of Prosecutor, because he has a higher rank than the Prosecutor. Finally, Song Woo and his party members arrive at their destination. Prosecutor welcomes him in person, and Song Woo commends him by saying that the whole area is well organized and they must have prepared well for the raid. Sungwoo notices a camera, and he has a feeling that Prosecutor wants to use the raid as an excuse to boost his public image through the live broadcast. A player comes forward and he starts defaming Sungwoo for only coming with two people while he came here with 31 of his elite players. Sungwoo thinks that Prosecutor and this purple-haired Harry Potter must have planned this in advance so they can defame him. Prosecutor introduces him as Gang Yun Lee, and he is the leader of a group of survivors in Daehak Ro. Gang Yun Lee is a fire type sorcerer and he's mentioned pretty often in the app forums. Sungwoo reminds him to not be cocky and his teammates can easily beat his whole group. Plus, they are here for a boss raid, not a war. Kang Yun Lee becomes pissed, but Prosecutor tells him not to underestimate Song Woo's class because he is never alone and he can summon his minions at any time. Prosecutor tells them to head inside because it is almost time for the meeting. Inside the meeting room, leaders of different groups are gathered. Min Ha Song introduces herself as the deputy lieutenant of the Crusaders team. She informs them that the raid's level of difficulty has increased with this new quest and the awards have also increased accordingly. They don't know what type of items they will receive but they are thinking about converting the value of items into gold and dividing it equally among the 12 of them. All of the leaders agree without any second thoughts but Sungwoo realizes that it was all pre-planned and they are working together with Prosecutor from the start. All 10 of these leaders belong to the Liberation Guild in some way and their rewards will also go toward the Liberation Guild and Sungwoo will only receive 1 12th of the share. Min Hwa Song asks if anyone has other suggestions. Song Woo raises his hand and he objects her proposal. Song Woo further elaborates that this quest stimulates the players to fight the boss one on one. So, the player who risks his life to defeat the boss must get better rewards. Min Hwa Song informs him that he was the one who proposed the idea of equal distribution in the first place. He reminds her that he wanted a fair reward, not an equal one. Most of these players are low level and they can't even go one on one against the boss. One of the leaders becomes pissed and he asks Sung Woo for a one on one duel. He is An Sok Gu, a self styled Iron Fist. He is 11th in the ranking and he is famous for fighting big monsters hand to hand. Sung Woo tells him to just sit down because if he gets serious, it will not end well for An Sok. An Sok bursts with anger, but Prosecutor slams his hand on the table and he tells Sung Woo that he agrees with his plan. During nighttime, some lizard men try to attack a player, but An Sok Woo bashes all of them with his fists. More monsters approach him, but he is not faltered. They start rushing toward him, but someone throws fireballs at them, which leads to a big explosion, and all the monsters perish with it. Gang Yun Lee comes from behind and he tells him to be careful because these lizard men are not their average monsters. But An Sok is confident enough to beat them up and finish the boss raid. Gang Yun Lee informs him that they also need to stop the fallen ones because they are the ones who will plant the seed of the world tree here. That is why they need to secure Yoido Island so they can prevent that bad ending. An Sok is sure that Prosecutor can take care of those fallen ones along with the boss. They spot a helicopter heading toward the Yoido Park and they think they are covering Prosecutor through that helicopter. But Gang Yun Lee informs him that Necromancer is heading toward the boss room, which is in Yoido Park. Myung Soo Yang, who is a level 11 armored archer, is following Sung Woo in this raid. He is a certified bootlicker and he is even proud about it. He thinks Sung Woo is going to lose in this raid because the other 11 teams support the Prosecutor. All Myung Soo had to do was to wait for an opportunity and trip up Sung Woo. But all of his plans failed after he watched Sung Woo and his teammates in action. Ji Si Yun is blasting off enemies with her ignition sword, while Han Ho of the North Star is pummeling enemies with his indestructible defense. Most of all, Sung Woo achieved a new synergy after he equipped 30 plus minions with armor. This synergy creates a protective armor around his minions. Myung Soo remembers that the Crusaders have a similar synergy which he just created by himself. Sung Woo asks Myung Soo and his fellows if they also want armor, but Myung Soo rejects him. Sung Woo equips them with armor even after they rejected his offer. 
they feel more relaxed and lighter after wearing the armor, and Songwoo's synergy effect doubles because he has more than 40 units with his armor. Myungsu is pissed at Songwoo because he is using them to boost his synergy level. Myungsu switches back to his boot licking. He informs Sung Woo that the place in front of them is Yoido Station, and just past that is a park where the boss room is. Sung Woo is concerned because the water level is rising as they are getting closer to their destination. Myung Soo tells him that many lizard men will be lying in ambush inside the water, so they should cooperate with other teams. Sung Woo ignores him, and he tells Han Ho and Ji Soo to stand back. His werebear minions throw the lizards further into the water, and Sung Woo detonates them. Sungwoo starts receiving a lot of gold for killing the lizardmen which were hidden under the water, and the archers become amazed after witnessing it. After some time, the smoke subsides, and Sungwoo tells them that their path is now clear. A helicopter arrives, and the cameraman starts filming Sungwoo's exploits. He is quite pumped about it because it will give the survivors more hope and inspiration. Even the viewers are quite positive, and they are cheering for Sungwoo. His assistant informs him that they are receiving a call from the Crusaders team. Min Hwa Song starts shouting at him and she tells him to get back or he will have to bear the consequences. Sung Woo and his friends think that the reporter helicopter is moving the other way because other teams must be rampaging through the monsters. After some time, they arrive at the boss room. Jisoo Yun thinks that this looks more like a jungle. Their surroundings start rumbling and it feels like an earthquake is happening. A strong ray of light moves up from the northern woods. They receive a notification that Raid Boss Lizardman Warlord has appeared, and damage from mostly concentrated attacks is reduced by 90%. Lizardman Warlord is looking for a worthy warrior, and the person who can beat him in a one-on-one -on -one fight will receive a special title. Soon, they see a lot of helicopters moving toward the boss. Sungwoo thinks that the prosecutor was lying in wait for them to find the boss, and he is now here to reap the rewards. Prosecutor is more competitive than he thought, and he is going directly for the boss without defeating the surrounding monsters. Hanho asks Sung Woo about their future plan, and Sung Woo tells him that they have no other choice but to fight their way through these monsters. Sung Woo's minions are clearing the way for them, but suddenly a green light starts shining from his clothes. It's the C rank card Sung Woo received from the hidden dungeon. It provides a significant experience boost when consumed, and it gives off a green light when the player has enough experience to level up with this card. Sung Woo can finally level up to 15, and he can unlock his first stage awakening after finding the Grim Reaper Scythe. Sung Woo is quite happy, and he uses the experience card, but Han Ho and Ji Soo Yoon run toward him, and they look worried. After seeing a bright flash of light, he wakes up in a realm just like Prophecy Stone, and he can see a bright light. After some time, he can see a person inside the bright light. A system notification informs him that he is the one who holds the reins of death, and he needs to find the Grim Reaper's Scythe. An objective-based exclusive quest pops up called Who is the Master of Death? Part 2. After seizing control of Grim Reaper's Scythe, he will receive First Stage Awakening. Because Sung Woo has witnessed a glimpse of future, he has an advantage, but he will still lose and become a minion of the Lich King if he cannot become stronger. The system message further points out that the Grim Reaper's Scythe can be found in death, and the choices he makes during this quest will affect his destiny. Sung Woo notices that the being made of light wants to convey a message, but Sung Woo cannot understand its words. This being is of unknown origin, but he is giving him a feeling of calmness and he seems familiar. A new system message pops up and informs him that he will be a direct witness to death. The bright light disappears as Sung Woo tries to get a hold of it, and he wakes up in the real world with Han Ho and Ji Soo Yun. Han Ho tells him that he just disappeared for about 10 seconds. This confirms that it was not a vision, but Sung Woo was physically transported somewhere, and he really received a quest from the mysterious being. Sung Woo is soon going to witness a death, but he is hoping to not witness the death of one of his friends for this quest. Soon, they hear a big explosion in the direction of the boss monster. Sung Woo informs his teammates that they are going after the boss. Sung Woo tells Myung Soo to retreat and regroup with the rest of his friends. With that said, Sung Woo and his teammates start rushing toward the boss. It turns out the helicopter of Crusaders crashed after getting hit by a spear. Prosecutor comes out of his helicopter and he tells his teammates to get back into formation. Prosecutor used blind faith zone skill while they were crashing, which saved their lives, only the pilot died in the process. They get ready as more lizardmen start heading toward them. The other helicopter is still streaming their fight. There are about 17,000 people watching them. 
Crusaders are easily marching through the Lizardmen groups. Prosecutor uses his cross spear skill to get rid of hordes of Lizardmen in one attack. He tells his companions to brace themselves for the second wave of monsters attack. Finally, the boss monster Lizardman Warlord makes his appearance. Prosecutor orders his crossbowmen to fire at the boss. Most of the arrows get deflected after hitting the boss and he receives no damage because more than one person is attacking him. Boss performs a slash attack and two crusaders get cut in half. Third crusader calls for help as he is about to be cut in half but someone throws an attack at him which he manages to easily dodge. Prosecutor comes forward and he tells the Crusaders to get back and take care of the lesser Lizardmen. Prosecutor challenges the boss to a one-on-one -on -one duel. Lizardman Warlord plunges at the Prosecutor and he blocks his attack with his sword. Prosecutor thinks that they are evenly matched in terms of strength, but the Warlord has a massive weapon which gives him an advantage. Prosecutor has more speed and reflexes which can give him an upper hand. The boss plunges at the prosecutor but he is sure he can win against this boss in a one-on-one -on -one battle. They both keep exchanging blows left and right while the helicopter crew is still recording their fight. Gang Yun Lee and An Seok Gu arrive there as well. Prosecutor sees some skeletons in the distance so he thinks maybe Sung Woo has arrived there. Prosecutor hits the boss with a cross spear skill. Boss gets pushed back but prosecutor realizes that something is wrong. The boss is giving off an evil smile while he is losing badly. Prosecutor becomes more angry and he's determined to wipe the floor with this Lizardman Warlord's head. Lizardman Warlord performs a fire breath attack but Prosecutor blocks it with his force field skill. His crusaders try to give him backup but he orders them to stand back. Prosecutor thinks it's becoming more dangerous because this boss is just playing around with him. Boss monster starts shedding its skin and the true boss monster wandering Drake appears out of it. A new notification pops up which informs them that phase 2 of the boss monster is beginning. The boss monster is more powerful than what they initially thought and he was hiding his true identity all this time. Wandering Drake attacks the prosecutor and he can feel like his bone shattering just by blocking that single attack. Wandering Drake attacks the prosecutor with his sword which is attached to its tail. Prosecutor gets directly hit by it and he receives massive amount of damage. The spectators become shocked after witnessing it. Min Hua Song starts crying as she knows Prosecutor is going to die and the raid will be a flop as well. Wandering Drake comes near the Prosecutor. As he is about to eat him, a lizard man corpse comes flying toward him and it blows up right in front of him. Sung Woo's minions jump from above and they smash his head with their bone weapons. Werebears take a hold of his body and they start smashing him with their fists. Wandering Drake gives off a huge roar as he gets up but Sung Woo stabs him in the head with the masterless sword. The people from his town are watching the stream as well and they start cheering for him. Min Ha Song do not care anymore about the rewards anymore as she wants this monster dead so they can save the prosecutor. Wandering Drake's head starts bleeding with Sung Woo's stab attack. Sung Woo jumps off from his head, leaving the masterless sword stuck in its head. Sung Woo equips his rare tiger with a bone hammer. Kang Yun Lee and An Seok Gu become happy as they predict Sung Woo is going to use that hammer to nail down the sword in Drake's head. A player informs Min Hwa Song that a massive number of monsters is approaching them from Set Gang. Min Hwa Song remembers that the one on one fight rule is only for players while the boss can take advantage from his minions. She orders all of their guild members to protect Song Wu at any cost. Where Tiger hammers down the head of the boss and it falls to the ground. The spectators start thinking that the boss is finally dead but Song Wu realizes that it is still moving. Some wines start coming out of the boss which indicates that it is morphing to its third phase. Finally, the boss completes its final form and a new system message pops up. It informs them that this is the hidden raid boss monster called Young Host of the Seed. Even though Sung Woo has completed the main boss raid but no one can enter or leave Yoido Island until this monster is defeated. Sung Woo is quite pissed because the system keeps on changing things like it's playing with them. More swarms of lizard men start approaching them. These lizard men have gone berserk and they are charging at them like crazy. But Sung Woo is not worried about them because he thinks Han Ho and Ji Se Yun can take care of them. His main problem lies with this new host of the seed. 
The boss uses a powerful fire attack, but Sung Woo somehow blocks it but the Crusaders and the Lizard Man behind him get burned to a crisp. Sung Woo uses Corpse Explosion on him but it has no effect on the boss. Werebears are trying to block the fire breath attack but they are slowly dying out. Sung Woo revives the dead Lizard Men which start attacking the boss and Sung Woo tells his party members that they need to retreat and spread out for now because the Lizard Men attack people in groups. On his way, he tells the others to run away and spread out as well because the raid just failed. On his way, Hanho notices the unconscious prosecutor. He tries to help the prosecutor but the boss appears right behind him. Boss is about to gulp them both in one bite but Righty slashes the boss with his sword. The boss tries to attack Righty but he manages to parry the boss's attack. Righty attacks its head again which deals a little bit of damage to the boss. Sung Woo appears out of the shadows and he jabs a spear in the eye of the boss. When the boss gets mad, he uses his tail attack which causes one of Sung Woo's arms to be chopped off. It was a shadow clone of Sung Woo in the first place and it dissipates into thin air. Sung Woo appears behind Han Ho and he tells him to run away from the boss. Sung Woo made that clone with his Shadow King's ring but it can only deal 50% damage. The boss becomes enraged and it starts chasing Han Ho and Sung Woo. Sung Woo is worried because maybe they provoke the boss too much. Ji Soo Yun does a powerful surprise attack on the boss. Sung Woo is now more concerned as he instructed them to run away before but Ji Soo Yun tells him that they will face the boss monster together. Sung Woo and Han Ho think that maybe she is right and they can defeat it together. Sung Woo activates death response and the zombies start appearing out of the ground. The boss lashes the zombies with ease and Sung Woo detonates the bodies. More minions start attacking the boss but deep down Sung Woo knows that this boss is a tough nut to crack. Sung Woo can't blow it from inside because the boss is not eating any of his minions. Sung Woo is resurrecting the lizard men which Han Ho and Ji Soo are slaying but they are getting destroyed way more faster. The boss prepares for another fire breath attack but this time Han Ho and Ji Soo are right behind Sung Woo. The boss uses his fire breath attack and Sung Woo tries to block it with his bone shield. Sung Woo makes it through the fire breath attack but he lost most of his minions. Boss rushes toward him for another attack but Sung Woo is feeling tired right now. Boss goes for another tail swing attack and this time Han Ho blocks his attack but the attack was too strong and it destroys his holy force field. Boss goes for another attack but Righty tries to block it and his sword breaks down so he grabs the sword of the boss. Righty slices off the boss's tail with his new weapon. The boss tries to retaliate and Righty pushes Han Ho back. Righty gives them his last farewell and the boss smashes Righty to pieces. Han Ho becomes enraged and he starts rushing toward the boss. Where Tiger grabs both Han Ho and Ji Soo Yun. Sung Woo pats Han Ho and tells him to survive at any cost. The Were Tiger starts running away from the battlefield. Sung Woo recovered enough just to move after Righty's last attack. He is quite sad about Righty's sacrifice. Sung Woo summons a bone shield and a bone sword because he needs to hold back the boss for as much time as possible. Both the boss and Sung Woo start going head to head in a one on one battle. Min Hwa Song and her crew also become afraid because Sung Woo was the last ray of hope for humanity. Boss smashes the legs of Sung Woo with his tail attack. He starts preparing for another fire breath attack. Sung Woo tries his best but now he thinks he is going to get burned to death just like his parents. But he is satisfied because his attempt was not a complete failure and he managed to save his friends. The boss performs the fire breath attack and Sung Woo gets caught up in it. Han Ho and Ji Soo Yun are sad as they are carried away by Sung Woo's minions along with the prosecutor. Sung Woo again appears inside this mysterious space. He thinks he has been quite lucky until now but his luck just ran out. Sung Woo is still worried about his friend's safety. The Grim Reaper appears in front of him. Sung Woo asks him if he is here to take him to heaven or the hell. He further tells him that he is tired and he wants to end it as soon as possible. Grim Reaper makes fun of him by saying that he got tired even though he has not even reached 30 years yet. The Grim Reaper reveals his face and it turns out to be Sung Woo's father. Sung Woo asks him if he's his real father or the system is playing with him. His father tells him that it is not important whether he's real or not. Sung Woo agrees with him because he's dead either way. Sung Woo asks his father if he resents him because he ran away when the house was burning. He tells his father that he ran away because he was scared at that time and he's even scared right now. After his parents death, Sung Woo struggled a lot to survive. 
He tried to help as many people as he could as he matured, but he failed in the end. And now he is meeting his father like this. His father starts laughing and tells him that he was worried about a useless thing all this time. His father starts making fun of him and Sung Woo thinks that he is his real father. His father tells him that he didn't run away as a child and he asks him to remember the day their house was burned. Suddenly a fire started in their home and they were both together at that time. Sung Woo's mom was still stuck inside the room so his father asked him to go out and never come back inside. Sung Woo was wrong and he thought that he abandoned his parents that night who were calling for his help, but that was not the case, and they can never put their beloved son in any kind of danger. He tells Sung Woo that he has still not failed, and he can return back to his world after going through a light. Sung Woo tells him that he is glad to meet him after such a long time. His father stops him because he almost forgot something really important. He received a scythe from his father. It is a reward for completing Who is the Master of Death quest. He also got First Awakening and a personal skill. His fate has been slightly changed as well. In the real world, the boss is still going on a rampage. Ji Su Yun and Han Ho still can't believe that Sung Woo is dead. Prosecutor wakes up from his slumber and he is quite sad because all of this happened due to his recklessness. He turned away from the strongest player in this raid and he planned everything without him. Prosecutor needs to make this right or the whole world will be destroyed by the world tree. Min Hum Song comes up to him but the prosecutor thinks that he was saved by Han Ho because Min Hum Song abandoned him in the first place. They start retreating from the battlefield and prosecutor promises the dead Song Woo that he will protect Han Ho and Ji Su Yun from now on. As they are retreating, the whole sky starts becoming darker and they get a message that a weakened spirit has been activated within their area. Min Hua Song is spectating the boss from the air and they see a green light inside the black fog. It turns out the green light is emitting from Sung Woo and he's showing lich like features. Min Hua and her crewmates think that Sung Woo has been turned into a lich monster after dying. Sung Woo receives a notification that he has been revived with the unique characteristics of a necromancer and he is on standby for just 31 days. After unlocking the first awakening, Sung Woo can summon the Grim Reaper and he can raise monsters with large builds into his horde. He received a secret store coupon as well for being the ninth player to reach the first awakening. He can summon the Grim Reaper once per day for an hour and turn into a lich. His exclusive skill Grim Reaper Realm allows him to increase his minions by 50 and all of his stats will increase by 10. He can also resurrect and regenerate the undeads as many times as he wants. Sung Woo is now ready to face the Drake boss head on. He tells the Drake that there is going to be no playing around anymore. Sung Woo tells the Drake to get ready for his second phase as he resurrects all the dead skeleton minions along with Raidi. Both Han Ho and Ji Su Yun starts rushing toward the boss because they just witnessed Weakened Spirit, which is one of Sung Woo's skills. Ji Su Yun is quite happy after watching Sung Woo and Han Ho starts crying. But after watching Sung Woo's face, they think he has been turned into a monster. Ji Su Yun tells Han Ho that he is not a monster and he just received his Grim Reaper Scythe after his first awakening. Wandering Drake plunges toward his minions and he destroys most of Sung Woo's minions in one attack. But all of them get resurrected again due to his new skill. Min Hua Song and her crew become quite pumped after watching Song Wu's minions getting resurrected again and again. Wandering Drake does another massive fire breath attack and Song Wu blocks it with a big shield this time. The fire is about to reach the prosecutor and Song Wu's companions, but Raidi disperses the fire into thin air with his spin attack. Han Ho becomes overjoyed and he hugs Raidi. Sung Woo asks the Drake to attack him again, but it seems like he is already out of stamina. Sung Woo is still in perfect condition because he has infinite level of mana. Sung Woo resurrects more minions and they start rushing toward the boss. All of them start mashing and overwhelming the boss with their numbers. Sung Woo uses his weapon create skill to create bone chains to bind down the Drake. He instructs his minions to peel off the skin of the boss. After some time, they manage to peel off the outer skin of the boss. The boss is looking almost exhausted and Sung Woo tells Raidi that it is time to finish off the Drake. Raidi finishes the Wandering Drake with a powerful slash attack and this time, the Drake dies for real. The Masterless Sword has now 4,335 days until it can hatch the egg. 
Songwu has earned 1,115,556 gold for successfully defeating the raid boss of Lizardman Swamp Region. He also received an exclusive title called Amateur Dragon Hunter, which increased his stamina by 2 and his fire resistance by 30%. Back in town, everyone is celebrating Sungwoo's amazing victory. Sungwoo is about to try something crazy. He tries to resurrect the wandering Drake, and it becomes one of his minions in his first try. The prosecutor and his men know well that the power gap between them has just shooted up by a lot. One of Sungwoo's minions finds Drake Leather, which is a heroic item. Meanwhile, Raidi got a legendary rank material called Dragon Heart. And this Dragon Heart is a material which should be used precisely. Finally, he got the Seed of the World Tree, which is a godly rank item with unknown effects. Seed of the World Tree is a powerful item which is connected to the ending they saw in the Prophecy Stone. It can also be targeted by the mysterious Fallen Ones. The photographer comes up to him and asks him to say a few words of encouragement to others. Sungwoo tells him to not trust a group which promises to protect them. Up until now, all groups which welcomed the survivors ended up being useless. Sungwoo thinks that the system must have a big part in it too. He advises all of the viewers to get stronger on their own or they will not survive in this new world. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking and they see a big explosion in the direction of Yongdong Po Station. Minhua Song informs the prosecutor that someone is attacking their base. Prosecutor informs everyone to retreat to Yongdong Po Station. Sungwoo notices that the black smoke coming out of the explosion looks like Breath of the Abyss, and he thinks it's done by the wandering peddlers because they were the ones going around selling it as a product. Prosecutor gets down on his knees and he begs Sungwoo to help them because the station is filled with non combatants and he can't do much in his current state. Sungwoo tells him that there are many things he can complain about, but it is not the right time, so he will help them. The helicopters start landing on the outskirts because they can't fly through the smoke. One of the survivors informs Min Hwa Song that they were attacked by the Beastmen. The survivor also saw them communicating with each other like their consciousness has returned. Now, Sungwoo knows for sure that it is done by the group which consists of the Beastmen and the Mad Scientists. Sungwoo tells them that he is going to deal with the mess inside. If what the werewolf told them before dying is true, then this anti-human group is going to be a big threat to the humans in the future. Songwoo thinks that they are quite crafty because they attacked the Yongdo Po Station when the main forces of Liberation Guild were away on the raid. Songwoo summons the Drake out of the abyss so he can make his debut. The whole station is covered with smoke from Breath of the Abyss. Two beastmen are talking about how easily they pulled it off because their main forces were away on a raid. The werewolf mocks the humans for ignoring the threat of beastmen with intelligence. The hog beastman asks the other about how much time the ceremony is going to take. Werewolf tells him that only those werebeasts who got lucky and ate the brains of mages know about it. The hog is sad because he ate Archer's brains and he has hooves which he cannot use for most of his skills. Werewolf tells them that he is still lucky than those scientists bastard who ask their corpses when they die to make them into some sort of medicinal drugs. While they are talking, they see some glowing eyes through the windows. Bone Drake finished them both off in just a single attack. Sungwoo comes inside the building and he returns the Drake to the abyss. Both beastmen were talking about a ritual, so that means they are gathering people somewhere inside the station without killing them. Sungwoo thinks killing off the beastmen quietly with his Shadow King's cloak will be much smoother. Somewhere in the building, a bull beastman is gathering the players in a place. They have gathered about 200 human players, but they have been ordered by the higher-ups to bring in as many human players as possible, and they think more humans are hiding on other floors. The bull heard his higher-ups mentioning something about extracting the experience points out of all these players. Soon, they hear two red warnings about weakened spirit and call of death being activated in their area. Sungwoo's minions start popping out of the abyss and killing the beastmen. Were Tiger attacks the bull, but he blocks it with ease. Bull pushes the Were Tiger back with a slam attack. Bull charges at the horde of skeletons, pummeling them on his way. Bull knows that these skeletons belong to the necromancer and he calls them out. A spear pierces the bull from the shadows. Sungwoo pierces him from behind with his nameless sword. Sungwoo receives 30,000 gold for hunting a second rank werebull. This is the first time Sungwoo is seeing an evolved beastman, and this also proves that beastmen can also evolve like humans. 
Sung Woo resurrects him and now he has a werebull under his command. Sung Woo orders his minions to move all the unconscious humans out of this gas or they will die. Sung Woo is moving out of the station with his minions but the ground starts shaking. He gets a warning message that a massive summoning magic has been activated within the area. Sung Woo has no idea what they are up to but he knows he needs to stop them as soon as possible so he starts heading toward the location of the circle. Sung Woo reaches the location and the werebeasts become alerted after watching him. One of the sources of the breath of abyss is there but Sung Woo knows there must be other sources too because this one alone is not enough to engulf the whole area. One of the werewolves recognizes Sung Woo and he tells others that they will receive a massive award if they can gift his dead body to the researchers. A day has already passed so Sung Woo summons the Grim Reaper Scythe for one hour and all of his stats become boosted after summoning it. Sung Woo gets an hour per day but 5 minutes are enough to wipe out pests like these werebeasts. Sung Woo's minions start popping out of the abyss and they start balloting it out. No matter how many minions they destroy, they get resurrected. One of the magicians activates the summoning circle. One of the Sung Woo's minions bites the werewolf magician and he throws him off the roof. The building starts crumbling due to the summoning so Sung Woo jumps off from the building. Sung Woo asks for information about the thing he just summoned. Werewolf starts laughing and he tells him that he will find out soon enough. The whole building starts shattering and they get a notification that the raid boss will soon appear in this region. The prosecutor received a lot of damage during his last fight and even a high rank healing potion is not enough to completely heal his wounds. He is pissed at himself for being too much overconfident and cocky. Soon, Hano and Ji Yun spot Song Woo's minions returning with the rescued survivors. The crusaders become overjoyed with happiness. The breath of the abyss start disappearing from their area and they get a warning message that a massive summoning magic has been activated in their area. A new raid boss, Ogre Champion, appears right above the building. The werewolf tells Sung Woo that he can't do anything against this boss because he exhausted all of his strength on the previous raid boss and they were watching all of it through the live stream. Sung Woo gives an evil smile and tells him that he should have watched the live stream till the end before making the summoning circle. Sung Woo has now one hell of a monster of his own to fight this boss monster head on. Wandering Drake lands a direct punch on the face of the ogre champion. Sung Woo's party members and the crusaders become happy after witnessing it. The prosecutor has made up his mind that he will become stronger on his own without relying on the crusaders team just like Sung Woo. Ogre champion is quite hurt after the punch attack he just received and he gives out a loud roar. Two more of Sung Woo's minions appear from behind the drake and they throw spears at the ogre champion. Ogre champion kills them both with a single clap attack and both of them cease to exist. Sung Woo realized that cease to exist must mean that they cannot be resurrected and this boss has some of his own unique characteristics. Sung Woo's drake cannot use breath of fire attack or he would have made the ogre champion into a toasted chicken by now. But Sung Woo can still control its movements which is a plus point for him. Drake gets a hold of the ogre's hair and he kicks the ogre champion with all of his might. The ogre champion gets a hold of the drake's shoulders but Righty pops up one of his eyes with a stab attack. The ogre crashes into the land and wandering Drake gets a hold of his body while Sung Woo's minions close in on him. They keep attacking him until he finally gets defeated. Sung Woo has leveled up to 16 and he earned 705,000 gold for hunting the raid boss monster Ogre Champion. Sung Woo chooses an upgrade skill card for his call of death skill which increases its rank. He can now summon 15 masterless zombies with 100 mana from the abyss and they will remain for 20 minutes and the skill cooldown has decreased to 30 minutes. Sung Woo is quite satisfied and the best reward he received from this hunt is his new Ogre Champion minion he just revived. His Ogre champion already has a heroic rank bracelet called Thunder God Blessing equipped. This bracelet consumes all mana to produce a great power but if it is equipped by someone without mana then it can be used once every 24 hours without any cost. His ogre champion has no mana so he lets him keep equipping it. Both of his boss minions are acting as friends. The werewolf is shocked after watching all of this development. Sung Woo stabs him with the scythe and tells him that joking time is over. The werewolf is about to tell him everything but something activates inside him and he dies after cuffing blood from all holes of his body. The prosecutor tells them that their leaders must have planted something in them so they cannot leak any information. Sung Woo still has another way of extracting information and he revives the werewolf. 
After reviving the werewolf, he receives a memory fragment. He gets a flashback from the memory of the werewolf. The werewolf, along with other beastmen, were on Shindorim Station, and they were heading toward Yongdopu Station. The werewolf was watching the livestream of the boss raid, but other beastmen told him to turn it off because they are almost at their destination. Sungwoo now knows that they didn't watch the whole stream or they would not have underestimated him. One of them tells them that attacking the Liberation Guild was just a matter of time, and now they have the best opportunity for it. But another werewolf thinks it's all a hoax and it is something related to the lab they build in Yoidu Island. Sung Woo thinks that they must be related to the bad ending of Yoidu Island in some way. One of them is about to say something important about the scientists, but a werebeast shouts at them to shut their mouths. Sung Woo comes back from the flashback and he now knows that part of the reason why they attacked Yongdopu Station was so they can control Yoido Island. He also found out about their trial in Shindorim Station and he just need to find out about their true objective. Shindorim is the central station where Line 1 and 2 cross from. That is one of the reasons why countless people used to pass through that place. A mad scientist is experimenting on both human and monsters in a laboratory. The psycho scientist is quite happy because he just got a lot of research material. One of his swear beast assistants tells him that they need more freezers because the smell of rotten corpses is becoming unbearable, but scientist tells him to just get used to it. The Weremouse tells him that their werebeasts have a strong sense of smell, which makes them harder to work here. Plus, this beast man wanted to be turned back into a human, and he hates rants in the first place. The scientist tells him that their main branch already started experimenting on it, and he should have volunteered for them. But the mouse is afraid to be experimented on. The scientist gives off a grim smile and tells him that mouses are the first ones to be used in any type of experiment. The mouses are treated very badly among the beastmen and the scientist tells him that they have a very short lifespan and he will have a hard time getting the developed drug. A dog wear beast rushes inside and informs them that a dragon appeared outside and it is destroying the buildings. It's an emergency situation so they start moving out. A lot of joy wear beasts start heading out and they have a synergy which gives them a stat boost if there are more than 10 drug beasts in a single group. The scientist is the one who is duping them and one dog tells him that their Yongdompu raid failed. The wandering drake appears just outside their window. Sungwoo's party rushes inside along with the wandering drake. The scientists know it's the boss monster from Yoido Island Raid and he tells others to retreat immediately. He tells the dog to hold them while they go back to the lab to pack important stuff. They get back to the lab and start packing but the mouse smells something similar. Sungwoo appears behind both of them. Sungwoo informs them that the ogre champion boss they gave him was quite good so he is here to properly compensate them. Sungwoo summons the ogre champion right there along with Raidi. Sungwoo tells him that their evil business of doing experiments on humans is about to go bankrupt. But the scientists get angry and he tells him that they are only doing this to further advance human science. Sungwoo has enough of this crap so he shoots down one of his leg. The mouse comes to help him out but the scientist stabs him with an experimental injection. The mouse starts becoming more bigger after getting the injection. Sungwoo summons a clone with his Shadow King ring and they both start shooting him down with their crossbows. The mouse slashes Sungwoo's clone with his attack and Sungwoo gets away. Ogre Champion easily crushes the weremouse with a stomp attack and Sungwoo gets 13,000 gold for hunting an evolved were rat. Sungwoo cuts off one of the arms of the scientist. His mouth starts foaming and he tells them that he already injected himself with poison. The scientist dies after coughing blood but Sungwoo can read some of his memory fragments after reviving him. Sungwoo tries to revive him but he gets a notification that he cannot resurrect a living being, which means the scientist was pretending to be dead. Sungwoo gets pissed and he crushes the eggs of the scientist. The scientist miraculously comes back to life after getting his dear balls crushed and he is in extreme pain. Scientist starts telling Sungwoo that he will work for him if he lets him live but Sungwoo has enough of this drama so he stabs him. Sungwoo then brings him back to life and he can check a memory fragment of the scientist. In the flashback, a mysterious figure tells the scientist that he will be in charge of a single department. This man is the leader of the traveling peddlers and he tells the scientist to put his efforts into creating the A-gas. The scientist becomes happy because he already has a lot of experience in creating items related to the poisonous gas. The mysterious man tells him to spread the gas over Yongdompo and leave the rest to the mages who will teleport three raid bosses they just captured. Sungwoo is a bit shocked to know that they managed to capture three raid bosses. The scientist tells him that these werebeasts smell a lot and he's not sure if they should trust them. The mysterious man tells him to watch his mouth because they cannot proceed with their plan without them. 
Furthermore, there are four beasts who are stronger than the top three ranked players, and they are going to need their help for their future plans. Songu is a bit confused about how this man is so sure that these four beastmen are stronger than the human players. Songu thinks that the beastmen came into existence much later than the human players, and there is no way they can become stronger than the ranked players in such a short span of time. But the beastmen are different. They receive their own quests and they have the scientists helping them, which can explain their fast growth rate. Sungwoo perfectly knows that special quests can help someone get stronger much faster. The mysterious man tells him that their ultimate goal is not to chase away the players and the scientists should use the humans in moderation. The scientist bursts out in happiness as he tells the mysterious man that the only reason he is going through all of this is because he believes he can become a new species transcendent. Sungwoo thinks that it must be something related to their personal quest. A white werewolf comes inside and he tells them that they started chatting without him. Sungwoo has seen this werewolf before in his last flashback. The scientist tells them that he is one of the four beasts and he is a mage. The white werewolf tells him that he is not a mage. Everyone thinks he is a mage because he carries a cane but that is not the truth. He suddenly uses a skill on the scientist. He tells the scientist not to worry and it is a kind of insurance which will alert him if the scientist is in trouble. Soon the visuals of the flashback shatter and Song Wu gets teleported into an empty space with the white wolf. The white wolf knows about him and he tells him that he was curious to know how Sung Woo knew about their Shindorian branch so fast. But now his doubts are cleared and he knows about Sung Woo's skill to track memory fragments of a dead body. Sung Woo tells him that the Shindorian branch was too empty and their main branch must be somewhere else. The white wolf advises him to leave Yongdong Po or their fight will be extended and they are gonna win at the end. Sung Woo asks about their origin and the werewolf tells him to remember the name Evolution Society. He uses a skill on Sung Woo and tells him that it is going to be the name which will soon end humanity. Sung Woo comes out of the flashback and he now knows that the white wolf had skills related to psychometry. They need to be on extra guard because the beastmen will change their future plans. And the mysterious man mentioned that they have three raid bosses. Righty hands over a map he just found to Sung Woo. It's a subway map with three highlighted places. A is for Yoido Island and it is crossed out. B is for Sosadong in Bucheon and C is Bomge in Anyang. Sung Woo already defeated the Drake before they could capture him and he also got rid of the Ogre Champion which means there is only one more boss left and there is another branch of Evolution Society in there. Back in Yongdumpo Station, everyone is busy rebuilding their station. Sung Woo asks Min Hwa Song to find out about any information related to raid bosses in Bucheon and Anyang community. He is going to discuss the rest with the prosecutor himself. Sung Woo informs him that there is going to be another attack in Yongdong Po. The attackers call themselves the Evolution Society, and their real goal isn't the Liberation Guild. Sung Woo has a suspicion that they are the corrupted ones mentioned in the Yoido Island raid. The prosecutor knows that they can be a much bigger threat to humanity. He asks for Sung Woo's help once again. He requests Sung Woo to protect Yongdong Po because he's the only person strong enough to help them. He further asks Sung Woo to defeat the Evolution Society and he will give Sung Woo 1 million plus gold for this task. Sung Woo agrees with him because he was going to get rid of the Evolution Society anyway, but now he will also get a lot of gold for this task. Sung Woo comes out after the meeting and he is happy to see the other leaders getting along with his companions. But Han Ho informs him that they are all opportunists and they are trying to impress Ji Soo Yun. Soon, Han Ho gets another alert from the community app. It turns out the rankings have changed again. The prosecutor's ranking has gone down and now Doctor is on the third place and he is on level 15. Sung Woo thinks that maybe Doctor is the same mysterious man he just saw in the flashback. A player gets his first awakening when he reaches level 15. Sung Woo is not sure if the first awakening is only exclusive for 5 star class, but he knows for sure that Doctor has gone through his first awakening. Sung Woo needs to do something before he can get more stronger. Min Hyun Sung gets knocked out after opening the lid of a suspicious jar that Sung Woo's minions were carrying. Han Ho gives him a potion to heal him up. These jars contain purified breath of the abyss and they were crafted by the scientist. Once someone opens it, breath of the abyss will be released from it. Sung Woo tells Min Hyun Sung that these are his spoils of war and he advises Min Hyun to not touch them again. The Liberation Guild has assigned Min Hyun Sung as an assistant for Sung Woo. Sung Woo and his party members are sure that he was demoted. That's why they assigned him to Sung Woo. Min Hyun tells them to head inside a building where the Liberation Guild is gathering the information that Sung Woo requested. 
On their way, Han Ho informed Song Wu that when he died, Ji Si Yun became very sad and she started crying like a child. Ji Si Yun hates Han Ho because later he kept teasing her about it. On the other side, the prosecutor is still thinking about how he messed up during the boss raid. The public opinion about him has gone down the drain and everyone is blaming him for their loss. Most of the powerful players are now part of Sung Woo and Riley's fan clubs. The prosecutor has a promotion type exclusive quest. He needs to train 30 crusaders up to level 10. As a reward, he will receive his first awakening and he needed to complete this quest before the world tree could mature. Through some investigation, the prosecutor learned that awakening quests are only given to players with 4 or 5 stars. That is why he needs to complete it as soon as possible or other 5 star players will take over him. Six of his crusaders died during their last raid and he has only 14 crusaders left. He is not sure how he can train 16 more crusaders up to level 10. It is a difficult task but Sung Woo already achieved his first awakening and the prosecutor cannot give up now. The prosecutor summoned all of his guild members outside his office. Prosecutor tells Min Ha Song to assign members for a hunting team and they will start hunting the next day. Min Ha Song and the other crusaders advise against it because they need time and people to restore their station to its former state. Prosecutor reminds her that other players will get stronger in that time and they will suffer more with the next attack. Song Woo will take care of the evolution society for them which is their biggest threat but they need to become self-dependent in the future because they have the strongest guild of Korea. Meanwhile on the other side, Min Am Song introduces them to the guy who was gathering information on Seo Sa Dong and Bom Gye Station. He informs them that an ogre champion boss raid was in Seo Sa Dong but once the second chapter started, the ogre champion was missing and no information is coming out of Bom Gye Station. Song Woo guesses that it is now full of black fog and zombies and the information gatherer asks him how he knows about it. He shows him Han Ho who is the biggest cell phone addict in the world gathering information. Han Ho informs Song Woo that their town is safe and he already contacted Tae Song and told him to stay in the safe zone and never come out. According to a post about Bom Gye Station, it advises player to not approach it because it's filled with toxic gas and zombies. He thinks that Evolution Society has another lab in there and that Black Fog is Breath of the Abyss. Song Woo asks Min Hum Song to lend him a chopper. Some players are running away from zombies in Bom Gye Station. They are almost at their shelter and their friends start covering them. They need to stop them at any cost because they are the last line of defense between the zombies and the shelter. Zombies start getting pierced by arrows and crushed by rocks. The survivors are almost at the last barricade but the zombies are advancing toward them in full speed. All the players on the barricade are quite afraid so the survivors think of acting as a sacrifice to divert the attention of the zombie horde. They will both divert their attention by going in two different paths. The survivors throw their supplies toward the girl on the barricade and ask her to take care of their families. They are about to be overwhelmed by the zombies but someone starts jumping above the zombies. It turns out to be Ji Su Yun who takes care of some of them with a single ignition attack. Sung Woo arrives there with his ogre champion and he punches the zombies out of existence while Ji Su Yun dodges the attack. Some of the players notice that these skeletons belong to the second rank necromancer and they become happy. Back in time, the players are waiting for Sung Woo to arrive. Han Ho arrives there but his parents are more concerned about Sung Woo and Ji Su Yun. He tells them that Sung Woo sent him back to protect the town because powerful enemies are going to target them but everyone thinks he has been demoted. Plus he came here with a lot of gold to keep the safety zone running. He tells them that he knows they think he was left out by Sung Woo but he is about to show them something dear to Sung Woo. He brings out a kidnapped Ridey out of the bag. They think that Ridey will be quite useful but as soon as he is released, he starts disappearing. Outside a door, some kids are saying that the necromancer who is the symbol of justice and truth is inside the room. Ji Si Yun has some blood on her face so Sung Woo tells her to clean it. They have been both through life and death situation but there has never been anything to talk about between them. Sung Woo asks her if her home is in Jeju Island and she replies with a yes. Sung Woo asks her when she is planning to go back to Jeju Island but she thinks nothing will change even if she goes back. She tells him that her family members are all terrible people so she wants to stay away from them. She finally managed to get away from them but the world changed like this. The leader of the survivors comes in and he introduces himself as An Min Sok. Sung Woo introduces himself but Min Sok already knows about both of them. He tells Ji Su Yun that kids in the shelter call her Red Demon Nim. Min Sok apologizes on behalf of the kids. They all watch their Yoido Island boss raid and they are like heroes for their children. Min Sok thanks them for the help but he requests them to leave. 
Both Ji Su-yun and Sung Woo become shocked after hearing it. He tells them that the zombies started to gather there four days ago, and they are at their limit. Ji Su-yun asks him why they are not leaving that area or asking for help from others. He informs them that everyone in their area got a regional quest. If they leave the building, they will be chased by a horde of zombies, and half of their population consists of children and elderly. There were some outsiders who tried to help them, but they become discouraged after hearing about their situation. Min Sok asks them to leave before midnight or they will be tangled up in their quest. Sung Woo can tell at one glance that deep inside, Min Sok wants them to be saved. Sung Woo tells him that he will still save them. Min Sok and his wife thank him for this favor. Min Sok asks them if they need a single room for the night, and Jisoo bursts with anger. They ask Min Sok to give them separate rooms. The children knock at the door and they ask if they can come inside. Ji Seon lets them come in and a little girl tells Ji Seon that she is a red demon and she looks cool. A kid asks Sung Woo to show his skeletons and he summons Riety for them. The kids start pestering Riety and Sung Woo leaves them to them for the torment and suffering. During nighttime, Sung Woo is wondering that the kids were too much lively. Suddenly, a regional quest called The City Where Death Has Arrived pops up. They can either escape or subjugate the zombies. The reward will depend upon the goal they achieve. Zombies will chase survivors outdoors, and once noticed, they will even chase them indoors. He gets another warning message that the difficulty of the quest is going to be adjusted because there is a player with higher level than 15 in this region. Jisun bursts in his room and she informs him that the atmosphere of the town is becoming ominous. She can also feel vibration of a lot of steps outside their building. A notification pops up that the zombies will now chase the survivors inside and the kids become afraid after hearing it. Min Sook comes up to Sung Woo and he informs him that normally zombies don't chase them indoors, but the difficulty has changed. Sung Woo tells them that he knows the difficulty has increased and he thinks the system is toying with them, but they are gonna survive through this. Min Sook tells the other players to send the non-combatants to the rooftop because they can take care of zombies, but if goals arrive, they will not be able to hold them back. Ghouls are known to be the cannibalistic monsters which have a bit higher rank than the normal undead creatures. Min Sok kids come up to him and they think they are going to die this time. Min Sok assures them that nothing like that is going to happen because the necromancer is with them. Both of them wish them best of luck as they head toward the rooftop. One of the players spot the zombies on their doorstep. They all start stacking the main entrance with as many barricades as they can. There are a lot of zombies outside and Sungwoo can't even summon his bigger boss skeletons in that narrow space. Sungwoo tells everyone to leave that place and they become shocked. He further elaborates that nothing good will happen by fighting in such a small space and they will become exhausted after fighting for a long time in this narrow passage. Sungwoo can't use corpse explosion on those zombies or their path would have been cleared with ease. Sungwoo summons his werebeast minions and equips them all with a bone shield to achieve a powerful shield synergy. The skeletons manage to easily hold the wave of zombies with their shields. Min Sok uses pressure of valor to bash a zombie. He cuts through some other zombies with his tornado blade skill. Sungwoo thinks that Min Sok fights well and he must be a 3 or 4 class knight. Sungwoo tells his shield minions to retreat. Sungwoo tries to detonate the dead zombies and he succeeds in causing a big explosion. Sungwoo thinks that he must be careful from now on because the whole building can not blow up and there are kids in there too. More zombies start gathering right outside the building. Sungwoo heads outside the building and he summons the Drake along with Raidi which activates weakened spirit in their area. They both start clearing the front area of the building. Sungwoo tells Min Sok to evacuate the people from the rooftops, and Min Sok informs them that they have two buses prepared in the underground parking lot. One of Sungwoo's minions gets destroyed by the zombies. Sungwoo is saving Call of Death and Grim Reaper's scythe for later, but if this fight drags on, it will be disastrous for them. Sungwoo tells Ji Seun that it's her turn now. Ji Seun equips a purification mask created by Lt. Kim and it is coated with a potion. She immediately starts cutting the zombies with ease. The buses arrive there and they start boarding the survivors inside them. Soon, they get a notification that the ghouls have started moving after smelling the scent of the living. Min Sok informs Sung Woo that ghouls are leagues above the zombies. They are fast and they mostly focus on the children. One time, they even broke the window of his car and they took his youngest son with them. Sung Woo tells him to rest assured and he will not let them get the children. 
After some time, they start moving with buses at the center. The undead will not stop chasing them, so they are moving toward Bomgia Station to clear this quest. Some players feel that it is too quiet around them. Soon they arrive at another refugee camp which was fine until the last day, but now there are only dead bodies laying around them. Jisoo-yeon senses something sticking close to their vicinity. One of the player's head gets chopped off and all of them become alerted. Jisoo-yeon spots a ghoul which is moving toward the bus filled with children. She cuts it in half with her sword. Ghouls are faster than what song woo predicted and only Jisoo-yeon could match up to their speed. Soon they spot more ghouls leading hordes of zombies. The players become afraid after watching them. min -suk asks sung -woo if the players retain their consciousness after becoming a skeleton and sung -woo becomes a bit shocked after hearing this question. Sung Woo can clearly understand what Min Sok is trying to say, but he informs him that as long as he is here, they don't need to go that far. Min Sok asks for a last favor from Sung Woo and he tells him to take care of the children after his death. Even the wandering Drake can't hit the ghouls because they are too fast for him. Min Sok orders his player to shoot crossbows and fireballs at the ghouls, but they easily manage to dodge all of their attacks mid air. One of the ghouls reaches the top of the bus, but he gets pushed back by one of Sung Woo's minions. Ghoul tears the minion into two with his bare hands. Min Sok gets rid of the ghoul by using a holy skill on him. A ghoul appears behind him and tries to do a sneak attack on him. Min Sok manages to block the attack of the ghoul with his shield. He cuts some of them with all of his might. Sung Woo revives the ghouls with his ability and he tells them to calm down because he will take care of everything from now on. Sung Woo has summoned the Grim Reaper Scythe and he can revive the dead minions as many times as he wants until one hour. He was saving it for later, but the situation is looking grim right now. A notification pops up which informs Sung Woo that these ghouls were under the control of another master, but after getting revived by him, their link to their previous master has been severed. His ghoul minions keep killing the ghouls and he keeps adding them to his collection. Min Suk is also motivated and he is cutting through the ghouls. Sung Woo thinks if they disregard each player's skills, then Min Suk is on par with the prosecutor. Only Jisoo, Sung Woo and Min Suk are the ones who can fight against the ghouls and other low rank players are still getting killed by them. The Drake and the Ogre Champion are taking care of the zombie hordes and they are not even fast enough to fight against the ghouls. These players are determined to fight till their deaths because the lives of their family members are on stake. sung -woo needs to get more stronger because this game is evolving with each day. A ghoul makes it up to the gates of a bus and a werewolf minion tries to stop him, but he easily gets pushed back. An old man tries to stop him, but he also gets killed by the ghoul. min -suk tried to use his ranged skill, but it is still on cooldown, so he plunges toward the ghoul with his sword, but both of them get thrown down the bridge. Sung Woo rushes down to save him, but his situation is not looking well. Sung Woo tells him that he will go and grab a potion for him. Min Suk stops him as he knows a mere potion is not enough to save him. Min Suk tells Sung Woo with his last breath to use his body to protect the children. Sung Woo receives a personal quest as certain conditions have been met. He can save or neglect the dead by making the knight into a skeleton. After he can assure the safety of the family of Knight, he will receive his ever strong loyalty and this choice will affect his destiny. Sung Woo is pissed at the system because it is almost a similar quest to the one he received after the death of the professor in the college campus. Sung Woo has no other choice but to revive Min Suk. After death, Min Suk's consciousness appears in an empty space and he thinks he is in the afterlife. A Grim Reaper appears which informs him that that is not the case. Even if it is not the afterlife, he is still dead and he can't see his family ever again. Something starts happening to his body and the Grim Reaper informs him that the Necromancer is turning him into an undead. The Grim Reaper tells him to leave everything to Sung Woo and he has nothing more to be worried about as his memories will be wiped out. Min Sok starts crying and he requests the Grim Reaper to not take away his memories. The Reaper tells him to leave those lingering feelings behind because someone stronger than him will protect his family. Min Suk tells him that he is the head of the family and it is his responsibility to protect them. On the outside world, Sung Woo gets a system message that he has established a contract with a death knight. The memories of the knight will be maintained and he can be taken into Sung Woo horde once certain conditions are met. Min Suk talks to Sung Woo which proves that he has maintained his will. Min Suk is the most unique undead Sung Woo has seen up until this point. They both head back up to finish off the ghouls. 
Some ghouls try to jump at Jisoo together. She cuts through them like butter with her ignition sword. A player thanks her for the help, but he informs her that the path near the bus is getting overwhelmed by the ghouls. She tries to save other players who are about to be overwhelmed by the ghouls, but they tell her to leave them and save the people on the bus. Another ghoul makes it into the bus, but he gets chopped into two with a single slash. Death Knight was the one who chopped the ghoul. More ghouls start surrounding him. Death Knight is one of the top ranked undead and he can feel the feelings of fear, discomfort, and jealousy toward him. sung had already equipped him with the Masterless Sword. He starts rampaging through the ghouls with ease and the time limit for egg hatching also gets lesser and lesser as he cuts through the monsters. The players think of him as a new powerful skeleton and the ghouls start retreating for some reason. Death Knight uses a skill to bind the ghouls. After that, he cuts them with ease. sung is a bit relieved as he thinks giving him the Masterless Sword was the best decision. sung looks through the Death Knight stats. He is a level 12 undead knight with both undead and a knight attributes. He has two skills. One is called Chains of the Abyss and the other one is Exploit Life Energy. Ji Si Yun comes up to Sung Woo and informs him that they have taken care of the ghouls. Ji Si Yun inquires about the new Death Knight, and Sung Woo tells her that he will explain it to her later. They want to take a break, but they cannot stop until they reach Bomgya Station. Plus, it is now their turn to attack the people who are pulling strings behind the scenes. After some time, they arrive at the Bomgya Station, and the mist is becoming more thicker around them. Sung Woo asks Min Sok if he's not going to tell his family about him. Min Sok tells him that he's not brave enough to face them right now, and they need to take care of something first. Ji Si Yun starts coughing as the mask has become useless. The more closer humans get to the fog, the more weaker they become. But these rules don't apply to Sung Woo, and he heads inside the station with his minions. There are no guards outside, so Sung Woo thinks maybe they are confident enough that the gas will stop any kind of intruder. But he is still curious to know how they are able to confine the raid boss. Sung Woo is not going to head inside right now. He will wait until midnight so the cooldown on Grim Reaper Scythe can end. After a day, sung starts heading inside the station with his minions. They come to a stop when they see the entrance covered with sheets. There is a note written by the government hanging there which says that it is a containment testing facility and unauthorized personnel are restricted from entering it. sung and the Death Knight start speculating that the members of the Evolution Society can be government officials. They ignore the warning and head inside the room. After entering the room, they get a notification that the raid boss monster Ghoul King has appeared. They are both shocked because Ghoul King's arms and legs are already severed. An abyssal rift is opened in that area where zombies are pouring out non-stop. Soon, someone comes from behind Song Wu. One of the scientists tells them that they spread the gas since the quest got updated, but they were not thinking of a test subject walking inside on his own. Doctor tells Sung Woo that he is not interested in fighting him and he can offer him a deal. The doctor tells Sung Woo that he picked a class connected to death and he is currently studying death. More specifically, he is studying the energy of the abyss which opposes all life forms. Doctor and his colleagues think that this situation is a test for human evolution. They need to win and pass this test. The method they are going to use to achieve it is by throwing away their existing shell and transcending beyond it. They got a lot of information on this topic by capturing Ghoul King and now a necromancer related to death has appeared in front of them. The doctor tells Sung Woo that their meeting might look like a coincidence, but it was already set up by this artificial system through quests. The doctor tells him that it is all for a happy ending for this game. Sung Woo thinks that maybe doctor also came into contact with the prophecy stone. That's why he is talking about an ending. Doctor tells Sung Woo to join them for a greater cause. Sung Woo says that bastards like them spreading poisonous gas around and conducting human experiments can never work for a greater cause. All other groups he met in the past had some similar but delusional aims like them. Doctor tells him that if the world was normal, he would have taken more time to convince him with academic persuasions. Doctor calls out Song Guk as further talking with Sung Woo is impossible. Song Guk reveals himself and tells them that the restrictions on the Gold King will be released for a moment. Sung Woo orders his minions to attack them before they can do anything. Song Guk uses a divine power called Pose Along with others on Song Woo's minions. After getting affected by the divine skill, the power of Song Woo's minions has decreased by 60%. Song Woo realizes that it is the same type of skill that Han Ho has and they are all priests. Song Woo uses his repeating crossbow to deal with them, but all of his arrows stop after getting in contact with an electric energy. 
The female player was using this skill and she returns the arrows to Sung Woo. Sung Woo blocks the arrows with a bone shield and he thinks she has psychic powers. Death Knight is almost closer to Sung Gook and his fellow players, but he gets thrown away with a skill called Holy Pressure and his shield breaks away right there. Death Knight crashes into a room and Sung Woo is worried about his safety. The female player tells Sung Gook and his fellow players to be careful because her precious experimental tanks are in the room where they just threw the Death Knight. Min Sok wakes up and he starts observing the experimental tanks in that room. He becomes really angry after watching a child shoe in a tank. They are about to do another pose in order to defeat Sung Woo, but one of the player gets his neck chained. The chained player gets dragged into the room with Death Knight. Death Knight kills him with a unique skill called Exploit Life, and the power of Sung Woo's undead minions increases by 10%. Death Knight has become enraged after watching the experimental tanks, and he's determined to finish them all. Sung Gook is not phased in any way, and they use another divine skill with Pose, which is about to hit the Death Knight, but Sung Woo creates a bone shield for him. It activates a hidden synergy, which cancels out every single abnormal status, and it requires only a Death Knight and a shield made by a necromancer. Sung Gook and the players become afraid because their divine energy is not working on him. Death Knight can still feel their damage because this energy only cancels out the effects of the divine power, but it is still enough to get rid of these posers. He kills Sung Gook and his fellow players with his exploit life skill, which cancels out divine power in the area. Sung Woo's ghouls start finishing off the remaining players. Death Knight goes for the female player as she is the owner of those tanks with human experiments. She desperately attacks him with her telekinesis skills but Death Knight blocks them all. Death Knight remembers the shoe he saw in the experimental tub belonged to his missing son, Hyun Jun. He cuts her in half with a single slash attack. Sung Woo receives 12,000 gold for defeating her which confirms that she was a level 12 player. The doctor starts clapping with anger. He pulls out an item and tells them that he has no fighting skills, so he has to rely on other means. He throws his item at the ghouls and they get electrocuted. Sung Woo thinks that maybe he belongs to a production class. Some vines come out of the item and they grab both Righty and the Death Knight. This guy is full of schemes, so Sung Woo summons the Grim Reaper Scythe to kill him as soon as possible. The doctor uses another item to retreat. This item was a flash grenade with magic mist. The doctor is using this chance to get away from the battle, but he gets stabbed by Sung Woo's Grim Reaper Scythe. It turns out in Lich Mode, one of Sung Woo's eyes becomes hollow and light has no effect on him. They were experimenting on the Ghoul King to see how it can be utilized as a weapon, but now with the Divine Power holding him back gone, the Ghoul King starts regenerating. The Doctor is still cocky as he thinks Sung Woo friends outside will be dead as well because of the monsters lurking outside. Sung Woo orders the Death Knight Min Sok to finish him off. They receive 13,000 gold for destroying a player's clone, which means the one they were fighting with was not the real guy. He was actually the 5th ranked player in the server and the 3rd ranked player with level 15 is still alive. There are 5 players in the top 20 with Doctor surname, which means they are all one person. That is why their group got so big in such a short span of time. He was using his clones in various places to pursue the same goal. Death Knight informs Sung Woo that the Ghoul King has started moving. On the outside, Ji Yun just got rid of a wave of zombies and ghouls. Both Wandering Drake and the Ogre Champion are assisting her. The players ask if their area is cleared but Ji Yun informs them that she can sense more monsters approaching them. The players are on edge because they are fighting wave after wave of these monsters. One more wave of undead monsters start approaching them. Ji Yun is determined to stop them at any cost because Sung Woo entrusted the safety of the survivors to her and he might be getting stronger but Ji Yun is following behind him without stopping. With that said, she starts rushing toward the center of the horde. The number of skeleton minions is dwindling as well because Sung Woo is not here to revive them again. But suddenly, one of the minions who just died revives. Ji Su Yun realizes that Sung Woo must have used his Lich transformation skill and she needs to use this chance to push back the undead. Ji Su Yun is cutting them left and right as she's determined to become stronger. The players start saying that the red demon Jisoo who is the lover of the necromancer is quite strong. Jisoo becomes red after hearing those gossips about her and Sung Woo. Some ghouls jump over and they start going directly for the buses. Jisoo can't give them back up as she's busy with some other ghouls. They are about to get inside one of the buses but their necks get chained with the Death Knight scale and they get cut down by him. Death Knight asks the kids if they are alright. His kids recognize him by his voice and they start crying. 
They think their dad transformed into skeleton temporarily. He tells them that Sung Woo helped him to transform for a bit. The kids start praising him and they say they want to transform into skeletons too. Sung Woo comes out and he praises Ji Yoon for her hard work. Ji Yoon tells them that they are the ones who defeated the boss monster. In the past, they were ready to defeat the Ghoul King after he recovered but he fell down on his own after cuffing a lot of blood. They thought the Ghoul King was going to die soon because they experimented on him too much. They finished him off with ease as he was unable to fight back. But Sung Woo tells Ji Yoon that it was a very difficult fight and they barely managed to defeat him. Another notification pops up which tells them that second chapter when faced with destiny has came to an end. The notification window informs them that an urgent balance patch is needed. It also commends the survivors of the Korean server for their extraordinary instincts and they cleared all this within a short time span. A list of raid boss monster kills gets published. Han Kang Sok is on first number with 4 boss kills and Sung Woo is on second with 3 boss kills. While the prosecutor is on third with 2 boss kills and their total boss kills are 15. It is a unique achievement among all the servers, considering the average level of the Korean server is only ranked 4th in the world. Therefore, a hidden chapter will be opened during the remaining time period. They need to prove their overwhelming achievements were not created by chance in the upcoming great battle. An important warning pops up which tells them that large monster armies led by warlord monsters will appear in the Korean server in various locations and this event will continue until the warlord monster is killed. Sung Woo tells his teammates that they will find out about these warlords as they work through it. The risk of the upcoming battle is going to be higher as well as the rewards for it. Sung Woo is not phased by this new challenge and he tells his party to get moving and clear the current quest as soon as possible. The next day, some goblins are ganging up on a player. The player turns out to be Han Ho and he easily finishes them off. Suddenly, Han Ho starts running away with other players. They manage to get inside a shield and the goblins get blocked by it. Kyung Soo orders the other players inside the shield to get ready to face the goblins. The goblins are attacking the pioneer cap's shield damaging it slowly in the process. Han Ho shoots down another goblin with his throwing knife which activates his divine skill. He starts rushing at the goblins with a menacing look. Han Ho keeps pummeling through the goblins with ease. Another group starts approaching him but this time he's not going to run away like last time. Han Ho starts ripping them all apart into pieces. While he's going through his meaningless rampage, Raidi appears right next to him. Sung Woo and his party makes its appearance, but Han Ho is a bit confused because Death Knight is taking his place in Sung Woo's party. After a while, they are all having a meeting in their base. Spearman Kyung Soo informs them that it has been quite chaotic after the new main chapter started. Almost every other group of survivors have been suffering from these attacks throughout the country. The safety zones have become almost useless as their power is getting weaker and the monsters are becoming stronger. The Liberation Guild is currently fighting off thousands of orcs and they are currently looking for Sung Woo. They are the closest to what they can call allies so Sung Woo needs to help them. If the Evolution Society makes a move at this time then it is going to be fatal but judging by the current situation they might be facing off against the monsters as well. Lieutenant Kim comes in and he informs them that they have found the base of the goblins. According to their movement pattern their base must be in Pal Del Sun. Yongdong Po and other regions are in a pickle because of strong monsters like the orcs but they are quite lucky because they got only goblins. This time there are mage-like goblins which ride on boars in the mix. Sung Woo tells them that their goal is not to win the fight. He is more focused on knowing how much gold experience points they can gain from fighting this goblin army. Spearman Kyung Soo applauds him for thinking of gaining gold and experience from this situation. But Sung Woo tells them that he is not thinking for himself but for them. The hunt this time is going to be a good opportunity for the townspeople to gain experience. During nighttime, two goblins are guarding a factory in Pa Del San. Sung Woo appears from behind them and he thinks they must be guarding something important. He finishes them off in one go. Even weak goblins are scary when they are commanded by a warlord and they move systematically. Sung Woo summons the ogre champion as he is about to deal with their leader. The ogre champion uses his thunder god blessing technique on the warehouse. He manages to kill every single goblin commanding centurion with a single attack. A goblin lord is still alive and he makes it out of the rubble. Sung Woo summons the grim reaper scythe and he transforms into a lich. Death Knight finishes off the goblin lord in one strike. Sung Woo revives all the goblins he just killed and they start heading out. 
The goblins are moving in the form of a big army. The players from Sung Woo's town have formed a barricade along their way. Spearman Kyung Soo tells them to stay calm as the leaders of goblins are already dead and they are fighting a losing battle. The goblins start getting hit by ranged attacks. The players become happy after watching how easy it is and they will get a lot of experience from hunting these goblins. The poor goblins get hit by a lot of plenties as all of their commanders are already dead and they lose their will to fight. They keep getting nailed by the human players. All players are enjoying their easy grind fest. No matter what group it is, there will be a weakness in the absolute majority and they will end up becoming a burden for other players. Chefs and pioneers have a role outside of fighters but now the difficulty is rising and it has become an unavoidable situation. Even those people who are weak by nature or are sick can become stronger. Some players are helping the elderly and the children to level up as well. After shooting a goblin, a kid levels up to two and he starts crying with happiness. Finally, they manage to defeat the whole goblin army. And Sung Woo receives a notification that he is the first contributor to defeat a monster army. The players have won a great battle, so all of them will receive extra gold according to their contribution. Sung Woo was watching the whole battle from a rooftop, and he is quite satisfied with the contribution of all the players of his town. The next day, Sung Woo is heading for the Yongdong Post Station. He informs Spearman Kyung Soo that they will be able to hunt safely from now on, and he wants the average level of every player up to 8 by the time he returns. He cannot stay in town forever, and it is not his obligation to protect the weak. He tells them that everyone needs to work harder because the world is going to become more and more crueler with each passing day. The chopper arrives with Myung Soo and they are pestering them to hurry up. Sung Woo tells them it is time for them to help out their allies of Liberation Guild. The next morning, some buses are moving together with Crusaders. The prosecutor inquires about the situation of all the monster armies that have appeared from his men. One of his men tells him that he will be able to see the northern border in a moment. He is using a mid-ranked magic drone to scout ahead. This magic drone can share the field of vision with the mage. He informs the prosecutor that there are about 200 trolls and they look like they are headed their way. One of the trolls destroys the drone after noticing it. Min Hwa Song advises the prosecutor to destroy the bridge because thousands of orcs are heading there from Gimpo and they will be surrounded from both sides. The prosecutor asks for her advice on fighting the trolls first and then going for the orcs. Min Hwa Song tells him that the trolls have regeneration abilities and their fight will be dragged to the point that the orcs will surround them from the other side. Prosecutor knows it too but he needs to level up his crusaders to 10 as soon as possible for his personal quest. Some of his crusaders might die in the process but it is the safest way to bridge the gap between him and Sung Woo. Min Hwa Song informs him that she will summon all the guards from the station leaving only a minimum number behind. Min Hwa Song informs them that the chopper that went to pick up Sung Woo is about to arrive. Min Hwa Song becomes happy as they will be able to manage this tricky situation somehow. But Min Hwa Song informs her that Sung Woo tells them to not worry about the trolls. Suddenly, a chopper moves right above them. Sung Woo summons his minions when the helicopter reaches right above the trolls. Both Min Hwa Song and the prosecutor are shocked after watching this scene. Sung Woo's boss monsters start rampaging through the trolls with ease. Sung Woo revives the dead trolls to add them into his army. Some players from a different faction are watching Sung Woo in action from a distance and they start posting about it on the online forum. Sung Woo's party got another achievement after having more than 20 plus giant type members in his party. This synergy increases their damage against small and medium opponents by 30%. Finally, they arrive at the location of the main troll unit. The warlord troll chief makes his appearance. The troll chief starts hitting the ground. The spectators are a bit shocked after watching this random behavior of the chief. Suddenly, vines start popping out of the places where Troll Chief was attacking, and these vines start binding Sung Woo's skeletons. The spectators start thinking that it will be a hard battle for Sung Woo, but attack hits the hand of the chief and his axe falls out of his hand. The ogre champion punches his face with his fist. Wandering Drake takes a hold of him from behind, and the two bosses start rushing at him. The poor Troll Chief gets pummeled with their punches. Finally, the Death Knight finishes him off with the Masterless Sword. Sung Woo revives the Troll Chief and they start heading toward the Liberation Guild. The Prosecutor thanks Sung Woo for coming to their rescue. The Prosecutor tells him that a huge army of orcs is heading this way and they can only cross through this bridge. The Prosecutor already blocked all other paths so they can only move through here. The Prosecutor is still hanging on to his competitive nature and he wants to prove himself by taking the lead in this upcoming battle. 
Suddenly, they start getting a lot of posts on the public forums about people wanting to join Sung Woo in this raid. It's becoming hard for the Liberation Guild to maintain their reputation because of smaller guilds releasing information about Sung Woo's fights. They got many messages from different small groups of survivors who are moving toward their location to help them. Min Hwa Song thinks that they should welcome them and slowly convince them to joining their guild. The number of units in the orcs army is too large, so they need as much help as they could. Min Hwa Song heads inside the meeting room where the heads of different groups are gathered. Min Hwa Song starts the briefing. Their guild has blocked most of the bridge, but all of their guards are deployed there and they are monitoring their enemies through magic drones. All group leaders are piercing Sung Woo with their gazes. A crusader bursts inside the room and he informs them that a survivor flew over from the west and the thing she rode was quite unusual. Sung Woo thinks that even the Liberation Guild has limits when it comes to helicopters, but now something unusual has appeared. Since everyone is curious, prosecutor tells them that they can all come along to meet her. Sung Woo becomes shocked after watching this unusual ride with their very own eyes. This unusual ride is a tamed griffin monster and it is a bit agitated. A female player closes its beak and she tells them that this griffin is a good kid and it won't attack anyone. The griffin rider asks the prosecutor to help her. She informs them that a few hours ago, a large number of Chinese players landed in Ganghua and Sung Woo becomes shocked after hearing it. They move to a tent and the female player starts briefing them about their current situation. They live on Gyodong Island, which is a small island connected to Ganghua Island by land. The players from Ganghua Island set up a small safe zone in Gyodong Island. It is completely safe as long as they take care of small number of monsters there and set up a blockade on the Gyodong Highway. They have strong players on the island, but they decided to live quietly. A few hours ago, pirates landed on Gyodong Island. They have dozens of fishing boats alone. The islanders tried to resist them, but they were defeated by the pirates, and their escape route through Gyodong Highway was seized. The prosecutor asks her if she knows the exact number of the pirates. The female player informs him that there are probably more than a thousand of them. The other leaders think that China has a large population so their player numbers can be high and they can also invade their country. Min Hua Song thinks that is not the case and these are just mere pirates just like the raiders in their own country. Sung Woo tells them that these types of guys are the worst in this kind of situation and they come rushing in when they find a weakness. All other group leaders agree with Sung Woo. Min Hua Song tells them that they already have their hands full with the orcs invasion. An Sok Gu asks her what will they do if the pirates ride up the Han River and attack them from behind while they are dealing with the orcs. The prosecutor informs them that they will be dealing with the orcs only for now. They will set up a reconnaissance unit for observing the Han River and they will know right away if the pirates decide to attack them. The female player becomes shocked after hearing it and she gets down on her knees as she has lost all hope. Sung Woo tells them that he has another option for this situation. He suggests that they should dispatch a team to take care of the pirates and attack the orcs from both front and back with the help of the survivors from the Gangwa Island. An Sok Gu says that the whole island will be alerted if they send a helicopter, but Sung Woo can easily sneak in alone with his shadow skills. The prosecutor asks him if he is sure he can handle it alone. Sung Woo tells them that his necromancer skills are better suited to fight against human players. Sung Woo needs information from those Chinese players or once they keep crossing the borders, it will become hard for Korean players to stop their assault. Just like goblin leaders, Sung Woo needs to take care of the orc leaders from the back through Ganghua Island. Sung Woo asks the girl to take him to the island as quietly as she can on her griffin. The prosecutor agrees with his decision. The next day, they are about to leave for Gyodong Island. Han Ho asks Sung Woo to leave riding behind and Ji Seon tells Sung Woo to stay safe. More than two people can't ride the griffin. That's why he can't take them with him. With that said, they start moving toward their new destination. The female player informs Sung Woo that they need to wait until dark before they can enter the island so the pirates will not know about their arrival. The pirates have huge bird monsters who fly around and monitor the island. During nighttime, in the docks of Gyodong Island, inside a boat, some pirates are talking about the prisoners they took. Their leader tells them that they will have a lot of gold and women when they reach the Korean mainland. One of the pirates tells them that they would not even have survived if they had not got the poison liquor made from the eggs of the monster centipede caught in Hangzhou. One of the pirates tells the other that he feels more at ease with being chased out of the country and it is better being a pirate against a weak country than fighting against the strong players of their own country. One of them is about to say something about their general but the other one stops him. 
This pirate has a bounty hunter class and he can feel a presence in the shadows. Sungwoo appears from behind them and he cuts two of them in one strike. The third one gets chained by the Death Knight and Sungwoo tells the Death Knight to keep him alive so he can interrogate him later on. After a while, the pirate wakes up with the griffin scaring him. The female player tells Griffin to calm down and she will feed him the pirate after the investigation is over. They can freely talk with each other thanks to the system without knowing each other's language and Sungwoo tells him if he is not cooperative enough, he will just kill him and read his memories. Sungwoo tells him to choose whether he will stay alive and tell him everything or Sungwoo can read his memories after finishing him. Inside another ship, a pirate leader is angry because 90 people just disappeared in just a few hours. He tells his henchmen to unanchor the boats and check if there are any prisoners missing. He orders the monster birds to find the intruder and bring him in. The leader of the pirates is sharing his vision with the monster birds but he can't find anyone. He is pissed because the one responsible for this mayhem is hiding well. One of the pirate lackey tells him that they found the missing people and the leader is surprised his henchmen found them before him. They are all dead and they were laying side by side when he found them. The pirate leader is confused because the killer could have just thrown the bodies into the ocean to get rid of them but he loaded them into enemy ships. Another lackey tells him that they found more dead bodies in other ships. They are closer to another boat with dead bodies but suddenly all ships start getting destroyed one after another. They are confused after watching it as they have no clue how the boats exploded. The screams of other pirates start coming out of a nearby building. One of the windows opens up and a gas starts pouring out. One of the pirates knows that this gas is breath of the abyss used by mages and he suggests them moving away from it. The pirates start moving away on their cars. The birds are sending signals to the pirate leader from all over the island and he thinks there are a lot of enemies on the island. They can only get away through the bridge because their boats are already destroyed. The pirate leader is angry because if they become isolated here, their expedition will be doomed to fail before the reinforcements arrive. They need to get out of there and secure a new area where their main fleet can land so they can welcome their general. They arrive at the bridge and their leader orders them to go faster. Suddenly, wandering Drake along with Sungwoo crashes in front of them. The pirates become scared after witnessing it. Sungwoo knows there are three Chinese servers and these hooligans came from the second server. Plus, these pirates are just the advance party and they plan to create a base for their main force to land. The pirate leader comes out of the car and he orders his men to prepare for battle. But Sungwoo has no plans on wasting his time, so he will not let them play around anymore. Sungwoo activates Call of Death and weaken spirit in their area. Sungwoo's minions surround the pirates from all sides. The massive horde of Sungwoo's minions is about to approach them and the pirate leader summons his monster birds to fight back. The birds start finishing off the zombies with ease. This gives courage to the other pirates and they start fighting back. The ghouls start catching and smashing the monster birds into pieces. After a while, the whole monster bird army is annihilated by the ghouls alone. The pirate leader is in shock as those birds were his only trump card. Sungwoo revives the birds and they become a part of his horde. The pirate leader tries to fly away with his last monster bird. Sungwoo's bird minions start chasing the leader. After a few seconds, they manage to catch up to the monster bird and kill it. The pirate leader falls to the ground, breaking his back in the process. The pirate can't speak from the last shock so Sungwoo finishes him off to read his memory fragments and he levels up to 17 as well. After reviving the pirate leader, Sungwoo starts checking his memory fragments. Inside the memory fragment, he can see a huge ship. The ship crew seems to be well disciplined with everyone wearing proper uniforms. Their leader asks them where they should head next. It turns out they yielded the second server to a spiritualist player and a self-proclaimed emperor is growing in power in the first server. Even the third server has succumbed to the emperor so they can't go back to China. One of his assistants suggests they should ask for assistance from an outside power and the general cuts his head off. The general tells them that they are floating out in the open ocean because they lack in power and violence. They will soon make up for the power they lack after they conquer another land and they will return to their mainland to swallow it too just like a starving ghost. Now Sungwoo knows that another insane person is aiming for their country and he needs to stop this psycho as well. 
The general tells his men that the main problem they face is that there is no occupied land they can take. One of his men is quite afraid, but he musters up his strength to recommend that they should attack the nearby islands. They can blockade the sea with the islands and march back to the continent through the Korean peninsula. The general pats his man for his idea and the man thanks the general. The general orders his general Crimson Earth to take over all the islands near the mainland. They need to take control of the seas while strong Korean players are busy taking care of monsters in the mainland. General Crimson Earth was tasked with leading a small fleet and establishing an outpost on the Korean peninsula. General further refrains him from provoking the main forces of Korean Peninsula, and General Crimson Earth only needs to prepare for the arrival of their general. General further tells them to use the pirate synergies as much as possible. They also need to collect as much gold as they can while they're at it. The pirates have a rank 3 pirate synergy called, I will become king of pirates. It's a group synergy and it requires more than 10,000 pirates in the group. Its effects can double the amount of gold when killing a player, and they can also loot 20% of the gold a player has. Sungwoo now knows why these pirates were capturing live humans so they can later kill them with their main group and receive a lot of gold in the process. The general tells them that they also need to take care of the main quest they received which says that a nobleman will be born at the end of this chaos. General motivates his men by saying that they are not walking the path of nobleman but one of Azura. They need to show no mercy and loot everything. With that said, the memory fragment is over and Sungwoo returns back to the real world. Sungwoo has leveled up as well and he got 5 card choices. Sungwoo chooses Call of Death skill card, which increased his Call of Death skill rank. He can now summon 25 masterless zombies from the abyss. Sungwoo is quite happy because the size of his horde has increased drastically. The female player asks Sungwoo what he's going to do next. Sungwoo informs her that he is done here and he will now head toward Gimpo to fight in the real war. While on the other battlefield, both human players and the red orcs are in front of each other. The red orcs are looking quite pissed as usual. Jisoo Yun informs them that there are many orcs in the mix which are stronger than the normal orcs and Han Ho becomes afraid after hearing it. An Seok-gu informs them that this is only one of their advance parties but their numbers are still too much. Plus, they somehow managed to make the trolls their slaves who are now fighting for them. Myung-soo and some other players can't believe it because trolls are more powerful than the orcs. Raidi and ji soo yun start advancing and cutting the trolls on their way. They both jump toward the center of the red orcs formation. Some red orcs get stabbed by flying daggers. These daggers were thrown by Han-ho who is looking quite motivated now. Han-ho is even punching some orcs to death. Gang Yun Lee performs a wave of fire spell to burn the orcs. He burns a lot of orcs with his attack and each red orc warrior gives 1,200 gold. Gang Yun Lee becomes a bit cocky after defeating a few orcs, but An Seok saves his life by catching a stray arrow which was about to hit him and An Seok tells him to be more careful. An Seok starts pummeling the orcs with his fist attacks and he orders his fighters to protect the mages. The orcs are getting pushed back quite hard but they are still fearless and it seems like they are enjoying this fight. An orc chief tries to attack them but he gets punched by Han Ho and he tells them that he is enjoying this fight more than the orcs. The shield bearer squad is blocking the orcs advance while the priest squad is buffing them up from behind with their pose skills. One of the fighters points out something in the distance. These are orc shamans who are being carried by trolls. The orc shamans throw their magic spells toward the players and the shield bearers ask their magicians to cast magic bearers on their shields. But the magic spells hit them before they can cast any kind of protection barriers. The players who got hit by the spell are not looking well and some specialized orc cavalry starts heading toward them. The crusader team arrives there at the same time. The crusaders make their breakthrough formation which stops the assault of the red orcs cavalry. Min Hyun Sung orders the crossbowmen to target the orc shamans. The arrows of crossbowmen successfully manage to neutralize the orc shamans. The other players become motivated after watching the crusaders in action. The prosecutor is getting rid of the orcs one after another and if things keep on going smoothly, he can clear his personal quest very soon. Prosecutor performs his cross spear skill to wipe out a group of red orc warriors. The last of his crusaders who was on level 9 kills a red orc warrior and he levels up to 10. A system notification pops up which informs the prosecutor that his personal promotion quest has been completed. He received his first stage awakening as a reward and his fate has changed slightly. 
The orcs come to a stop as the prosecutor starts bursting with light. Even the human players can't keep their eyes open as something shiny is falling from the sky. A light spear appears up in the sky. The current area has become the temple's domain for one hour. The healing effect in the area will increase by 2% and all crusaders' strats will increase by 5 points. The prosecutor takes a hold of the spear and he orders his men to charge forward. The human players are slowly getting healed and they start praising the prosecutor. And the prosecutor can feel his self-esteem being revived. This new world needs a change and the Liberation Guild will be the first step towards this change. Meanwhile, in China, a player informs Li Wei Nim that they received some information from the band of plunderers they defeated. The plunderers went to the Korean server after getting defeated in the Chinese second server. Li Wei is quite pissed because she thinks she should have gotten rid of those human formed beasts right when they had the chance. The player informs her that there is no need to worry because the vanguard of plunderers were defeated in Korea. Li Wei is quite happy to know that there are still capable people in the Korean server. Meanwhile, back on the battlefield, the prosecutor receives 3,000 gold for killing the assault orc chief captain. After a few minutes, they are done with the current group of red orc warriors. Minhum Song informs the prosecutor that they got a complete victory, except for a few orcs who managed to escape. Prosecutor inquires about the casualties on their side. Minhum Song informs him that three crusaders and 100 players have died in the last battle, but it is a lot less than what they expected. The prosecutor thinks that they should have decreased the casualties by as much as they can. They can't infinitely fill up their ranks like Sung Woo and it takes a lot of time and resources to train the crusaders who die so easily. An Sok Koo informs them that the players need rest because if the orc attacks them again, they will die from exhaustion. All of a sudden, they start hearing a lot of footstep sounds. They see another wave of red orcs approaching their location. One of the orcs sound a horn and he is riding a rhino. Ji Seun informs them that the group they just fought was the advance group but now they're a part of their main forces here. And so Gu and Gang Yun Li inform the prosecutor that it will be impossible to stop the assault of this group of orcs. Min Hum Song suggests that they should retreat back and fight in the closed streets. But the prosecutor is a bit confused as if they retreat back to the buildings, the main force of the orcs can directly head for Yongdong Po station. Ji Seun agrees with him because the orcs always go for the place with more people and Yongdong Po station has a lot more refugees than the fighters present here. With that said, the prosecutor tells them they cannot back down from this point or the non-combatant humans will suffer in their place. The red orcs start advancing toward the human players and some humans become disheartened after watching their advance. Han Ho points out towards something important. A dead orc drops toward a red orc warrior riding a rhino. Sung Woo detonates the dead orc which results in a big explosion. Some huge birds are flying up and they are carrying the dead bodies of orcs. The birds drop the dead orcs toward the army of the main force of the orcs and they explode after coming within their range. Everyone becomes happy as they know Sung Woo is back in this battle. Sung Woo makes an appearance there and he's riding the Drake along with the Death Knight. Prosecutor becomes a bit relaxed after watching Sung Woo in action. Magic drone belonging to different guilds are hovering over the battlefield. The whole battle is being live broadcasted on the community forums. They are discussing that maybe the Death Knight is the new main favorite skeleton of the Necromancer. Meanwhile, Raidi is losing his popularity because he used to be the main favorite skeleton soldier of Sung Woo in the past. The broadcasters are quite happy as their number of subscribers is increasing drastically. The chat is quite active and they are wondering if Sung Woo is this much stronger than how much stronger the number one player can be. At the same time, someone starts banging on the door of the broadcasters and they become active. Min Hwa Song barges in with the Crusaders team and tells them to put down their weapons. Min Hwa Song tells them to turn down the broadcast or they will use force to stop them. The staff members start accusing her of monopolizing the press and fabricating the truth. Min Hum Song corrects him by saying that Yongdong Po Station was targeted due to the broadcast of Yoido Island Raid. Their locations can be easily revealed through these broadcasts. The member agrees with her and he tells them that they will cooperate with them. Min Hum Song grins her teeth as she knows there are a lot of other private channels broadcasting the raid live and they cannot stop all of them. Both their enemies and players with unknown objectives are watching their stream right now. During nighttime, outside the Liberation Guild camp, Raidi is sitting next to the fire. Hano becomes afraid after knowing that the beastmen and scientists can attack them from south, and they have an orc army rushing toward them from west, and Chinese pirates will come for their necks from the ocean. 
Hanho is pissed as he knows the difficulty of Korean servers is increasing drastically. Ji Soyun thinks they are strong in the Korean server, but they don't know about the power of the rest of the world and their country size is small as well. She thinks that they need to hunt more and gain levels faster. Sungwoo agrees with her as their main goal since they left the college campus is to get stronger. But since Korea is a small country compared to the rest of the world, so the circulating gold and experience points are small as well. That is why Sungwoo thinks that this war with the orcs is a blessing in disguise for them. After the last battle with the orcs, Sungwoo already discussed it with the prosecutor that they will be facing off against other countries soon enough. After dealing with the orcs, they need to travel to other countries, if possible, and get rid of all possible threats. But he also has no idea what they will face after defeating the hostile players. One of the crusaders outside hears something, but his fellow guard tells him that he didn't hurt anything suspicious. All of a sudden, some roots start popping out of the ground. The roots become larger and they are growing randomly. Ji Se-yun and Raidi burst into the room of Sung Woo to alert him. But all of a sudden, a red orc appears behind Ji Su-yun and he is about to attack her. Ji Su and Raidi easily cut the orc with their swords. The crusaders start informing others that the orcs are here. The orcs are finishing off the players and they are wondering how the orcs got inside the camp. Han Ho points toward the location where orcs are coming from. There are some portals made up of roots and the orcs are coming out of these portals. Sung Woo is a bit taken aback after watching the orcs using portal magic. The orcs start heading for the camp of the prosecutor, but the prosecutor uses his skill to make the whole area into a temple's domain for one hour. The prosecutor is looking quite pissed at the orcs who disturbed their resting time. The human players become buffed and they are bursting with energy from the temple's domain skill. Kang and Lee uses waves of flame magic to turn the orcs into ashes and he destroys one of the portals in the process. An Ku was hurt during the surprise attack but now he's getting healed from the buff and he can feel like he had jumped from two or three levels at once. The prosecutor uses cross spear skill to tear apart the advancing red orc warriors and he destroys a portal as well. Menem Song informs the crusaders that two portals have been destroyed and they should focus on the other portals. But he is a bit confused to see that they cannot spot another portal. It turns out, Sung Woo and his party already destroyed the rest of the portals. The Liberation Guild only took care of two portals while Sung Woo destroyed all other portals in such a short span of time. The prosecutor and Sung Woo are both at their first awakening, but the difference between their powers is immense. Soon they notice a rock which is giving off a black smoke and they are wondering if it is the thing that created these portals. Sung Woo picks up the rock and a red warning message pops up which informs them that this item contains dark energy and long term contact with it can result in negative consequences. All of a sudden a mission window pops up in front of all the players. The quest tells them that the orc lord is casting a large scale black magic. If they don't stop it before 30 hours, all orcs will be buffed into a demonic state. Sung Woo remembers that the boss of the college campus was also a black mage orc. Sung Woo thinks that this orc lord is the perfect match for him. Min Im Sung receives an emergency call from Min Hwa Song. He becomes shocked after hearing the message of Min Hwa Song. It turns out the wyverns are heading their way. After some time, the wyverns start passing through their camp. Han Seok Koo is worried because they are getting into one mess after another, but Gang Yun Lee tells him to stop bickering or the wyverns will hear them. Min Hwa Song informs the prosecutor that the wyverns have left, but they should still stay hidden for a while. They have a lot of people and wyverns can come back after observing them from a distance. They don't have a lot of time left, but they have no other choice, and the prosecutor agrees with her decision. Han Ho asks Song Woo if it is still too early to kill the wyverns. Ji Su Yun informs him that they can somehow take care of one or two of them, but there are dozens of them flying altogether. Plus, fighting enemies in air is a bit difficult for them. The Alpha Wyvern male and the wyverns under its command are the true rulers of Korean skies right now. Everything comes to a halt when they pass through. Sung Woo wants to hunt them badly, but he can't think of a way to do so. The next morning, the wyverns are not in sight. Min Hwa Song informs the prosecutor that they can start moving now, because the wyverns must have crossed the northern side of the Han River by now. The prosecutor agrees with her and he orders her to inform each team that they will be advancing ahead. Han Ho got a useful information that the Gimpo Plains, where the orc army have been appearing from, has started to turn into a wasteland, just like how the Yuido Island turned into a wetland during the raid on the Wandering Drake. 
This whole place was a grassy, fertile area and it turned into a wasteland in a single night. Minhua Song informs Song Wu that, according to the report of the reconnaissance team, the orcs are gathering at the Gimpo International Airport. The prosecutor tells them that it will be a great battle where two powerful forces will clash. Sung Woo tells them that they need to make wise decisions because the orcs can be planning something behind the scenes. The prosecutor knows that it can't be the case, but they don't have enough time and they need to get rid of the orcs in this battle before the timer runs out. The Red Orc Army is advancing toward the human players from the Gimpo International Airport. The human players are a bit taken back after watching the huge number of orcs. Sung Woo knows that some of these players are disheartened and they want to run away from this battle, but there is no longer any place left for them to escape. If they retreat right now, they will later have to face the orcs which will be buffed with dark magic. The prosecutor asks Sung Woo if he's going to start the fight with corpse explosion as usual. Sung Woo orders his birds to throw the dead orcs toward the advancing parties, but deep down, he knows that the orcs must have prepared something to counter corpse explosion this time. But he is still eager to find out what plans these unintelligent orcs can cook up. Song Wu performs corpse explosion on the corpses but after the smoke subsides, they see a shield around the orc army. This shield is one of the magics of the black mage orcs. Both prosecutor and Song Wu realize that the orcs are not advancing forward and they are maybe buying time for the completion of the black magic spell. This means they have to first initiate the attack and fight the orcs head on. Minhua Song suggests that they should think of a way to minimize their casualties because even if they win here, there are too many enemies which are waiting for them to become weak. Song Wu tells the prosecutor to focus on developing the alliance after the war with the orcs and there is no need to worry about the foreign enemies. The prosecutor asks him why they don't need to worry about the invaders. Song Wu tells them that the Loki survivors have started to gather because of the invading monster armies but the main problem is that there is not a safe group which can manage these survivors. Prosecutor assures Song Wu that as long as there are no direct threats toward him, he will develop a large scale group which can make people feel at ease. Song Wu is wondering that the group which is targeting Korea were the losers of second Chinese server and they should hunt them now before they can become big enough to cause them trouble. However, there is going to be a day when they have to face an even greater group. The more larger their group gets, the chances of their encounter with other groups will also increase. That's why Sung Woo needs an organization which works systematically to help him. Unfortunately, the small town of Suwon is not enough, so he needs a bigger group. At the same time, Prosecutor is thinking of making a large community at the national level and now Sung Woo is going to support him to make his community bigger. In reality, both Sung Woo and Prosecutor are trying to use each other in some way. Han Ho and Ji Si Yun are happy now that the conflict between Sung Woo and the Prosecutor has subsided. They have to take care of the orcs first, so they start making a plan. Sung Woo informs the Prosecutor that he has a way to decrease the casualties by as much as possible. But that method is a bit unconventional. Sung Woo hints at doing some sort of sniping. After some time, the prosecutor and the Liberation Guild start heading toward the orcs' main army. Min Hum Sung says that it feels like they are marching to a slaughterhouse. But Ji Si Yun replies by saying that they will be the ones who will become butchers today. Han Ho tells her that there are too many pigs to slaughter and his daggers are not enough. An orc gives out a loud roar and they start marching toward the Liberation Guild. Prosecutor orders his tanks to come to the front and the mages to move in the middle so they can't get attacked from behind. One of the mages is feeling disheartened but his friend tells him that he should focus on the fight now because he cannot run away even if he wants to. In order to motivate his men, the prosecutor tells them that they have already won many impossible battles and today's war is just an extension of those battles. The prosecutor is sure that there will be even more difficult and exhausting fights from now on. More powerful foes will try to bring them down with their might and he asks his men if they will give up in the face of such a small challenge. His men are bursting with motivation so they say they will never give up. The prosecutor uses his Templar's domain skill and tells his men that this victory will belong to them. The outer shield of the orcs gets destroyed and the mages start casting fireballs. The fireballs hit the orcs but their numbers don't seem to be dwindling. The orcs attack the front row of the Liberation Guild but their tankers are holding back the orcs. The orcs are trying to surround them from sides so the spearmen get ready. The orc shamans make their appearance so the human mages also start getting ready. Rhino riders are pushing toward the human player formation so the spearmen start aiming for them before they can break their formation. 
The human players are ferociously holding back the orcs. The siege weapons of the orcs start taking their position. An orc chief orders the siege weapons to start shooting at the human players. The prosecutor uses his Realm of Blind Faith skill to cast a shield around them. The prosecutor orders his men to hold their position and keep luring the orc's main forces toward them. They need to bring the orc lord as close to them as possible. At the same time, a griffin is flying above the airport. The girl asks Sung Woo if he wants the griffin to lower the altitude, but Sung Woo replies by saying that this height is enough for him. All of a sudden, Sung Woo jumps down and he activates his Grim Reaper mode in the air. The Orc Shamans can feel Sung Woo's presence but they are a bit late and Sung Woo summons Ogre Champion out of the abyss. The Orc Shamans summon the shield around them and the Ogre Champion gets ready for his Thunder God Blessing technique. The Ogre Champion smashes the shield into bits and the Orc Shamans also get destroyed in the process. The Prosecutor saw the whole thing and now he knows that it was the sniping operation Sung Woo was talking about. The Orc Lord appears out of the rubble and the last attack had a lot of impact on him. Sung Woo asks why he is looking angry. The Ogre Warriors start retreating back to protect their Lord. Min Hum Song tells the Liberation Guild to attack the Orcs which are trying to retreat. Sung Woo activates both Call of Death and Weakened Spirit at the same time. Sung Woo receives a new hidden synergy because he has a Commander Skeleton Righty with more than 30 units under his command. He also got a second synergy called Giants which require more than 50 giant type units in the party. His third synergy is Steel Armored Knightage, which requires more than 50 units equipped with heavy armor. Someone throws a bottle filled with Breath of the Abyss in the middle of the Orc army. The Orcs start dying from the effects of Breath of the Abyss. Han Ho, who is now riding the Griffin, was the one who threw the bottle at the Orcs. Sung Woo is feeling even more buffed after coming in contact with the Breath of Abyss. Sung Woo tells the Orc Lord that he is sorry for coming to see him like this, but he wanted to have a nice little chat with him. Sung Woo orders Righty and the Death Knight to attack the Orc Lord. Righty and the Death Knight start attacking the Orc Lord in unison. The Orc Lord is somehow blocking their attacks. The Orc Lord gets distracted for one second, and the Death Knight seizes this chance to perform a slash attack on him. Righty jumps toward the Orc Lord to finish him with a head stab, but the Death Knight chains and pushes the Orc Lord toward himself. Death Knight slashes the Orc Lord into two pieces with the Nameless Sword. Sung Woo receives 900,000 gold for defeating the Orc Lord and the time until the egg hatching has been reduced to 3,780 days. Reddy is pissed at the Death Knight for stealing his kill, but Death Knight tries to clarify that he killed the Orc Lord to reduce the hatching time of the Dragon Egg. After the death of their lord, the orcs have lost the will to fight. The orcs are hit with a plenty effect and they became weaker. The human players start butchering the red orcs. Min Hum Sung along with some other Liberation Guild members ride on bikes to kill the orcs faster. The prosecutor becomes relieved because now they can hunt the orcs without worrying about casualties. All of a sudden, Min Hum Sung receives an emergency alert on his mobile. It seems to be quite important so Min Hum rides toward the prosecutor to tell him the news. Min Hum Sung informs the prosecutor that the Magic Drone scout team just reported that the Wyvern's group is headed their way. Prosecutor becomes shocked and he inquires about the current location of Wyverns. Min Hum Sung informs him that scout team who reported it is 3 kilometers away from their location, so the Wyverns must be arriving at their location pretty soon. The prosecutor thinks that maybe they were tricked by wyverns. The wyverns were waiting for their prey to leave the city which had a lot of obstacles and head toward the wasteland. Prosecutor orders all human players to retreat and take shelter inside the airport building. The human players are a bit confused as to why a prosecutor is asking them to retreat. All of a sudden a system message pops up which informs all of them that the field boss wyvern alpha male appeared near them. The human players are already too late as the wyverns are upon them. The wyverns start rampaging through the ranks of human players and eating them in the process. Sung Woo thinks that the wyverns appeared at a bad time and dealing with them can be a bit troublesome right now. Sung Woo orders his flying birds to carry the dead orcs toward the wyverns. The wyverns are busy in their rampage and the birds approach near them carrying the bodies. Sung Woo asks the prosecutor to prepare the ballistas and the prosecutor orders his men to prepare them. The wyverns spot the flying birds. One of them bites a dead red orc and gulps it up without any second thoughts. Sung Woo uses corpse explosion to blast the red orc inside the mouth of the wyvern. The prosecutor orders his men to shoot the wyvern with ballistas. Sung Woo orders the wandering drake to finish off the wyvern. Wandering Drake bites the wyvern from behind and after a bit of struggle, he manages to kill the wyvern. 
Sung Woo receives 754,000 gold for finishing off a single wyvern. All human players become happy after witnessing Sung Woo finishing off a wyvern. Sung Woo always wanted to beat the wyverns and now he finally managed to achieve his goal. Sung Woo uses his skill to add the wyvern into his horde. Sung Woo gets on the wyvern and he orders Death Knight to do the same. They start flying high above the other wyverns. The skies have finally opened up for Sung Woo and he can now travel freely and faster. Death Knight asks Sung Woo if they are going to hunt the wyverns next. Sung Woo replies by saying that it's time for them to show the wyverns how it feels like being hunted. One of the wyverns spots the human players gathered below him. He starts rushing toward them at full speed. Sung Woo orders his bone wyvern to chase that wyvern who got separated from the herd. The bone wyvern bites one of its wing. Death Knight uses his Chains of Abyss skill to bind the wyvern. Sung Woo orders the Death Knight to finish it off with the Nameless Sword. All of a sudden, Sung Woo notices a second wyvern above him, which is about to attack them. They dodge the attack of the wyvern by ducking down. The bone wyvern starts flying away and the second wyvern gives chase. Sung Woo is worried because taking care of two wyverns at the same time will be difficult, but at the same time he receives a notification that the first wyvern has been killed. Death Knight killed the first wyvern by stabbing its head with the nameless sword, and now he is falling down. Sung Woo makes the first wyvern into a bone wyvern with his skill. The second wyvern is not giving up and he is about to bite them. Sung Woo summons Righty and he throws him toward the second wyvern. As the wyvern is about to gulp up Righty, he uses his spinal bones to dodge the attack. Righty then uses his spiral blade technique to cut the wyvern. Wyvern received a lot of damage and he is bleeding. The wyvern Sung Woo is riding bites off the neck of the second wyvern. Sung Woo brings the second wyvern back to life and now he has three of them. There are more wyverns below them which are in a horde and the alpha male wyvern is watching them from above. Sung Woo can't deal with the whole herd of wyverns so he will wait for some of them to leave the herd and he will hunt them one by one. All of a sudden, the alpha male wyvern who was hovering above them gives out a loud roar. All wyverns look up at the alpha male. The whole herd starts moving up in the sky even ignoring Sung Woo who is standing on their way. The alpha male wyvern along with his herd is giving off some evil vibes. Death Knight tells Sung Woo to be on alert because things are about to get messy. There are about 30 wyverns in the herd and it is going to be impossible to run away from them. But Sung Woo still has a jar filled with Breath of the Abyss which can come in handy in this situation. The wyverns start rushing towards Sung Woo in unison. Sung Woo quickly spreads the Breath of Abyss around him. The wyverns become alerted after watching a cloud formed with Breath of the Abyss, but they still charge through and they get hit with the effects of the abyss. The wyverns back away from the smoke of breath of the abyss. The death knight informs Sung Woo that the breath of abyss works like a charm on them, but the alpha male wyvern is still holding his ground. Sung Woo pulls up another empty jar and he tries to threaten the wyverns to back away or he will shower them with more jars containing breath of the abyss. The alpha male realizes they cannot do anything if the necromancer keeps on using the breath of the abyss, so he decides to retreat with his horde. The wyverns fly off into the distance at maximum speed. Sung Woo's Grim Reaper mode also just expired and he is happy to finally have some peace. Sung Woo lands on the ground and his minions take care of the remaining orcs. The human players feel at ease by having Sung Woo with them. The prosecutor feels a bit relieved because Sung Woo is on his side and he can take care of foreign powers while he concentrates on making a strong community. A notification pops up which informs them that the Koreans have cleared the fourth warlord monster and Sung Woo is the biggest contributor in this mission. The human players start celebrating their victory. Sung Woo was the biggest contributor in this raid but player Han Kang Sok is still on the first position in the Korean server. Sung Woo just leveled up to 18 so he chooses a plus 3 strength card as his level up reward. Sung Woo knows that information about him has spread too much due to the live streaming and his enemies will target him in the future instead of his summons. That's why he chose a strength card to increase his strength. Sung Woo also got a legendary rank ring after killing the Orc Lord. This ring is called Black and Pearl Ring. It increases curse type magic damage by 10%. This ring also emits dark energy which can be harmful to players with no immunity. Sung Woo equips the ring and it will be quite useful for him when he uses Breath of the Abyss or other black magic. Sung Woo thinks that he could have gotten better loot if he had allowed the Orc Lord to cast the black magic just like the legendary item he got from Orc Shaman in the college gym. But stopping the magic was more important or more people would have lost their lives. During night, they make an assessment that only 492 people survived the last battle. That's only a third of players they started the battle with, 
and the players are a bit concerned. The prosecutor comes up and he informs them that they have lost a lot of good men, but the ones who survived have become stronger. He further informs them that events like this will continue to occur, so they must use this incident as a reason to get stronger. Sungwoo thinks that the words of the prosecutor are a bit tough, but everything he says is true. Jisian reached level 15 while Hanho is a bit slow, so he made it up to level 12. Hanho is on the 27th rank while Jisian is on the 7th rank in the Korean server. Hanho takes a mic and he starts complaining to the system for only awarding 4 or 5 star players with awakening while the players with low stars are treated like extras. Sung informs him that he had two chances to pick a class and it's his fault that he chose low star classes both times. At the same time, some Liberation Guild members who were exploring the Gimpo International Airport come out. One of the players informs them that they found a store inside the airport building. But when they tried to get inside, they got a system message telling them that the store cannot be approached. Sungwoo becomes happy as he thinks this store must be only for special players like him. The other players with high star classes also become happy after hearing it. The prosecutor tells all of the leaders to head inside and give it a try. The player guides the leaders in the room with the store. There is something different about this store and even its logo is marked with cannot be used symbol. Anta Gu and Gang Yung Lee try to approach the outer wall of the store, but the entrance of the store is still locked, and a message pops up which informs them that they need a secret store coupon to enter. Sungwoo heads up near the store wall. He puts his hand on the wall and a notification pops up which asks him if he wants to use the secret store coupon. This is the secret coupon Sungwoo got after his first awakening and it was only limited to 50 people around the world. And it looks like the prosecutor got awakened pretty late so maybe that's why he didn't get any secret coupon. The other leaders are a bit pissed because Sungwoo is the one who always gets special treatment by the system. Sungwoo heads inside the room and there's a chair with a screen in front of it. The system asks Sungwoo to sit down and Sungwoo sits on the chair. A system message pops up which informs him that 5 carefully selected items will be sequentially revealed to him. He needs to speak up if there is an item he wishes to purchase. Sungwoo will have 10 seconds to make his decision and an item which already passed through cannot be purchased. Sungwoo tells the system store that he is ready. A bright light appears on the screen and the system message informs him that it's going to reveal the first item. The first item is a consumable blueprint and it looks like a mech unit. This special rank item is called Golem Design Blueprint. The player can learn Golem production skill after using this item. The owner of this skill can make large sized golems using the materials around him and it requires 1 million gold to acquire this blueprint. A 10 second system timer starts and Sungwoo starts flaring up after hearing he can make big golem mech units like Gundam with his skill. Sungwoo has a total of 10,500,000 gold so he buys the golem blueprint item without any second thoughts. The second item is a set of Cure All Elixirs. All status ailments can be cured after using it and it requires 2 million gold to purchase it. This item was also included in the reward choice during the hidden stage but he had no idea that it was so expensive back then. Sungwoo passes on this item because he is a necromancer and he has immunity to most effects. The third item is a skill rank increasing medicine pill. The rank of one of the skills can be increased by one after using it and it costs 3 million gold. Sungwoo ignores this item as well and he realized that the cost of each item is increasing by a million gold. The fourth item is a legendary rank Shadow King's bracelet. It increases different stats of its wearer by 3 and the user can teleport to a shadow within a radius of 100 meters. It has a 10 minute cooldown and it costs 4 million gold. Sungwoo buys the Shadow King's bracelet without any second thought. The synergy effect of this bracelet is quite good and he needs it to complete the Shadow's King Air quest. A notification pops up which tells him that he needs one more Shadow King relic to complete the quest. The screen starts revealing the fifth item and Sungwoo is quite excited to see it. A special rank consumable scroll appears. This item is called Resurrection Scroll and its user can be resurrected at the designated location after death. This scroll requires 5 million gold. Resurrection is an exclusive feature for the Necromancer class. This same feature allowed him to deal with the Wandering Drake and finish his first awakening quest. Resurrection cooldown can take up to 31 days, but it is still an overpowered skill. There are three drawbacks of this skill. First, the cooldown of this skill is too long. Sungwoo has already used this skill and he's still waiting for the countdown to be over. And if he dies in that time, it will be over for him. 
Second drawback is that the situation can't be changed even after being resurrected, and the enemy who killed him once must be overpowered enough to kill him twice. Third drawback is that it's a skill Sung Woo can only use on himself, and if Han Ho or Ji Su Yun die, he can't do anything. Besides the fact that they are both his close friends, they are the only two people he can completely trust. They need to get strong and take risks. The resurrection scroll will be a huge advantage to them. So Sung Woo buys it before the timer can run out. Sung Woo buyed everything he needed and the store starts sending him back. After the war with the orcs ended, the prosecutor established Capital's City Player Union. The Liberation Guild and the players from Sung Woo's town kept grinding levels. At the same time, Sung Woo and his party are enjoying their vacation. Sung Woo is gathering information because the fights they are going to have in the future will be more difficult. The Griffin Rider approaches them and she informs them that the pirates have already appeared. Ji Su Yun signs as their short break is already over. Sung Woo informs Prosecutor about it and he asks Sung Woo how he is going to deal with the pirates. Sung Woo informs him that it will be best to take care of them in the ocean before they can make their landing. Han Ho says that the pirates would not have invaded them for the second time if they had a working brain. Ji Su Yun says that they must be careful because the pirates will try to approach them differently because they already know about Sung Woo. If those pirates are aiming for Korea, then they must have gathered as much information as they can from live streams or by kidnapping other players. Ji Su Yun asks Sung Woo if he has already thought about how he is going to deal with the pirates. Sung Woo has not thought of a plan yet, but he still says he has a plan. These pirates are a group of plunderers who were chased out of the Chinese mainland. They called themselves Lord General of Heaven, Lord General of Earth, and Lord General of People. Hano tells them that he has already heard these names in Chinese games and they refer to the Yellow Turban Rebellion. After investigating the underlings of the pirates, Sung Woo found out that they were all brainwashed and they acted like fanatics toward their boss. GCN tells them that the Yellow Turban Rebellion was also a historical event where the leader led fanatics to take over the world, and this situation seems familiar. Sung Woo heard some pirates talking about a poisonous centipede wine, which probably is the catalyst used for the brainwashing. The prosecutor says that their leader seems dangerous and he must be dealt with first. If they somehow lose him, he can come back with more soldiers using his brainwashing skills. Sung Woo says that they should start heading towards Kyodong Island first, and this time, Ji Su Yun and Han Ho will be tagging along with him. Sung Woo summons his wyverns for the flight, but Han Ho says that he prefers the safety of a chopper, and the girl assures him that her flying hawk is quite safe, so he should travel with her. Ji Su Yun says riding wyverns is fun too, but Han Ho replies by saying that it's fun for her because she is in physical education department. As Sung Woo is about to leave, the prosecutor tells him that he will leave the pirates to him. Sung Woo says that there is no need to worry about the pirates, but they don't know what the Evolution Society might do in his absence, so they must prepare well for any kind of attack. The prosecutor gets furious and he informs Sung Woo that they will be investing as much manpower as they can to prepare for the Evolution Society. During nighttime, Sung Woo and his party arrive at Kyodong Island. Sung Woo asks a fisherman if he is sure he saw the pirate ships. The fisherman says that he is sure he saw ships belonging to the pirates. The daughter of the fisherman asks him again if he is sure, and the fisherman replies by saying that her uncle who was the previous leader was eaten by one of their monster birds, so he is quite sure about it. This guy is called Lee Muyeon, and he is the new leader of Kyodong Island. Their resentment against the pirates was so great that they gave up hunting monsters and started to work as coastal guards. Lee Muyeon says that it's been about 12 hours since they circled the island. Then they went over to the shore of Ganghua Island. Sung Woo says that this makes it clear that the pirates have not given up on the Korean peninsula. Ji Su Yun says that they cannot rule out the possibility that they will land in other locations. Plus, they can land on the southern part of the peninsula and then move up. Han Ho says that this can be better for them because warlord monsters still exist in other areas except for the capital city. The players have already evacuated upward and the pirates will be cleaning up the monsters for them. Sung Woo says they are wrong and the pirates will come straight this way. The idea of taking over another server isn't something you can accomplish with the usual confidence or momentum. The leader of those pirates only has his eyes on taking over the capital city, which is the core of their server. Sung Woo asks Lee Muyeon if they are thinking of staying on the island, even with the pirates coming back. Lee Muyeon says that they have suffered once due to those pirates, but they will not suffer again, and this time they are going to pay back the pirates. 
Ji Su Yun says that they should get ready in that case. Sung Woo thinks that they must prepare thoroughly because the advanced fleet of pirates was wiped out and this time maybe the main fleet will arrive. Sung Woo's party has a lot of gold, so they ask Lee Mu Yun about the location of a store or a blacksmith shop because they want to buy some equipment. Lee Mu Yun tells him that there is a smithy in downtown where they can strengthen their equipment. At the same time, a fisherman runs toward Lee Mu Yun. The fisherman informs them that the pirates have already swarmed together. They are gathering on an island across the sea where they are preparing to attack them. Lee Mu Yun informs Sung Woo that it happened too fast and they are not ready yet. Sung Woo is thinking that the pirates are acting weird and they should have landed somewhere inland instead of a separate island. Sung Woo thinks that maybe the pirates haven't learned anything about him yet or they are looking down on him. During nighttime, a ship is moving through the ocean. A player with a mic says that he will now inform all of them what they are about to do. The player says that they belong to the Lord General of Earth's fleet. They are currently in the middle of the ocean right now. He tells the men to be on guard because the ocean is filled with terrible monsters. After crossing this hellish ocean, they will be landing on the Korean Peninsula in order to occupy that land. The people from the Chinese second server are calling them cowards because they ran away from there without a proper fight. But once they return to the Chinese server after conquering Korea, they will take care of all of them. The player with the mic says that the wish of their Lord of Heaven will be fulfilled in Korea. But Korea has an evil villain called the Necromancer who killed their advanced team without showing any sort of mercy. However, the same thing is not going to happen for the second time because their great fleet will be conquering the land of Korea. The pirates become inspired and they start cheering for the Lord of Heaven. Their Lord General of People along with his advance party were annihilated by Song Woo. But that advance party was quite small and they don't need to be afraid of anyone with their main fleet. The player badmouths the spiritualist Li Wei and he tells her to not let her victory of the second Chinese server get to her head. They will be going back to Manchuria after taking over Korea and he challenges Li Wei to come at Manchuria after taking over the first Chinese server so they can juke it out again. He further says that they will let the entire continent know by broadcasting themselves while killing the necromancer so they can prove to everyone that the Red Revolution Army are not a bunch of pushovers. But after a while, his expression changes because most of their ships have caught fire and they are sinking in the ocean. They are being bombed from the skies and these birds actually belong to their Lord General of People. A huge flying monster is approaching their location and on closer inspection, it turns out to be Sung Wu riding on it. All of a sudden, some birds die after getting pierced by a blue ray. It turns out to be Ji Xuan, who belongs to a cannon shooter plus ice wizard classes. He is also their Lord General of Earth and his men start cheering for him. But no matter how many birds he blasts off, they keep coming back to life. Ji Xuan orders the magic squad to create a shield and step back. The magic squad successfully creates a large linked shield around their ships. But for some reason, Song Wu is laughing instead of getting demotivated. Song Wu retreats back to the island along with all of his monster birds. The men under the Lord General of Earth become relieved. Ji Xuan comes to the announcer Quan and he says that they have suffered a lot of casualties in such a short span of time. He is amazed by the capabilities of the necromancer as he can explode corpses and he can control the monster birds which once belonged to their great general of people. Ji Xuan is a cunning and calculative guy. He thinks they did a good job of putting the ships of their subordinates first or the damages would have been massive. The announcer informs him that their casualty count is too high because they have lost 8 ships and over 100 people died in the last attack. Ji Xuan calls him by his name Kuan and he informs Kuan that it's no big deal because things like humans can always be replaced easily. The men under him get a bit afraid after hearing it. Ji Xuan further says that it is troubling that they broadcasted everything here instead of editing the images but it is necessary to spread glorious rumors far and wide in order for their Lord General of Heaven to be able to return to the mainland. Liu Wei left a sarcastic comment about their general after they got beaten up by Song Wu. Kuan says that they should just show them their prowess by making a comeback. Ji Xuan compliments Kuan as he tells him that they will restart their streaming after cutting off the head of the necromancer. Ji Xuan calls Huei to come forward. Ji Xuan orders him to prepare a mini game. Huei needs to infiltrate the Ganghua Island to register a mini game in order to kill the necromancer. Ji Xuan asks him if he is confident enough to infiltrate the island, and Huei says that it is easy for a seafarer like him. 
He further informs Jishuan that even if the necromancer can keep his eye on the skies, he still cannot catch them under the sea. The players of the island are gathered on the shore. Song Wu arrives there and everyone congratulates him for roughing up the pirates. Song Wu is thinking that it is not the time to celebrate such a small victory, because the pirates are a bigger group than what he expected. Just the advanced fleet of their Lord General of Earth consists of more than a thousand people and their main fleet will be around 3,000, while they are only 800 people on his side who came to help them after the war with the orcs ended. Song Wu can't even fathom the number of players their main fleet consists of. Plus, China is a big country, so a lot of people died there when the game started, but a lot of people also survived because of their great numbers. Li Miyun informs Song Wu that they have finished preparing the transport to Ganghua Island while he was busy with the pirates. With that said, they start moving toward the Ganghua Island to stop the advance of those pirates. The next morning, Song Wu is patrolling the skies for any hostile activity. There are about 258 survivors from the Gyodong Island, but only 100 of them can fight. This is because most of them died during the first pirate invasion and in times of an all-out war, the numbers really matter. Song Wu tells Li Muyun to get as many people as he can to be assigned as lookouts. Song Wu further informs him that the enemy could attack them just like how he attacked them recently. Plus, he can't fight on his own, but it requires numbers to have lookouts. Li Muyun informs Song Wu that Ganghua Island is quite big, but his underlings suggest that they should use everyone besides the kids. Song Wu says that it will be impossible to block them, but they need to know when the fleet approaches the island as soon as possible. The kids are motivated to protect their island as well and some of them say they can fight too because they are on level 3 and they have lynched some goblins by themselves in the past. But Han Ho tells them that they are too young for it. The Griffin Rider informs Sung Wu that they are the family members of the people killed by the pirates. Those children saw their parents being murdered in front of them. So that's why they are in an uproar right now. Ji Siyun says that he can understand their emotions, but if a point comes where children have to fight, then that means they have already lost the fight. Sung Wu inquires about the location of the blacksmith shops from the Griffin Rider. Sung Wu summons his orc skeleton carrying items from the abyss as he needs to get ready for the upcoming invasion. After some time, the squad of Hue arrives on the shore of Ganghua Island. They are relieved after finally arriving safely at their destination. Hue orders everyone to gather up as they will be entering the forest after wearing their camouflage cloaks. After wearing the cloaks, they start heading toward the forest. Sometime later, they arrive at the location where they need to install something. One of his men asks him if they are really going to use that item in here because it seems like a waste to him. Hue informs them that other islands of the mainland used items two ranks higher than this one. Their enemies had larger numbers but they were crushed after losing to this game. This item is a special mid-rank minigame generator. After planting this flag, the area will be designated as a minigame area, causing a total of three plots to be formed as occupied territories. Different buffs will be granted each time a territory is taken over. Once they captured all territories, they will be tilted as the territory lord and a large buff will be granted to them. Hue tells them that he also thinks that there is no need to use this item in here because it can be used to give them an advantage while dealing with a larger group. But it looks the General of Earth is making sure they don't lose to the Necromancer this time. Hue plants the flag and he yells the game will now begin. The system scans the area of the Korean server and the game will take place at Ganghua Island in the Korean server. Everyone gets a notification that a minigame has been activated in their area. Three random areas will be designated as A, B, and C territories. A large buff will be granted to the one who controls all territories, plus the event will be destroyed within 15 minutes. Sung Woo and his party become shocked after hearing about the details of this event. Li Muyun calls the walkie-talkie of the Griffin Rider to inform Sung Woo that they have spotted pirate ship. He further states that it's a container ship and they are quickly approaching the south side of the island. Song Wu is thinking that something is fishy because the pirates are approaching them as soon as the minigame started like they were just waiting for this moment. The Griffin Rider receives another report from the lookout that some pirate ships are preparing to land in the west side of the island. Now Sohan is completely sure that this was all pre-planned by the pirates. Suddenly, they receive a system message that Territory C is being designated near them. The teammates of Song Wu are a bit confused as to what they should do in this situation. Song Wu is not sure what is going on, but he tells them that the key to winning this is to control all three territories. That's why the pirates are trying to push through with their numbers. Ji Su Yun asks Sohan as to what they should do, and Sohan says that he needs some time to gather his thoughts because he is not that much good at games. Han Ho starts laughing as he tells them that they don't need to worry about anything. They can simply win this game with the help of a pro gamer like him. 
we are given a little bit of an overview of the feats of Han Ho. People say that he picked the one-star cards because they had girl figures on them. They also believe that he was the worst character because of his wrong choices during the early part of the game. Sung Woo is skeptical about his ability. After taking into account the recent decisions of Han Ho, he seems like a noob. Han Ho shouts at Sung Woo and he says how can a guy who has never spent a night at the internet cafe because he had no friends judge him? These words hit Sung Woo at heart and the others try to cheer him up. Han Ho explains that he was bad at cards and gacha games. That's why he made poor choices at the start, but he is quite good at games like these. Sung Woo knows that the attendance of Han Ho at the college campus was lower than his attendance at the internet cafe, so he asks him what they can do in order to win this game. After some time, Sung Woo and Ji Seon are flying through the island with their wyverns. They spot B territory flag, which is the midpoint between the other two occupied territories of Ganghua Island. Han Ho is the one who told them that they have better mobility than the pirates because of wyverns, so they should start by taking over the closest base. Normally, in a game, there would be monsters around the base, but they don't see any monsters around the B territory. A system notification pops up which says they have started capturing a territory and it cannot be paused in the middle. Another notification pops up which tells them that 100 seconds are left until the territory becomes captured. All summon units will be unable to move and they can't attack anyone during this time. Han Ho even predicted that they will need to capture the flag by either solving a puzzle or through holding the point for a certain period of time. Sung Woo thinks Han Ho is quite good at these games. Ji Seon gets ready as Sung Woo can't move until the timer is up, and there is a high possibility that they can be ambushed. After some time, Ji Seon notices some movement around them. Han Ho already told them that the pirates have a larger number so they will try to capture all three bases at once. Some pirates appear near the B territory and they came here after using a teleportation item. 71 seconds are left until the territory is captured. The pirates start rushing toward both of them after spotting as they know if the timer is up, they cannot hold their ground against Sung Woo. Ji Seon gets ready to take them all on by herself. Ji Seon rushes toward them as she needs to hold them back for as long as possible. Ji Seon slashes two of them in one strike and she receives 10,000 gold for each of them. Ji Seon keeps on rampaging through the pirates as they try to swarm her from all sides. No matter how hard the pirates try, they cannot stop her advance even with their numbers. The pirates on the back think that she is a monster, and another pirate suggests that they should first deal with the necromancer. Some pirates rush towards Song Wu while the rest of them try to hold Ji Su back. The pirates are almost close to Song Wu, but Ji Seun activates tracking footprint skill on time. It is a skill which uses heightened senses to grasp the movement of the opponent. It allows the user to be able to reach the opponent location in an instant. It can be activated as long as the user knows about the enemy movement. As they are about to attack Sung Woo, Ji Seon appears behind them and she butchers them with ease. The remaining pirates start gathering together so they can take her on at once. With that said, all of them start leaping toward her in unison. Meanwhile, on the other side of the island, Kuan reports to Ji Xuan that their preparation for the battle are complete. Ji Xuan tells them that they will be heading towards base A, which is closest to them. Ji Xuan is thinking that he has a lot of soldiers under his command. The basics of war strategy is to always maintain a stronger and larger number of troops than the opponent. He might have become only a cannon shooter in this apocalyptic world, but this land monopoly game is what he is most confident in, since his dream when he was younger was to become a pro Baduk player. He wanted to be someone who can move and monopolize the wooden game board using the game pieces. But when he grew up, he realized the path to becoming a pro Baduk player was long and difficult. So, the end of the world was a new chance for him who had given up on life. Since their Lord General of Heaven is an amazing person, he has no time to focus on the small things. That's why he is the one who is moving the main army in his place. He says it's a shame for the player of this small country to face him after barely struggling to survive against the monsters. All of a sudden, a notification pops up which tells them that the point B has been taken over by the enemy. So buffs have been granted to their enemy and they cannot recapture the territory for 5 minutes. Another notification pops up which informs them that the defense of their enemies has increased by 30% and their stamina stat has been increased by 5%. Kuan becomes startled as the point B was taken so quickly and Ji Xuan tells him to not worry because he already predicted that they will lose at least one point to the enemy. He further says that this is as far as those Koreans who don't have a lot of soldiers can get with the luck. But he gets interrupted by another notification which informs them that point A has been taken over by their enemy as well. Now Koreans have 4 buffs in total with a 20% increase in attack and an additional 5% increase in strength stats. Ji Xuan becomes pissed as he inquires about what is going on and how they lost 2 points so fast. But Kuan tells him he also has no idea how they lost 2 points so quickly. 
Ji Xuan is really angry as he's wondering whether the Koreans already knew about the rules of this game. But there is no way it is possible because that item was a reward they got after completing a special quest. Kuan says that they don't have time to be thinking like this, and Ji Xuan says he is right, because they have a large advantage in numbers. Ji Xuan orders them to use a detached squad to aim for another base while they recapture the nearest base A, and they will march toward base C after that. Without wasting any time, all of them start rushing toward base A. Kuan orders everyone to stop as they spot something unusual. There are a lot of monsters dead bodies piled upon each other on their way. Ji Xuan knows these bodies can explode as they can be a trap set up by the necromancer. Ji Xuan orders his men to not take any risks and move around the dead bodies. But they come to a stop after witnessing more dead bodies on other paths as well. Ji Xuan is bursting with anger as things are getting out of hand. He orders the mages to burn the dead bodies with their fire magic. Explosion starts bursting throughout the jungles on Ganghua Island as the pirates are trying to move aggressively toward their target. The Griffin Rider is worried because the pirates will start heading toward them once their dead bodies are destroyed. And Hanho tells her to not worry because he already expected this to happen. Hanho used those dead bodies like an observational tower. Even without a magic drone, they will know the location of the pirates throughout the exploding sounds. It's an obvious trick, but it will work as the pirates have no choice but to destroy the dead bodies because they have fear of corpse explosion. And in the process of doing so, they will waste a lot of mana. If things don't work while piling up the monster corpses, then they can just give up the base and run away. The Griffin Rider says that they will not be able to win the game if they lose all bases. And Hanho signs after saying that she's a noob, that's why she can't understand these things. Hanho is sparkling with confidence and he says this kind of game is played not to win, but to piss off the opponents. He points toward the jungle and he says that they have a lot of soldiers anyway. Even if they lose one or two bases, they just need to keep the balance without having any losses on their side. He further elaborates that the rest will depend on Han Ho and Ji Siyun who are their main strength in this fight, while he is the brain. After a lot of struggle, they barely manage to arrive at the base A. They see Han Ho standing near the point A and one of them informs others that he is the party member of the necromancer. Han Ho congratulates all of them for the hard work they did in order to get there. He then starts mocking them by saying that they wasted their resources in burning all of those monster dead bodies as they didn't knew that Sungwoo was not even here in the first place. Han Ho is trying to mentally break them down with his words as the more emotional they get, the more worse it will be for them. Ji Xuan screams at Han Ho as to how dare he try to compare with his intelligence and he calls Han Ho a midget. Hano says that Ji Xuan is pissed because he can't do anything to this midget as most of his time is spent in burning those corpses. Ji Xuan screams back at him by saying that how dared he talk to his elders like this and he further questions the etiquettes of the East Asian countries. Ji Xuan orders his men to kill Han Ho and Han Ho starts retreating from the point A. Ji Xuan is pissed because he could not get his hands on the midget Han Ho but they still got a base from the enemy. He asks the other team about how much time they are going to take in order to capture the sea base. Huey informs them that he is at the sea base but the necromancer is there as well so he will contact him again after dealing with him. Huey is quite confident in taking down Sung Woo as he's busy capturing the flag and his units are standing still. Huey and his team members start rushing towards Sung Woo at full speed so they can take care of him before he can completely occupy the sea base. Meanwhile, Sung Woo is thinking this Chinese party consists of only idiots because Sung Woo is just holding a fake flag and they would have gotten a notification that someone is capturing the sea base if it was a real one. On the other side, Huey is quite happy because he will get a big promotion and a word of appreciation from the Lord General of Heaven after this. All of a sudden, all of them receive a message that sea base is still unoccupied. Sung Woo starts smirking as he knows it's already too late for them and they have fallen in his trap. The pirates shout at each other to retreat but it's too late for them as the summons of Sung Woo have already started to grind them to pieces. Sung Woo is hesitant to compliment Han Ho because he will get cocky after hearing it but this strategy to use a fake flag was also suggested by him. He also suggested another strategy to capture the flag while hiding under the ground. Huey gets surrounded from all sides with the summons of Sung Woo and he orders them to kill all of them so he can easily capture the flag without any worry. Huey in despair uses a lot of summoning circles. Some sea monsters along with a lot of water come out of the circles and the area around them gets flooded in an instant. The whole area became covered in seawater giving Sung Woo and his minions no chance to escape. After some time the water starts disappearing and the sea monsters can't survive without water for long. 
Pue and his team members survived the flood by using masks to breathe under the water and they are thinking that they got the necromancer for good this time. Hue says that it will take some time for the sea creatures to completely die out, but they should have destroyed the minions and the necromancer in this time. Hue and his team members have a rank 2 synergy called the Marine Boys. It's a defensive synergy which requires the team to wear 20 or more swimsuit type armors. It increases underwater endurance by 10% and it allows the party members to move freely underwater or on wet land. Hue orders his men to find the dead body of Necromancer and if he is alive, then he must be barely hanging on to his life and they can finish him off with ease. Sungwoo is flying right above them and he tells them that they have no need to find him. The seafarers become alerted as they were not expecting this outcome. Sungwoo made it out safely because of instant teleportation skill of his Shadow King's bracelet and his wyvern was on standby near them. This bracelet is a legendary item and it increases strength, stamina, and dexterity by 3 points. It can teleport the user to a nearby shadow within a radius of 100 meters after infusing it with magic. Hue orders his men to attack Sungwoo as most of his minions are already dead and the necromancer without his minions is quite useless. Plus, they can move freely on this wet ground. They start throwing javelins at Sungwoo and his wyvern. Sungwoo is getting pumped up and he creates a lot of bone spears. He throws the bone spears at the monster fishes down below. After killing them, Sungwoo turns them all into his minions. Sungwoo is thinking that these skeleton fishes are the best monsters on wetland and they cannot die due to less water because they only consist of bones. The fishes start gulping the seafarers and Hue tells Sungwoo to face them by himself like a man. Hue spots a magic drone of Kuan flying over Sungwoo. Hue contacts Ji Xuan to request backup. Ji Xuan tells him that it's a shame because his team's contribution to their cause was great after they were pushed out of the mainland. Ji Xuan further says that they will create a new team after this to replace Hue and he says that his final moments will be of great help to them for analyzing the power of the necromancer. Hue keeps begging for help but Ji Xuan is a lunatic and he cuts off their connection. Ji Xuan was able to learn more about the necromancer in detail through this encounter. The death of his subordinates is a big loss but he still benefited from this by learning that the necromancer can refill his ranks very easily. They will hold off on overtaking base C where necromancer is right now. In the meantime, they will prepare a thorough defense line at base A, then attack base C after passing through base B, plus a part of their army is already attacking base B. They don't need to worry about the corpse explosion as Necromancer is at base C and they will take care of Midget Han Ho and the Korean players who are occupying base B. Ji Xuan contacts the team assigned on capturing the base B for the report. The team leader informs Ji Xuan that there are monsters in base B and he's looking quite terrified. The two monsters he's referring to turns out to be Han Ho and Ji Su Yun who are rampaging through their ranks. He makes his last report to the Lord General of Earth as Han Ho of the North Star approaches him. Ji Xuan gets angry after suffering another loss and he flips the table with the laptop. Ji Xuan still can't believe he just lost another major battle as he thinks his strategy was foolproof. Kuan is quite worried and he asks him what is going to happen to them. And Ji Xuan orders all soldiers to retreat so they can reorganize their plan. Meanwhile, on the other side, Ji Si Yun and Han Ho just finish off the last pirate on base B. The Griffin Rider and the Islanders are quite happy as both of them have finished a whole squadron of pirates by themselves without suffering any casualty. The Griffin Rider says that Han Ho is quite strong unlike the rumors which say that he uses the necromancer to climb the ranks and Han Ho becomes more cocky as his pride pierces through the roof after hearing it. Hano asks her about who is spreading these rumors that he is carried by the necromancer and the griffin rider says she has no idea about it. Ji Si Yun asks Hano about what they should do next or they should just use the same strategy again and again to lower the numbers of pirates. Hanho tells her that same strategy will not work every single time and they should just wrap things up. He further tells her that stalling for time is good for a game but when people don't see results quickly they start getting lame. But that's not the type of game they are playing right here. The pirates can have items that can change the whole situation in an instant and there are way too many variables which is why they need to finish this whole ordeal before the pirates can come up with a new counter. Everything Han Ho just said was transmission to Sung Woo on the walkie talkie and he asks Sung Woo if there are any questions. Sung Woo says there are no questions as everything Han Ho just said makes complete sense in this situation. Han Ho tells Sung Woo to make this a sure win by wiping them out with his overwhelming power. The magical drone is still following Sung Woo. Kuan, who is using the drone, informs Ji Xuan that the necromancer is flying toward their current location. Ji Xuan says the necromancer must have gone insane because he has an army, but it's nothing compared to their numbers. 
The other drone users inform Ji Xuan that it's not only the Necromancer as the other Korean players who are at base B are heading their way as well. No matter how much Ji Xuan thinks about it, he cannot understand why the Korean players just abandon their base because they can occupy them easily by sending a detachment. Even if the Koreans are stronger, they still cannot win against the pirates after getting their buffs stolen. And he is thinking maybe the necromancer who is on number 2 in the Korean ranks is their strategist. He orders his men to play the magic drone transmission live in TV in front of him. He's thinking maybe the Korean players just got lucky up to this point, because they are now making irrational decisions. He sent some men to capture a base, but there are still some skeletons protecting that base. His men reports back that they are being attacked by giant skeletons and they are being overpowered by them. Ji Xuan is thinking that the summoned creatures will disappear, or they won't be able to move once their distance from their summoner increases, and he's thinking to wait a little bit more, so the distance between the necromancer and his minions can increase. Plus, they have a lot more teleport scrolls left, and he keeps on teleporting more men to base C after some time. The pirates become alerted after watching something. It turns out to be a big mech unit, and the pirate complained that the necromancer is cheating in a fantasy setting. Song Wu named this unit the legendary hero Necrogen. The pirates never heard about anything like that before and an otaku pirate tells them that they are up against a legendary hero which makes them the evil group. One of the pirates informs other that this one is not a gold mech unit. It looks similar in appearance but it's made from mud. They start attacking it after saying that it's not a legendary hero. Golems can move on its own and follow the order it had previously received despite being far from its creator. The pirates are quite happy because the golem is breaking down quite easily, but all of a sudden, a pirate gets caught by it and yell out that the golem is healing. The pirate yells out that the legendary hero has caught a hostage. The mech unit talks and it tells them that there is no need for this machine with overwhelming specs to hold inferior organisms hostage. He informs them that his mission is to protect base C, and for the sake of his mission, he must get rid of all inferior organisms. Necrogen shoots out a big energy wave using a lot of mana which blasts away most of the pirates. The only flaw of this mech unit is that it needs a lot of mana. But Sung Woo can never run out of mana in the battlefield, so he is almost unstoppable. Sung Woo has his legendary Chaos Crystal, which gives the bearer Chaos attribute causing their mana to increase by 500, and it restores mana by 250%. It steals mana and health while attacking by 3%, making this item the best fit for a mage type player. Ji Xuan, who is watching all of it through the magical drone, can't believe that his troops are getting slapped quite hard by the necromancer. Ji Xuan is thinking that all of the information that they have gathered isn't right at all. He is thinking that maybe someone spread false information about him all over Korea to make him look like weak. He promised his Lord General of Heaven that he will be victorious in here, but everything is gone wrong. The giants are ripping through the ranks of pirates and the pirate unit leader orders his men to prepare ice magic. The ice mages freezes their limbs with their ice spells. Death Knight and Righty jump over their location as it's time for them to get their hands dirty. After landing, they start ripping the pirates to shreds. Ji Xuan orders his men to target the necromancer because all of his minions will die automatically after his death. The pirates are wearing the same uniform for a reason as it gives them a defensive synergy which increases all of their stats by 2. The pirates are thinking that with all of their stat bonuses they will be able to get rid of the necromancer. Some of them spot the necromancer and they tell their fellow members to attack him in unison. They start rushing toward him in unison as they think they can overwhelm Sung Woo with their numbers. But Sung Woo easily slashes through most of them with his grim reaper scythe. The whole area becomes red with the blood of the pirates who attacked him head on. Songu informs them that he is weaker compared to most of his minions, but in his Grim Reaper mode, he is completely unstoppable. In Grim Reaper mode, Songu can utilize the power of a Lich, which increases maximum number of his minions by 50, and it increases all of his stats by 10. He can also regenerate nearby destroyed undead as many times as the maximum number of units in his party. Songu is not much suited for using the scythe as a weapon, but it increases his stats by 10, which is a huge boost. Ji Xuan, who is watching all of it live, is trembling with fear. Ji Xuan asks Kuan if he's streaming everything live, and Kuan informs him that he is streaming everything that is being broadcasted on his laptop screen. Ji Xuan yells at him to stop the live stream as he is advertising their revolutionary army getting wrecked by a single person. He tells Kuan to change the channel to base B and their drones start heading toward base B to record what's going on there. He further tells Kuan that they need to shoot some scenes to boost the morale of their soldiers. 
He sent Hei Rang to recapture the base B. Hei Rang wasn't as active as Huei when it came to the pirate activities, but it's a different story for battles like these. The drone shows them the live footage of base B and it looks like it's being protected by a single woman. Kuan is doing live commentary for the stream to boost the morale of their soldiers. He informs others that Hei Rang is a strong man known as the Black Master, so it's going to be a one-sided fight. There are currently 100,000 Chinese people watching this stream, so he needs to highlight the most famous scenes from this stream. When he zooms in a little bit more, he finds out that all of their men have already fallen in battle and the dead body of Hei Rang is lying there as well. All of a sudden, Ji Xun senses the presence of a drone and she cuts it into two pieces with a single slash attack. Ji Xun orders them to quickly stop this stream as it will only make their soldiers to lose morale. At the same time, the pirates on base C are barely holding on. They are thinking they will soon receive the buff from base B because Hei Rang went there to recapture it. One of the pirates who was watching the stream during the fight informs other pirates at base C that their strongest fighter, Hei Rang, just died. The soldiers are losing their morale at a faster rate and this whole game was set up by them in the first place, but they are losing it badly. Ji Xuan can't take it anymore and he starts heading toward the necromancer by himself. He starts blasting away all minions on his way with the help of his ice cannon. He is challenging Sung Wu to come out to face him like a man. After getting rid of some minions, he spots Sung Wu in the distance. He starts preparing to shoot Sung Wu without wasting any more of his time. Finally, he shoots the cannon which directly hits Sung Wu. But after some time, they find out that he blocked the ice cannon with a bone shield. But Ji Xuan can feel like it was not completely blocked as he can hear a squeaking sound coming from his body. Ji Xuan keeps on bombarding him with ice cannon shots to turn him into an ice sculpture. Han Ho appears from behind a bush and he starts mocking Ji Xuan. Ji Xuan bursts with anger as he thinks this midget Han Ho is responsible for causing his military power to falter from the beginning. He diverts his attacks toward Han Ho, but Han Ho easily dodges them without paying much attention to them. The projection of Sung Wu disappears from the distance and he appears right behind Ji Xuan and he tells him that he should have never turned away from his enemy. With that said, Sung Wu slashes him into two with his scythe. Sung Wu informs him that it must be painful but he should smile because he is on camera right now. Ji Xuan is thinking that he ordered Kuan to stop streaming but Kuan tells him that he is sorry. But he had no other choice but to stream the whole thing for their Lord General of Heaven who is on the walkie talkie right now. Their Lord General of Heaven says that it seems Ji Xuan has failed. But Ji Xuan is still stubborn and he says that he can still win with the remaining soldiers. The Lord General of Heaven says that it's a shame that Ji Xuan failed but he is satisfied with this current situation. Since it allowed him to learn so much about the real abilities of the necromancer and his companions. So it can also be called a gain. And then he repeats the same words of Ji Xuan that a chess piece like him can always be replaced. Song Wu has heard enough, so he kills all pirates around him. Song Wu says he is sorry to interfere in his transmission, but it's time for him to finish the game. He further says that if he still thinks Korea is a free honeypot, then he can personally come over as Song Wu will always be here to greet him. Meanwhile, on the other side of the island, the pirates are fighting against the island residents. The pirates are winning against the players due to their large numbers. A pirate kicks a player with all of his force. He then gets ready to kill the player because the game gives more rewards for killing human players instead of monsters. But soon, he comes to a stop after hearing a system announcement that says point A has been captured by Korean team and buffs will be granted to them. A total of 8 huge buffs are then granted to the Korean players all over the island. The Korean weak player who is about to get killed grabs the hand of the pirate. He is overflowing with power and the pirate tries to beg him for his life. The Korean players are overpowering the Chinese players and they seem unstoppable. Meanwhile, on the other side of the island, Song Wu has finally taken control over all three points of the island. Song Wu says that these buffs are too much overpowered for a minigame and he cannot understand why they ran away from the mainland while they had this much of a powerful item. A notification pops up which informs them that the minigame will conclude in 8 hours and Sung Woo says that 8 hours are more than enough to finish things in here. In the afternoon, most of the pirates on the island have been either killed or captured by the Korean players. The Korean players are looking motivated as they landed a huge blow to the Chinese pirates. One of the Chinese pirates is announcing on a mic that everything is over, except for the few who ran towards the ships. Their entire fleet was annihilated. 
Sungwoo was thinking that after watching this stream, Chinese players will hesitate a bit before messing with Koreans, but the chat is filled with praises of the emperor from Chinese server number one, who is rumored to have controlled over 400 units in a single battle. And most people say that Sungwoo is a bit similar to their emperor. Songwoo is curious to know who this emperor is, so he asks the announcer about it. The announcer informs him that he is the winner of Server 1. He is based in Shaanxi and Beijing, and he claims to be an emperor. He asks the announcer why people are saying that he is like the emperor, and the announcer informs him that the emperor can also summon units like him. Songwoo is thinking that most 5-star classes specialize in leading groups. The Vampire Lord used to do it by infecting players, and the Prosecutor does it by training other players, and the Lord General of Heaven uses brainwashing to control players. But Songwoo is a bit different from others as he summons dead bodies instead of players, and people are still calling him similar to the Emperor. Songwoo inquires about the class of the Emperor and the announcer has no idea about it. It turns out the strongest players in China are doing their best to hide their powers while Songwoo was just forced to reveal everything on these live streams. At the same time, Hanho starts screaming with joy as he found an item on the body of the Lord General of Earth. This item turns out to be a heroic rank 3rd stage dwarven made hand cannon. It can load bullets by just inserting 10 mana into it. Since there are two hand cannons, Hanho gifts one to Raidi, and Raidi's eyes start brimming with cuteness. Hanho throws the other handmade cannon towards Songwoo as he is not good with using mana, and Ji Seon is a swordsman, so it's pretty useless for both of them. Hanho and Raidi then start scavenging the corpses for some useful items. Songwoo revives Ji Xuan to check if he can see his memory fragments. Luckily, he receives a message that he can check his memory fragments, and he gets teleported into his memory space with a bright flash of light. Back in time, the main ship of the pirates was moving through the ocean. Ji Xuan, along with his top brass, was having a meeting inside a room. Hue says that a statue of an angel was recently found, and before it, there was a devil statue found in Server 1. Quan gets too much excited after hearing it and he starts showering them with questions like if they have finally gotten a hint about an absolute race. He further asks them about the effects and abilities of these statues. Sung Woo just remembered now that angels and devils were a part of future updates. Ji Xuan informs them that their Lord General of Heaven came in contact with the statue and it granted him a quest but he has not mentioned the details to Ji Xuan. Quan says that he is the brain of this rebellion so he must know something and Sung Woo is also curious to know more details about it. Ji Xuan informs them that the Lord General of Heaven said that he will explain it in detail after they overtake Seoul and they should first focus on their mission. Ji Xuan informs them that after taking over the Ganghua Island through the minigame, Huei team will sneak into Seoul and use this scroll. All of them get shocked after hearing it, as this item is the infamous Demon's Door. Ji Xuan says they are right, and if they use this item, the Demon's Door will stay open for 24 hours and all sorts of monsters will pop out of it. The monsters will disappear after 24 hours, but it's enough time to ravage the entire region. And if they're lucky enough, they might be even able to enter Seoul without suffering a single casualty. It's normally an item for opening a hidden dungeon, but since its difficulty is too high, they will use this legendary scroll in their strategy. Kwan says that it seems like a waste to use both minigame and demon door in the Korean server, but Ji Xuan tells him that investing this much is nothing. As long as they can control Korea, they can suck up all the goodies to their heart's content, and he is sure that's what their Lord General of Heaven is thinking right now. With that said, the flashback ends and Sungwoo gets teleported back into the real world with a bright flash of light. Sungwoo is thinking that all other memory fragments that he has viewed up until now showed him ways to solve various problems and he don't know what was the point of this memory fragment. The only thing he can do now is to find the scroll and it might be in one of their containers. The Griffin Rider returns back to Sung Woo after the reconnaissance. She informs Sung Woo that the pirates are turning back toward China right now, and there are still a lot of pirates left on the deck of their main fleet. Sung Woo is thinking that there are still some hours left until the minigame ends, and the pirate ships won't be able to leave the coast yet. The Griffin Rider further informs him that there are always a few mages on standby on deck who are keeping the shields up, and they are thinking of leaving right after the minigame ends. The mages have casted a huge shield around their ships, and it's difficult for the undead to infiltrate because it's on water. After some time, Sung Woo remembers that he had gotten his hands on a useful card which can come in handy in this situation. After some time, the night falls and the mages are still on deck of the ship. One of the pirates says that it's too quiet, and another pirate warns them to not let their guard down as their enemies will attack them right after the game ends. They can escape this hellish Korean peninsula as long as they can endure it. 
They spot Sung Woo and his minion birds rushing toward them from a distance. This time, Han Ho and the Griffin Rider are also present there, and they seem quite offensive. The pirates on deck start running to grab mana potions for their mages so they can keep their large shield intact. The pirate captain says that the undead soldiers and the corpse explosion won't be able to affect them on top of the water. The Griffin Rider says that they are trying to endure it for as long as they can, and breaking the shield will waste a lot of mana. Sung Woo tells her that it will be impossible to infiltrate the ship from the top, so he needs to find out if they placed shields under the water. The pirates notice that something is coming at them from under the water. After coming closer to the ship, the fishes jump out of the ocean. All fishes have orc skeletons in their mouths, which are looking like mermaids. After landing on the ship, they start balloting it out against the pirates. All of a sudden, a big water splash appears behind the orcs. Sung Woo is looking quite pumped up as he already hunted a new type of monster before coming here. Sung Woo orders the monster to come out and it turns out to be a big sea serpent which is quite rare. A sea serpent is an underwater monster that is at least 10 meters long. It took just an hour to hunt this sea serpent and it is a young sea serpent in the first place. Sung Woo was barely able to kill it while continuously reviving his minions during the whole fight. The shield of the pirate starts blinking as it is losing power over time. The pirates think that these orcs are manageable and they can get rid of them in a while but another figure appears on their deck. This figure turns out to be Ji Su Yun who is known as Red Devil among the Chinese pirates. Ji Su Yun without wasting any time starts getting rid of the pirates. The Griffin Rider says that it is almost game over for the pirates and Sung Woo tells her to head down. After clearing the pirates from the ship, the Korean players head over to it. They start checking and unloading all containers containing good items. Since pirates were thinking of making a base in Korea, they brought a lot of good stuff with them. Han Ho comes out with a lot of extra big chargers and he shows them to everyone. These chargers are quite rare and they can provide power or recharge batteries. Han Ho informs Sung Woo that these chargers were stacked next to the engine room and it looks like they powered this huge ship with these chargers. He informs Sung Woo that they should head over to the captain's quarters as more treasures can be hoarded in there. After making their way inside the captain's quarters, they find a locked safe. Sung Woo bursts open the safe with his raw power which he is getting from the three points he captured as the game is still active. Inside the safe he finds the item he previously saw in the memory fragment. This is a special rank magic scroll called Devil's Door. It can open a Devil's Door for 24 hours. In short, it creates a path to Devil's Lair. The players can obtain extremely rare items by exploring the Devil's Lair, but it is not recommended to rush inside because this path goes both ways and the things inside can also come out. And the recommended level for this item is 35. Sung Woo thinks that this recommended level is too high. That's why they didn't clear it themselves and plan to unleash it in the Korean server. Sung Woo is thinking that if the level of danger is so high, then the rewards must be good as well. But he also remembers how he barely survived his last secret dungeon and he is still on level 18. Sung Woo stores it as it is impossible to clear it right now and Ji Seon finds something else inside the safe. She finds a bank type special item called Oath Safe. It's an item that allows a portion of the gold earned by contracted players to be automatically deposited. Players can register a contract by placing their palm on top of this safe. The owner of the safe can set a collection rate and the gold that the contractor earns is automatically deposited into the safe according to the corresponding percentage. Its current collection rate is 80% and the number of contracts are 56 and the gold balance is over 13 million. Sungwoo is thinking that this is a crucial item to manage a group. They can rent it out or sell it to their allies as it is going to be quite pricey. At the same time, they get a notification that the minigame risk has came to an end with the victory of the Koreans. And now rewards will be given to them. All players start receiving their rewards which are quite generous. Sungwoo got a total of 1.5 million gold as a reward for the minigame. His level has increased up to 19 and his stats have increased at an exponential rate. Sungwoo selects a random skill card as his level up reward. Sungwoo gets a basic crafting deadly poisonous cloud skill. It requires 30 mana and it creates a cloud containing deadly poison which sprinkles toxic rain on the area for 10 minutes and its cooldown is 1 hour. Sung Woo is thinking that he got a good area skill that doesn't negatively affect his summons and these foolish pirates prove to be a treasure trove for them. The next day, everything is moved into their temporary base. Han Ho tells them that it is time for the strongest rogue to read comments and that is going to be the summary of today's news. Sung Woo and Ji Si show fake excitement reactions and Han Ho tells them that their reactions suck. The first news is that the Metro Union is attracting a lot of attention. 
Upon hearing the news of the establishment of a union, groups of survivors from around the metropolitan area are gathering one after another in Yongdongpo. The Liberation Guild side is intentionally spreading rumors. It's expected that the union will grow bigger in the future. Sungwoo is thinking that the players who have survived up until now are a bit more powerful, and they can protect themselves. The key is to see how the union will utilize these survivors. Hanho tells them that the second news is regarding the Spearman Kyungsu's secret letter. According to him, the average level of the people in the town of Suwon has risen up to 8. Even Kyungsu is bragging about hitting level 11. Meanwhile, Han Ho, who is at the center of all this action, is working his ass off, is still at level 14. Sung Woo and Ji Seon don't think he's doing much hard work, and Han Ho reminds them that they won this recent game due to his brain. Han Ho is thinking of himself as a role model for all one star players, and he recently learned a new shadow skill. Han Ho then moves on to the next big news, which says that the Necromancer has reached level 19, which makes Sung Woo tied for the first place in the rankings with Han Kang Sok. But then Han Ho says he was joking as Han Kang Sok just hit level 20 an hour ago. Han Ho mockingly tells Sung Woo to work harder because he's letting them all down, and Sung Woo gets ready to pop his head out of anger. Ji Su Yun is wondering that Sung Woo is able to deal with a lot of monsters at once because of his minions, which exposes him to a lot of witnesses. But how in the world is Han Kang Sok able to be number one in the rankings without a single person seeing him, and how he has been leveling all this time at such a faster rate? Sung Woo is thinking that maybe Han Kang Sok is hunting more than him, and maybe he's only targeting areas with a lot of monsters and a high level boss. At the same time, Han Ho notices a new sword on the waist of Ji Su Yun. Ji Su informs them that she got this sword after finishing off the strongest fighter of the pirates. It's a heroic rank sword called Ji Num Sword. It can even cut through magic. This sword was created with a rare magical metal called Ji Num, and it is extremely durable. Han Ho says that now she has three swords. She can give one to Raidi, but Ji Seon is showing no signs of giving away her swords. After some time, the whole Gangwa Island is quite peaceful, and there are some guards stationed outside the main building. All of a sudden, they spot a helicopter heading toward their location. Song and his party arrive at the landing site. Min Hum Song pops out with some crusaders, and he congratulates Song Woo and his party for their marvelous victory against the pirates. Sung Woo thanks him for the compliment and he asks him if there is a reason for his sudden visit. And Min Hum Sung informs him that something unexpected has happened. It turns out ranker number one Han Kang Sok has appeared. Sung Woo asks him by appeared does he mean that Han Kang Sok came to Yongdong Po? And Min Hua Song replies with a yes. He further informs Sung Woo that Han Kang Sok requested one thing from them. He said he wanted to meet the second ranked necromancer. He further said that Song Woo is a crucial figure to the fate of Korea. He might be number one, but he was too rude. He said that there was nothing for him to talk with the Crusaders and he won't say a thing until the necromancer arrives. Song Woo tells Min Hum Song to inform Kang Sok to wait a bit more. Song Woo needs to stop by the blacksmith store since he hadn't enough time before the strength in his items. Min Hum says that it is a request from the number one ranker and it can cause some complications in the future. Sung Woo tells that even if he is number one, it doesn't mean they should do everything he says. The union has just been established, so they need some sort of focal point. Sung Woo starts leaving after giving a message for Han Kang Sok to wait. Min Hum Song is thinking that it is turning into a staring contest between the two rankers and he's feeling like a shrimp stuck in a whale fight. After some time, Min Hua Song is looking over things at their headquarters. A messenger comes running and he informs her that Min Hum Song just contacted them. He forwarded a message from the necromancer who told them to wait since he had business to take care of. Min Hua Song sent him on this mission since she was annoyed seeing him play around so much, but he couldn't accomplish such a simple task. The messenger tells her to relax as Min Hum Song is a nice guy and he will convince the necromancer somehow. They get alerted after hearing the voice of the prosecutor who tells them that they have no choice but to wait. The prosecutor is getting more agitated as Han Kang Sok was someone who was always above him even before Song Woo surpassed him. And he is a person who he always wanted to meet once, but now he cannot even meet him because he keeps getting a notification that an unknown energy is encroaching the area. This unknown energy is being emitted by Han Kang Sok, who is waiting patiently for the arrival of the necromancer. After some time, a helicopter flies over the vicinity of Yongdongpo. New recruits of Metro Union are excited to see the necromancer who is known as the number one problem solver all around Korea. After the helicopter lands, Sung Woo comes out with his minions and his party members, and it looks like he just upgraded his equipment to the next level. 
The new players around the helipad are quite impressed after watching the second ranker with their own eyes. Han Sok Gu says that Song Wu somehow feels different after he dealt with the pirates, and Gang Yan Li is jealous of Song Wu's new high ranked items. Song Wu is carrying the newly upgraded dwarf refitted crossbow flames in his hand. It's a legendary rank crossbow. It increases its user dexterity by 3 and it grants bonus item damage of 30%. This weapon can be fired without reloading and if mana is used as its bullets, then it can shoot fire arrows for 1 minute. Song Wu is wearing Shadow King's robe, also known as Dragon Scale. It's a legendary equipment which decreases magic damage by 10%. It increases fire resistance by 30 percent and bonus item defense by 30 percent. The user can hide in the shadows, but his presence will be shown once he attacks or the enemy uses a detection skill. Sung Woo is getting pretty intense stares from the new players as some are jealous of him, while most of them look up to him as their hero. Sung Woo previously strengthened the Shadow King's robe with the leather he got after killing the Drake and the crossbow with the dragon's heart. Sung Woo is fully prepared to meet the number one ranker and his stats are looking pretty impressive for a level 19 character as equipment boost is helping his overall stats to rise up by a lot. After the landing, Sung Woo and his crew get escorted in some cars. Han Ho says that their surroundings have changed by a lot in this short span of time and Ji Seon says there are a lot more defensive structures around as well as players. Min Hum Sung informs them that there were more than 6,000 people who came to join them within the last few days and there are even high ranked group representatives among them. But since only the representatives came, the number of their members will increase by a lot if their groups agree to join us. Sung Woo is thinking that the prosecutor must be having it rough these days, but once a solid foundation is set, it will become a huge strength for the reunion. Min Hum Sung points towards something in the distance. There are a lot of camps in that direction with military personnel guarding the premises. Min Hum Sung informs Sung Woo and his party that place is called the Rebuilding Alliance and they are annoying humans. Sung Woo asks him if they are from military and Min Hum Sung replies by saying that not all of them are from military. They are players from Wee Jong Bu and Nam Yang Ju. But since some of them are from military, it looks like they are integrating the northern forces of Gyeonggi with military equipment. It's a big force, so they don't listen to their union, and they are messing around with psychological warfare and political maneuvering. It's more like they are here to stop the union from growing rather than coming here to cooperate with them. Sung Woo asks him if they can be their next opponents, and Min Hum Sung informs him that all novels he read had destructive endings when something like this happened. After a few minutes, they arrive at the new Yongdong Po Guild office, which is looking quite marvelous. They hear a lot of commotion after entering the building. Some guys in suit are forcing their way inside while the Crusaders are trying to stop them, and they are requesting to meet their number one ranker. The Crusaders are trying to politely hold them back, but they keep on forcing them. One of the player in suit tells Min Hum Sung that they should not be stopping players from commuting with each other. The guy in suit says that this injustice is the reason why they are asking for an equal voting body against the union's operating cost policy, so the Yong Dong Po Guild cannot become a dictatorship. Min Hua Song tells him that they cannot do anything because Han Kang Sok is the one who don't want to meet them. The player in suit says that they are trying to monopolize the number one ranker when they already have the necromancer and they coaxed him into fighting the pirates. Sung Woo asks him about what he's talking about and the player gets alerted after seeing Sung Woo in the flesh. They are a bit taken aback by this as they thought it will take him a lot more time to deal with the pirate problem. Sung Woo informs them that he agreed to cooperate with the Yong Dong Po Guild on his own and no one forced him to do anything. The player in suit says that Sung Woo is just misunderstanding something and Sung Woo asks him about this misunderstanding. The player in suit says that he is misunderstanding the fact that he is not doing these things with his own free will. He looks young, that's why others can easily fool him. Sung Woo stares at him for a few seconds and he says that he will give him a piece of advice as he just gave him one. Sung Woo powers up and he tells him to speak well at every given moment. He is very wrong in thinking that his careless words will always be let go in this day and age. All men in suits become afraid after watching Sung Woo's pumped up state. They start leaving after saying that they are not pushovers and their leader tells Sung Woo to think carefully about what he just said to him. Min Hum Sung informs Sung Woo that this is the rebuilding alliance he was previously talking about. They have a leader but the union don't know about his identity and they keep making requests without offering anything in return. Sung Woo tells them to be careful while cooperating with such groups and Min Hum Sung says he is right because bastards like the Evolution Society can infiltrate their ranks using such groups. 
Sungwoo moves ahead on his own as regular members are not allowed any further. When he enters a room, he finds an exhausted prosecutor who tells him that he was waiting for him. Sungwoo says that he's not looking well, and the prosecutor tells him that there is so much work to do as leading a bigger group requires a lot of attention. The prosecutor says that there is a lot more he wants to ask him about the Chinese server, but he needs to meet Han Kang Sok first. He told them that he came here because of something related to the fate of Korea, and prosecutor can't really figure out who he is. Han Kang Sok is something extremely different, and he's not sure if they can call him a human. Han Kang Sok refused to talk to anyone else, so the prosecutor hopes to speak with Sung Woo after his talk with him, since that fate could be something where time is running out. They both come to a stop after a few steps. A powerful wave appears around them, and they get a notification stating that an unknown energy is encroaching their area. Sung Woo gets alerted as he has never heard about anything like this before. Sung Woo asks prosecutor about it, and the prosecutor says that he has no idea about it. Another notification pops up, which says that the unknown energy is causing his body to become intimidated, and all of his stats decrease by one. Sungwoo can barely stand up because of the debuff he just received by approaching the room of Kang Sok. The prosecutor tells him that they need to hurry up as the longer they are affected, the more worse it gets. And at the same time, they get hit with another debuff which decreases their stats by two. The prosecutor opens the door where Han Kang Sok resides, but inside the room, they can only see a faint light over the desks. There is a fairy looking creature eating sweet cakes at the moment. The fairy gets alerted as she sees Sung Woo and the prosecutor asks her about Han Kang Sok. The fairy quickly moves to a room where she informs Han Kang Sok that he has got some guests. The door of the room opens up and they get hit by another debuff, which decreases their stats by four. Finally, Han Kang Sok makes his appearance with the fairy, and the players get hit by another debuff, which decreases their overall stats by five. Sung Woo is thinking that Han Kang Sok feels different, as he has Halo around him, or maybe Sung Woo is just seeing things. Han Kang Sok is surrounded by an unknown energy which seems completely otherworldly. Sung Woo receives another notification which says he has spotted a godhead, and he has the complete qualifications to directly meet a godhead. Sung Woo receives another notification that the powers of a demigod is putting pressure on his power, which in turn decreases all of his stats by seven. Han Kang Sok says to Sung Woo that it looks like he saw it. He says that Sung Woo took a peek at his identity. Sung Woo is thinking that it does not make sense for a first ranker to be a half god. In terms of the system classification, he is a six star class that exceeds even five stars. Sung Woo has no idea what does the system mean when it says demigod. It can simply mean that he is a demigod for real, or maybe it is related to some class, or it can also have some other meaning behind it. The prosecutor went out by himself as he could not stay there for long due to this effect, and Han Kang Sok wanted to meet Sung Woo in the first place. But being with Han Kang Sok is more difficult than what he expected. There is an absolute sense of difference, and it's hard to control the emotions as it fluctuates from curiosity to awe. Han Kang Sok asks Song Wu if he wants a Coke or a Sprite. Song Wu says that he is fine with water, while the fairy says that she needs a Sprite. Han Kang Sok hands over Sprite to her and he tells her to not drink too much. He further says that she might not be able to fly if she drank like last time, but it is already too late as she's drinking it like it's her last drink. Han Kang Sok says that he wanted to meet Song Wu once as he's the biggest star of Korea. Song Wu is thinking that he needs to remain focused as he needs to find out who Han Kang Sok is. First of all, his bracelet and five rings all look like high in rank. Even when he's not armed, anyone can still guess how much good his items are, and the same can be said about Sung Woo for his equipment. Han Kang Sok thanks Sung Woo for coming to see him even when he's so busy. Kang Sok was especially moved by his actions during the Yoido Island raid, and Sean the fairy also liked that fight the most. Sean says her name sucks, as Kang Sok has the worst naming sense, but she agrees with him saying that Yoido Island fight was really awesome. Sean asks if Song Woo can let her ride that bone drake later, and Song Woo asks Kang Sok if Sean is an item. Kang Sok says that he is correct as Sean is an item, but Sean gets angry after they call her a mere item. Kang Sok asks Song Woo if he has ever played Tamagotchi before. Its happiness level goes up if you feed it cake and sprite. He further says that it is the best item to prevent depression. Sean angrily asks Kang Sok about why he called her an item and he will be alone all day without her. Kang Sok tells her that he just said that she's good for preventing depression. Sung Woo asks Kang Sok about the thing he said that will change the fate of Korea. Kang Sok applauds Sung Woo for getting straight to the point, and he starts by explaining about an item he has in his possession. He saw a prophecy through a prophecy crystal by chance during a hunt. It was called Bad Ending Number 15. 
Song Wu's expression changes a little bit, and Kang Sok says that he must have also seen those prophecy crystals before. The bad endings Song Wu saw were an ascension of a lich and the emergence of a world tree. Han Kang Sok informs him that there are some prophecy stones which prophecy begins the moment a player learns about it. All you have to do is to discover that crystal and it will trigger that prophecy. Kang Sok gets to the point and informs him that he accidentally touched a prophecy stone and activated a new prophecy and it was recommended to clear it with a party of level 27. Sung Woo gets shocked after knowing about this hell's door while Kang Sok tells him that level 27 is no problem for him but the main problem is the party play part. Kang Sok pulls out a crystal as it is probably faster to show him than to explain it. After touching it, Sung Woo receives a notification stating that he has come in contact with a prophecy stone of Korean server Bad Ending. Sung Woo's vision fades with a bright flash of light. He appears inside a dark space and it feels like the whole world is enveloped into darkness. After some time, Sung Woo can see Kang Sok along with Sean. Kang Sok finds a prophecy crystal inside the belly of a monster he just slayed. Kang Sok tries to touch the prophecy crystal, but as he was about to touch it, it gets launched up into the sky. The crystal splits the sky and a notification pops up saying that the Hell's Door first floor is opening. Hell Gate opens up in two different places. There are monsters present inside the Hell's Gate who are on fire. Sung Woo is wondering as to why Hell's Door opened up in two places that are far apart. One by one, powerful monsters start pouring out of the gates. These monsters are mostly the fire type and they start wrecking havoc in the nearby cities. In a few minutes, a whole city gets lit on fire. A notification pops up which says that this is the future that will happen if he fails to stop the Hell's Moving Armor from Hell Door. As time passes, the Hell's Moving Armor will absorb the essence of the Earth and release stronger flames. With that being said, the prophecy ends with a bright flash of light. Kang Sok asks Song Woo if he has seen it all and Song Woo replies with a yes. Kang Sok says that maybe this game is trying to destroy their world. He can defeat any type of monster it can throw at him, but that Hell's Moving Armor opened two doors that need to be dealt within a time limit. And if they can't defeat them at the same time, they will just keep on resurrecting. Sung Woo is thinking that Han Kang Sok is a solo player and he thought that Sung Woo will only be able to reach level 27 besides himself. Han Kang Sok further says that those two armors are heading north. They are slowly getting stronger and they will arrive at Yongdong Po in a few weeks. They can think of Kang Sok being the only player who can deal with them. He can just leave the country as well, but he's offering to help them. He will split the rewards in half with Song Wu as well. Song Wu is thinking that Han Kang Sok was the one who touched the crystal, which in turn spawned those two armors, but he's not thinking that he's the main cause of this. It might not be his fault that the prophecy started as soon as he touched the crystal, but his way of saying that he will help is so patronizing. Song Wu asks Kang Sok about the rewards. Han Kang Sok says that he thinks that an unexpected legendary item will be given as a reward. Song Wu says that he is sure that there is going to be only one item and Kang Sok agrees with him, saying that only one of them will be able to take that item. So he asks Song Wu to play a game with him if he is confident enough to win it. Song Wu now knows well about the nature of this guy. Han Kang Sok is enjoying this hell wrecked world. With that being said, Song Wu agrees with his request. After some time, right outside the Yongdong Po main building, Song Wu informs the prosecutor about the things he just talked about with Han Kang Sok. Prosecutor says that one bizarre thing is happening right after another. He really wants to believe that it's all a joke. Min Hua Song says it is true as the report she received from the emergency wide raid scouting team they dispatched says that a group of monsters started fires in the Pyeongtaek and Ansang region and they are now roaming around. The boss monster is an armor type monster and dozens of hellhounds are circling around the area. The real problem is that the places they have passed through have all burned down and are left with nothing but ashes to the extent that nothing can be reconstructed in there. The prosecutor is a bit scared as something of such massive scale is coming to Yongdong Po and it might not be their final destination, but it doesn't look like it won't avoid them on their way. Sung is thinking that they cannot predict the Hell's Armor movement so even the people of Suwon can be in danger. After the pirates, they now need to face the Hell's Armor. That's why Sung Woo decided to cooperate with the number one ranker as he had no other choice. Sung Woo says that he is planning on moving now because the longer they wait, the stronger their enemies will get. Prosecutor tells him that he will help them in evacuating the people of Suwon, and he is thinking that it is frustrating as all he can do is work in the back like this. But right now, he needs to grow strong under his shadow and send those capable to fight, though things might change if they can create the union. 
Rather than believing in the mysterious Han Kang Sok, it's better to fully support Sung Woo right now. After some time, Sung Woo and his party arrive at a location after following Han Kang Sok. Han Kang Sok stops for a moment and asks Sung Woo if he's really going to take his friends along with him. He gives an advice to Sung Woo to not take them along as they can die on this quest. Han Ho asks Sung Woo if it is true, and Sung Woo took him along after saying they were just going out to eat lamb cutlets. On the other hand, Ji Su Yun says she has heard enough, and she knows well that there is a high possibility that they might die sometime soon. But by only overcoming this ordeal, they can learn to become stronger, and their experience from this quest will give them better chances of survival in the future. Han Kang Sok says then, it is fine then, and they will go to Osan using teleportation magic, and Jeon will create a teleportation point for them. Jeon is overjoyed and she introduced herself to Sung Woo's party, and Han Ho greets her back. But for some reason, Jeon looks at Han Ho with suspicion. Then she kicks him right in the face while saying that he smells like a bloody weakling. Jeon then flies up in the air to prepare her magic. She makes a big teleportation circle around them and a notification pops up which says that they will be teleported to a designated point. All of them disappear with a bright flash of light. In just a few seconds, they appear in Osan, which was hundreds of kilometers away from their previous location. Sung Woo and his party are amazed at the fast teleportation skill of Jeon. Sung Woo tells Han Kang Sok that Jeon is a great item, and Kang Sok replies by saying that it becomes really helpful after eating what it likes. Jeon gets angry at them once again after being called an item. Han Kang Sok tells Sung Woo and his party to go ahead towards Pyeongtaek while he will teleport to An Sok to handle the situation there. Kang Sok hands over an earring to Sung Woo and Sung Woo asks him about its use. Han Kang Sok informs him that it is another one of Jeon's skill and they can communicate with each other in real time if he sticks this near his ear. Jeon warns Sung Woo to not take it off or it will disappear. Sung Woo equips it and he gets a notification stating that he has been connected to the Jeon communication network. Jeon and Kang Sok teleport away after wishing best of luck to Sung Woo and his party. Han Ho compliments Kang Sok by saying that the number one ranker really deserves his reputation and he badmouths his ill-mannered fairy. He further says that his ready is the best companion as compared to that moth. Sung Woo and his party ride on bone wyverns to cover the distance at a faster pace. Jeon asks them if they can hear her, and Sung Woo replies with a yes. Ji Seon points out something important below a building to their left. It turns out some survivors are being chased by hellhounds. All of a sudden, Kang Sok informs them that he forgot to inform them about something. It turned out that the armor boss just summoned a fire giant. It can throw a ball of fire, so he tells them to be careful while flying. Han Ho points out toward a building with a large fireball on top of it. It turns out to be the fire giant which Han Kang Sok just warned them about. Han Ho is afraid as the size of this fire giant is extra large. The fire giant pulls out a big chunk of the building with his bare hand. He then hurls it towards Song Woo and his party after igniting it on fire. Song Woo tells Han Ho to hold on tight as it is already too late to dodge. The bone wyvern gets completely destroyed after getting hit with the fireball. Both Song Woo and Han Ho start falling and Han Ho says that this is why he hates flying. Ji Si Yun and Raidi rush toward them on their wyvern to save them. Ji Si Yun catches Song Woo and pulls him up while the wyvern saves Han Ho by putting him in his mouth. Ji Si Yun informs them that it is hard to circle around and they are going to crash. A few seconds later, the wyvern crashes into the ground and Ji Si Yun asks others if they are all right. The hellhounds start dashing toward the crashed players. Ji Si Yun gets ready to take them all on by herself. She cuts up most of them with a single slash attack, but more hellhounds rush toward them. Song Woo gets rid of them by using his Dwarven crossbow and he receives 10,550 gold for hunting a single hellhound. The Death Knight comes forward after sensing something. Death Knight says that this place is in utter chaos and he should get ready as well. Ji Si and Raidi rush toward a group of hellhounds. They start getting rid of them after slashing them to tiny pieces. Death Knight says Ji Si and Raidi have gotten stronger and it seems he also needs to work hard to get stronger from now on. Death Knight uses his chains to catch the hellhounds. He then slashes them all after pulling them together. Sung Woo tells his party members that they need to get out of here because the giant will be arriving here in very soon. Sung Woo is thinking that he can't waste his awakened state in here and he has to sparingly use his summons. The moment that fire giant takes a notice of them, all of his mid and lower rank skeletons will be goners and it will only make him waste his awakening. Sung Woo realizes that a small alley in front of them is open. He orders everyone to run toward it as fast as they can. The fire giant is standing still in his position. Sung Woo is wondering about how he can get rid of it while the giant is so strong it got rid of a wyvern in a single hit. 
But first, they need to get to a safe location. So Song Wu summons his troll skeleton. It is going to be hard to find another skeleton like this, but Song Wu still orders it to block the alley behind them. The hellhounds breathe out fireballs. They start bombarding the troll with fireballs and it gets destroyed after some time. Sungwoo summons two more troll skeletons and he orders them to block the path of the hellhounds. But all of a sudden, Sungwoo realizes a big fireball in front of them and he orders everyone to stop. This massive fireball turns out to be the fire giant. At the same time, Han Ho, who was previously pretending to be unconscious, wakes up and he asks them if he can again go back to being unconscious. Sung Woo was previously thinking of saving his strength for the Hell's Moving Armor boss, but after seeing the fire giant, he is having second thoughts. Sung Woo says that he has no other choice but to take a gamble and use it in here. All of a sudden, the fire giant reaches a bus and screams of survivors can be heard from a building behind it. Sung Woo is thinking that maybe these guys are the same players he just saved a moment ago. Inside the building, a kid is asking his dad for help. Death Knight says that he's going to save them even if Sungwoo tries to stop him. Looking at the burning building reminds Sungwoo about his past. It reminds him of the day his parents died. He was too weak back then and he was afraid as well, but the situation is completely different right now. Sungwoo screams out that he will face the fire giant by himself. Sungwoo summons the Grim Reaper Scythe and he gains the power of a lich for a certain duration, and he orders the rest of his party members to watch his back. Jisian asks Song Wu if he can really face this monster by himself, as the recommended level to fight it is at 27. Song Wu says that it is fine, and he will find it out pretty soon if he can defeat it or not. Song Wu leaves the Hellhounds to Jisian and the Death Knight, as they will be able to handle them with ease. Song Wu is thinking that he needs to find a different way to deal with this fire giant, as he cannot damage it using normal attacks. His entire body is covered with flames, and the skeletons will easily melt after coming in contact with it. As long as it maintains its form, its head is probably its weak point, but it is positioned too high for a direct attack. Sung Woo is thinking that maybe he should give his new skill a try, and he summons the deadly clouds. The whole sky gets covered with dark purple poisonous clouds. Sung Woo doubts the poison will work on the ball of fire, but the important thing here isn't the poison, but the raindrops. The rain starts pouring and the giant puts his hand up to save his head from getting wet, indicating that the poison rain is working on him. The fire giant firmly breaks a big piece of a building. He then hurls it towards Sung Woo with full force after covering it in fire. Without wasting any time, Sung Woo summons his skeleton warriors and he equips them with his battle gear production skill. The giant rock smashes into the skeleton warriors formation, which ends in a big explosion. The impact was so huge that even Ji Si Yun and the Death Knight got caught up in its aftershock. Some raindrops fell on the head of the fire giant and he's showing signs of worry. Sung Woo is thinking that his guess was right, as the head of the fire giant is his weakness and he needs to target it next time. In a desperate attempt, the fire giant tries to attack Sung Woo with a fire palm attack. Sung Woo summons a bone shield and he tries to block the palm attack. Sung Woo cannot die in a fire because his fire resistance alone is on 60%, and his Dragon Hunter title along with his Shadow King's robe provide many buffs against fire type enemies. The fire giant is in extreme pain because his head is cooled down from the rain and Sung Woo thinks that it is his chance to strike. Ogre Champion, who was hiding behind the fire giant, rushes toward him. He quickly grabs the fire giant from behind, but the fire giant is heating up again, and Sung Woo needs to do something about it. Sung Woo pulls out his heroic ranked dwarven made hand cannon. It can load bullets as well just by inserting 10 mana in it. Sung Woo starts shooting the head of the fire giant with his dwarven hand cannon, and the giant starts screaming in pain. Sung Woo orders Righty to go on ahead as well. Righty starts hitting his head while Sung Woo keeps on bombarding it with his hand cannon. Some skin on the head of the fire giant breaks off, revealing a fire orb behind it. Sung Woo starts running toward the fire giant and he tells the ogre champion to hold on a bit longer. Without wasting any time, Sung Woo grabs the orb from the fire giant's head. Sung Woo pulls out the fire orb with all of his force, which results in the death of the fire giant, and he receives 2,800,000 gold for defeating it. Han Ho comes back to his senses after finding out that Song Wu defeated the fire giant, and the Death Knight asks Han Ho about how long is he planning on clinging to him. The survivors look out from their buildings, and they become happy after finding out that the necromancer saved them. Song Wu forgot to ask something else, so he contacts Jean. Song Wu asks her about any weakness of the fire giant, and Jean tells him that he needs to destroy the core that's inside the head of the fire giant. And she warns Song Wu by saying that fire giant is a tricky opponent, and even Han Kang Sok is having trouble while dealing with it. 
Sungwoo tells her that he already knows about this weakness and Jeon asks him about how he already knew. Sungwoo tells her that he already opened up his head and pulled out a fire orb. After hearing it, Jeon tells Kang Suk about this huge problem and Sungwoo can hear her as well. He's thinking that maybe she's worried about his bet with Kang Suk and winning it can be possible if he can continue on this pace. Plus, he was just able to get his hands on a premium item like this. This fire orb is a heroic ranked material called Life Force of Fire. It contains a strong power of fire that does not exist in the real world and if certain conditions are met, he may be able to control this fire with mana. According to his crafting experience, it should be a good material, but the real problem is a tattoo that appeared on his arm. Its description says that it is imprinted by the demons of hell. The demons of this land will be able to track him, and this curse will be lifted once the boss monster, Hell's Moving Armor, is defeated. Sungwoo was not planning on avoiding it either, and even if they can track him, he can use it the other way around. He can find them at a location of his own choosing and tells his party that it is time to make a nice, fun trap. Sungwoo brings over all survivors with him and they head over to a school. They make big holes in the school field and it is a good place because this place doesn't have a lot of things to burn and its wide space provides the best place to fight. A survivor informs Sungwoo that they brought over all fire extinguishers from close by buildings as he requested. They are all alive thanks to Sungwoo and they were on their way to Yongdongpo after hearing about the union, but they had no idea that hell would break loose on them. Sungwoo tells them they have a higher chance of survival if they deal with these fire bastards right here rather than recklessly heading up north. The survivor further informs him that they buried the monster dead bodies all around the field as he requested, and Sungwoo compliments them by saying that it will help him a lot during this fight. Hanho says that they should hide now that the traps are all ready, but before he can complete his sentence, he hears a huge lightning zap sound. Hanho is wondering about how can the lightning occur while the sky is fully clear? He asks others if they heard it as well or if he's the only one whose ears are ringing. But before he can say anything else, a big cloud appears out of nowhere and lightning strikes come out of it. In just a few seconds, the clouds start emitting huge lightning bolts on the ground. Everyone becomes a bit anxious and Song Wu knows about the place where these lightning clouds are coming from. These clouds are coming from An Sun. It's the place where Han Kang Sok went to deal with the Hell's Moving Armor, but he has no idea if this lightning is related to Kang Sok or the boss skill. They don't have much time to ponder as Jisun informs them that the Hell's Moving Armor is here. Sungwoo tells the survivors to get inside the building and they start moving without wasting any time. The Hell's Moving Armor is emitting a special type of heat which can be felt from a long distance. Sungwoo is thinking that this heat wave is tremendous and the air around it is completely different from the fire giant. He has no choice but to be the bait himself since he is the only one with high fire resistance. Everything on Sungwoo's end is ready and he shouts at Hell's Moving Armor and the Hellhounds surrounding it to come and get him. Hellhounds slowly start rushing toward the school grounds. Sungwoo is holding on against the heat shock waves as he needs to get the monsters as close to him as he can. All of a sudden, the Hellhounds come to a stop and they start smelling their surroundings. And Sungwoo thinks that maybe they can smell the dead bodies of monsters buried in the ground. In order to pull them closer, Sungwoo pulls up his dwarven crossbow. He then starts shooting the Hellhounds to get their aggro on him. The Hellhounds become enraged after seeing their brethren getting pierced by the bolts and they start rushing toward him. Sungwoo says that they look pretty when they are unified like this and it's nice seeing how they don't have any patience. Sungwoo orders his monster bird to carry him in the sky. After getting up in the sky, Sungwoo uses his corpse explosion skill on the dead bodies of monsters buried in the ground. This in turn results in some huge explosions which get rid of all hellhounds and Sungwoo receives 15,000 gold per hellhound he killed. Sungwoo is a bit calm now as he just got the sidekicks of the main boss. Now all he has to do is to focus on his main target. After the boss monster gets close, a notification pops up stating that the Hell's Moving Armor has appeared. The heat wave emitted by the Hell's Moving Armor is getting fiercer by each passing second. Now, Sungwoo needs to start the second phase of his plan and he summons golems. The dead bodies of Hellhounds get lifted up in the air and they start mashing together. After some time, the meat of the Hellhounds turns into two golems, and Sungwoo gets a notification that he has summoned two flesh golems. 
Sung Woo then equips his minions with shields using his battle gear production skill. Sung Woo receives a rank 1 gear synergy called Armor Break. This synergy requires more than 10 units equipped with blunt weapons and this synergy gives various buffs, such as a stun chance of 6% and additional damage against monsters with medium to large builds, and 10% additional damage against targets wearing plated armor. Sung Woo prepared this special synergy in order to destroy the armor of the boss. After that, Sung Woo orders his bird monsters to charge forward and they are equipped with fire extinguishers. The bird monsters throw the fire extinguishers on the hell's moving armor. This in turn lowers the temperature around the hell's moving armor by a little fraction. Sung Woo used these throwing type fire extinguishers in order to lower its temperature by blocking off the oxygen. But after a few seconds, the hell's moving armor summons some fireballs. He then uses the fireballs to kill off the monster birds summoned by Sung Woo. Sung Woo can feel that the fire of the hell's moving armor is still quite strong, so he calls out Han Ho to start something. Han Ho comes running toward the sports ground. He is carrying a big water pipe and he tells other players to turn on the water valve as he is going to turn this whole place into a swimming pool. Ji Si Yun realizes that the water is evaporating before it even hits the ground, but Han Ho keeps on pumping more water as they need to lower the temperature. The evaporating water is very hot and they are barely holding on, so Han Ho tells other players to think of this as a hot sauna. Sung Woo says that now it's his turn to engage in the action, so he summons Ready and the Death Knight after turning his Lich Mode on. Death Knight asks Sung Woo that if they just need to break open that metal can in front of them, and Sung Woo tells them to break it to their heart's content. Sung Woo revives the dead hellhounds around him and Death Knight along with Righty ride on them. Both of them start rushing toward the hell's moving armor on their undead mounts. Sung Woo uses his Call of Death skill to summon the zombies which in turn triggers the activation of weakened spirit. The hell's moving armor gets really pissed after getting hit by a bunch of debuffs. He then starts balloting it out with Righty and the Death Knight but they are too fast for him and they easily manage to dodge his attacks. The fire around them is still very strong, so Sung Woo summons his undead lizard men to go and spray the remaining fire extinguishers on the Hell's Moving Armor. The Hell's Moving Armors gets hit for the second time by a bunch of fire extinguishers. This time, the amount of fire extinguishers was too much, and the area around the Hell's Moving Armor slowly starts getting enveloped with gas, which in turn cuts off the oxygen supply to the boss monster. On the other side, Han Ho keeps on pumping more water on the battlefield. Sung Woo is not finished yet, and he summons the deadly clouds right above the Hell's Moving Armor. The combination of these small tactics is working well in Sung Woo's favor as the Hell's Moving Armor is becoming weaker. The temperature around the Hell's Moving Armor has dropped by a lot, and now it is possible to approach him. Sung Woo orders the skeletons he equipped with blunt weapons to charge forward. They start bonking the Hell's Moving Armor from all directions using their blunt weapons. The Hell's Moving Armor gathers up all of his remaining strength and he smacks the skeleton soldiers with a single massive punch. Sung Woo is thinking that it dealt with the armed skeleton soldiers in just a single blow and this boss is too dangerous to deal with physical attacks alone. Sung Woo needs to pin him down so he orders his Bone Wyvern to smash into it. The Hell's Moving Armor smashes the Bone Wyvern into pieces with a single punch. Han Ho and Ji Seon get worried as they think that maybe Sung Woo got caught up in that last attack. But Sung Woo was too fast to get caught and he landed right behind the shoulder of the boss. Sung Woo realizes that his shoulders have no fire on them and he starts smacking them with the scythe. Death Knight tries to tie the Hell's Moving Armor using his chains while Righty keeps him in check. Sung Woo summons troll skeletons and he orders them to push the Hell's Moving Armor to the designated location. The Hell's Moving Armor heats up one of his hands to an extreme degree. He then uses his hands to fire an extreme level fire burst attack on the troll skeletons and the heat behind this attack was so strong that the trolls return to eternal death and they cannot be resurrected again. The fire of the Hell's Moving Armor is getting its heat back but Sung Woo cannot lose more of his undead soldiers as they are quite hard to gain, so he orders the ogre champion to punch him from behind. Han Ho and the players are running out of water, so Han Ho asks the other players if there are any water mages or they will have to use their piss as liquid to cool off the Hell's Moving Armor. Death Knight has taken his time to completely envelop the Hell's Moving Armor with his chains, and Sung Woo needs to make full use of this opportunity. Sung Woo orders the Wandering Drake to pull the chains with all of his strength. Hell's Moving Armor falls down after tipping over the chains, and Sung Woo orders the Wandering Drake to drag the boss monster to the trap they previously set up for him. After the Hell's Moving Armor is dragged to a certain 
certain location, Sung Woo orders his flesh golems to get closer to it and they jump toward the Hell's Moving Armor. Sung Woo tells the flesh golems to endure it for as long as they can as he's going to use up all of his mana in this single attack. Sung Woo uses his corpse explosion skill which explodes the flesh golems along with the buried dead monster and this in turn results in a huge explosion. The players get down as the heat wave emitted from the explosion is too strong. This final attack was too big for the Hell's Moving Armor and he dies in that explosion. Sung Woo earns 4.5 million gold for hunting the second Hell's Moving Armor. He gets an additional B rank experience card as a reward for hunting it with a level lower than what was recommended. Sung Woo gained a lot of experience from this fight and he levels up to 20. After reaching level 20, all of his stats increase by 2. Sung Woo gained a title called Hell Repeller. This title granted him 2 dexterity, plus his resistance against curses and magic has increased by 10%. Sung Woo says that it is finally done, and the quest is clear, but then he remembers something. This quest previously said that it can be only be completed if they killed both boss monsters within 2 hours, so in order to confirm his suspicion, he asks Zeon if they are done on their side. Zeon informs him that they killed their Hell's Moving Armor about 118 seconds before him, and Sung Woo becomes a bit sad as he just lost the bet after working so hard. Han Kang Sok will now get the legendary item. Sung Woo still has no idea about the class or skills of Han Kang Sok, and still, he is number one for a reason. Sung Woo is thinking that there's no use of crying over spilt milk, and he should move on. All of a sudden, Sung Woo finds an item emitted from the dead body of the dead boss monster. After coming in contact with the item, a notification pops up, which informs Sung Woo that he has met a certain condition by gaining the Hell's Repeller title, and he is now qualified to plant the World Tree Seed. As the Guardian, he will be able to grow the World Tree and it will grow by being influenced by him. Sung Woo is not so sure as to what the system means by the world tree as the world tree he saw before was not a good sign, and it was about to end the whole Korean continent. Sung Woo receives a personal quest called Guardian of Death. He needs to grow a divine world tree in Korea. As a reward, a personal skill and a title called Owner of the World Tree will be granted to him. Sung Woo has stopped the invasion of demons from the other world, which granted him the qualification to become the Guardian. If he accepts his destiny and grow the world tree, then he will be able to obtain the great power to support the world. If the objective of nourishing the world tree fails, a great calamity that cannot be turned back will befall on Earth. Sung Woo remembers seeing the second bad ending of the world tree, but that world tree was called Fallen, while this one is called a Guardian. This is a one in a lifetime opportunity that is only granted to Sung Woo. There are more powerful people like the number one ranker Han Kang Sok, but this task was only granted to him. Sung Woo calms himself down as it's not like he can do this task right now, and there's no need to rush things. Sung Woo needs to reorganize some stuff. He might have lost the chance to get a legendary item, but it's not like he's going home empty handed. Sung Woo received a special ranked item called Hellfire Armor. This armor increases defense by 50%, magic resistance by 30%, fire resistance by 100%, and fire damage by 20%. The size of this armor will automatically adjust to permanently fit the wearer, thus making it untradeable. Sung Woo's level increased up to 20, so he chose Corpse Explosion card as his level up reward. After choosing the card, the rank of his skill increased from basic to proficient. Now after the explosion, a small amount of breath of the abyss will be emitted which will cause an additional 30% damage. Sung Woo uses corpse explosion on a dead hellhound nearby. The results are quite nice as Sung Woo and his summons can become buffed after coming in contact with the breath of abyss. Sung Woo gained a lot after this mission but there is a huge price he paid for this victory. He lost all of his troll skeletons, which are quite hard to obtain. About 30% of his skeletons died permanently during this battle, but fortunately, most of his special skeletons are still alive. All of a sudden, Han Ho comes running towards Sung Woo, screaming out loud that they are in big trouble. Sung Woo asks him what is wrong, and he asks about the guys accompanying him as they don't look like they are refugees. One of the players informs Sung Woo that they are part of outer range scouting team from the Union. Sung Woo remembers that the Union has many small teams which are used to gather information from the surrounding areas. Sung Woo asks him why they are here, and the scout says that they need to get out of this place as soon as possible. They were sent here to scout the area, and while doing their job, they witnessed a huge group of were beasts coming from the Songtan area around 15 minutes minutes ago. And judging from the diversity of were beasts, they must be part of the evolution society. 
Sung Woo is thinking that maybe the Evolution Society was waiting for the perfect time to eliminate him. He is far away from the Union and he just finished a tough fight. Maybe they thought this was the best time to get rid of him. The scout says that he already sent a report back to Yongdongpo Station, so the Prosecutor and the Crusader team will be arriving here as well. But the number of enemies is high, so Sung Woo must be careful. Before he can say anything else, they observe something passing by them at a high speed which alerts them. That unknown object collides with a building nearby which results in a big explosion. The scout informs Sung Woo that their team 3 and 4 were hiding inside those buildings which just exploded. Sung Woo is thinking that maybe they are already under siege as the Evolution Society is here. All of them start running inside a nearby building and Ji Seon informs them that she can feel a lot of enemies around them. Ji Seon says that there are around 300 enemies just in their vicinity and the scout says she is correct as they previously saw that many werebeasts marching toward this area. Sung Woo is thinking that the number of enemies are not important in normal scenarios, but if their enemies are 300 intelligent werebeasts, then everyone here will be dead. Out of nowhere, their building gets shot with another explosion shot. The survivors inside the building are panicking as they don't know what their enemies are attacking them with. Sung Woo knows well that the last attack was just to keep them in check. They threw that blast attack without knowing the exact location of Sung Woo. He is wondering if they are doing this to hold Sung Woo from running away. That explosion just now had same power as the fireball of the fire giant. The rare beasts can't endlessly make these fireballs like the fire giant, but Sung Woo cannot use a wyvern in this situation. This time, they made thorough preparations after carefully observing the fighting pattern of Sung Woo. A survivor tries to take a peek outside from his window, but the poor guy gets shot through his neck by a sniper. Jisoo Yun uses her area sensibility to know that the werebeasts are coming closer from the front. The werebeasts are wearing gas masks, so they cannot come in contact with a breath of abyss. The werebeasts send Team 1 and 2 to infiltrate the building and get rid of Sung Woo. They start entering the school building through some open windows. The survivors are getting anxious and afraid as they don't know exactly what is going on. The scout asks Sung Woo about his orders, but Sung Woo is trying to come up with a plan. Sung Woo is thinking that he cannot summon his huge undead boss skeletons inside the building, but that does not mean that he can just abandon the people inside and run away from here. Sung Woo orders the survivors to hide inside the classrooms and protect their families, and he will make sure that the werebeasts cannot come any closer to them. Sung Woo is a bit anxious as he is being hunted. The Evolution Society knows well about the exact number of summons he has and his fighting patterns. All of a sudden, Sung Woo observes some trucks coming toward the school building. Some new type of monsters come out of these trucks. These monsters have a bizarre look. They look neither like a human nor like a traditional monster. They are something else. Sung Woo is thinking that maybe they are the results of unethical experiments performed by the Evolution Society. Sung Woo orders Ji Si Yun and Han Ho to stay here and protect the survivors while he heads toward the hallway. There are only 14 minutes left until the Grim Reaper Scythe goes on the cooldown. All of his large monsters are in cooldown as well, but fortunately he can continuously summon small skeletons while he is in his lich mode. Sung Woo is thinking whether waiting for the Crusader team is the only thing he can do right now. All of a sudden a werebeast starts shouting after he spots Sung Woo. Sung Woo shoots two crossbow bolts at them. But those bolts get deflected by some sort of magic shield casted around the werebeasts. This is not looking good in Sung Woo's favor as his enemies came fully prepared. They have their gas masks on them, which means that Sung Woo can't use his Breath of Abyss skill. A few werebeasts come from behind the hallway to surround Sung Woo from both sides. Raidi and the Death Knight get ready to engage them and they tell Sung Woo to leave his back to them. Some werebeasts jump towards Sung Woo from the front as they know that he is alone right now. Sung Woo powers up a little bit. He then performs a big slash attack with his scythe to cut through the first wave of werebeasts. Sung Woo keeps on chopping them like a grinder and he gets 25,000 gold for slaying each second rank werebeast. Sung Woo can kill the werebeasts without the help of his skeletons for now as Lich Mode increases all of his stats by 10%. But the main problem is on the first floor where his minions are duking it out against the new type of monsters. His skeletons are getting destroyed at a faster rate. He can resurrect them for now for as many time as he wants but a new problem will occur once his Lich Mode ends. Sung Woo can't go outside so carelessly as there are snipers waiting for him. Plus, they have a weapon that can perform a super long range attack and his huge skeletons will be destroyed the moment they are summoned. There are even some beastmen which are climbing the walls. Sung Woo is thinking that he needs to do something else as he cannot hold any longer. Desperate times call for desperate measures, so Sung Woo is thinking of using some riskier items like the Devil's Door to turn the tides of this war.
Song Wu has two options now. He can either use Devil's Door or the Beast's Syringe. These are both items he has got as a loot after defeating some difficult foes, but both of these items come with their side effects. The Beast's Syringe is an unidentifiable rank item which is crafted by a player. It will temporarily turn its user into a werewolf. It is an extract made by boiling a beast. After using it, the player will return to normal within 20 minutes. Song Wu is a bit hesitant to use it because it can cause some unknown side effects, but he has no other choice. On the other side, the Devil's Door is a special rank magic scroll. It will open a Devil's Door for 24 hours. The Devil Door creates a path to and from a Devil's Lair. Extremely rare items can be obtained by exploring the Devil's Lair, but it is not recommended to rush the Devil's Lair because the monsters can rush out of it as well, and the recommended level to clear it is 35. Songu is a bit hesitant because all of them can die if things go wrong. Devil's Lair is an item that the pirates were planning on using as a strategy to destroy a certain region in Korea. And Song Wu was originally planning on challenging it himself, but right now he has no other choice. Song Wu is thinking of transforming into a wolf first using the Werebeast syringe. Then he will turn around and open the Devil's Door behind them. After that, he will run away as the only thing he needs to do first is to survive. Sungwoo tells this plan to Righty and the Death Knight, and he instructs Death Knight to guard the school. After that, Sungwoo starts heading downstairs with his minions. The way forward is blocked by the test subjects and his skeletons are barely holding them back. Righty and the Death Knight jump in the ranks of test subjects and they receive 100 gold for slaying each test subject. These test subjects are quite strong, but Sung Woo is only receiving 100 gold coins, which are nothing compared to their raw power. Sung Woo uses corpse explosion on the dead bodies of the mutants to kill them off in one go. Sung Woo is thinking that the snipers will not be able to see through this smoke. Sung Woo uses weakened spirit on the incoming wave of werebeasts. Their leader orders them from outside to not remove their masks as the gas released by Sung Woo can easily be repelled using them. While the werebeasts are busy with his minions, Sungwoo seizes this opportunity to use the beast syringe on himself. On the other side, Righty gets punched by a werebeast. The impact of the punch was quite strong, so he crashes near Sungwoo. Sungwoo just used the beast syringe on himself. He starts feeling some changes in his body. All of a sudden, a lot of energy starts bursting out of him. But surprisingly, his lich form is not cancelled. His entire body feels like it's being ripped apart and his face feels like it's being crushed. A notification pops up which informs him that he has met some special conditions by combining his lich state with a werewolf state. A big ball of energy forms in the hallway and it starts pulling in the breath of abyss from the area. The rare beasts are a bit confused as they don't know what is happening in front of them. After soaking in the gas, the core starts shattering. Sung Woo comes out of the core in his new state which shocks everyone present around him. It turns out Sung Woo has temporarily gained the power of Anubis, the god of death, and he is temporarily in a state of a demigod. All of his stats have increased by 10. He can now use three new master rank skills such as Soul Siphon, Demon Bombardment, and Twilight Attack. The Beastmen are a bit taken aback because Sung Woo just became a Beastman like them. A new notification pops up which informs the Beastmen that their stats have decreased by 2 because of an unknown energy. The morale of the Beastmen is hitting rock bottom, and they are all in a state of confusion. The Beastman leader orders his minions to attack the Necromancer as he thinks that Necromancer is using some petty tricks to get away from them. The Beastman rush towards Sung Woo, but he disappears in an instant. In a few seconds, Sung Woo appears right behind them. He then chops up the Beastman using his scythe. Sung Woo is feeling completely different from before. It might be because he kept focusing on upgrading his skills and summons, but with the Anubis Lich state, it feels like he's not human anymore. Sung Woo absorbs the souls of the 11 werebeasts he just slayed. He then uses those souls to buff his minions, which increases their attack rate by 10%. With his newly acquired power, Sung Woo is feeling like a true god of death right now. The Beastman leader orders the snipers to shoot Sung Woo from the distance. All of them release their bolts in unison, but Sung Woo disappears once again even before the bolts hit him. Just like last time, Sung Woo uses the shadows of his enemies to teleport himself behind them. He then chops off a group of snipers using a single slash attack, and he earns 21,000 gold for slaying each second rank rat beastman, and he absorbs their souls as well. The other sniper beastmen found out his new location and they start preparing their crossbows. They shoot their bolts at him, but Sung Woo vanishes into thin air. He appears behind the snipers and shreds them to tiny pieces. 
Other werebeasts try to surround him from all sides. The werebeast leader orders one of his snipers to ready the Saint Silver Arrow. The sniper gets ready to try out this new type of arrow. The results of the Saint Silver Arrow are quite amazing as it's a holy item and it manages to return three of Songwu's minions into eternal death. The sniper becomes a bit happy as his divine arrows can damage Songwu for real. Songwu gets alerted as he now knows that the beastman prepared some divine weapons for him. But he has a divine weapon of his own and he imbues his scythe with demon bombardment. Demon Bombardment is a master rank skill and it costs 20 mana to use. It consumes souls and explodes them with a powerful curse. Sungwoo used the Demon Bombardment on the werebeasts around him. One by one, they are getting ripped into shreds. Even their divine shields cannot protect them. Sungwoo absorbs the souls of the newly defeated foes. He then uses Corpse Explosion on the dead bodies of werebeasts around him. Sungwoo has now accumulated a total of 34 souls and he's feeling quite awesome. After absorbing a lot of souls, Sungwoo imbues his scythe with demon bombardment once again. He then upgrades his skeleton minions using the souls he just gathered. The beastman leader orders his men to get away from Sungwoo. He will deal with the necromancer himself, so he orders his men to hold off his minions. After some time, both of them come face to face and the beastman leader says that Sungwoo just changed his fighting style. He is wondering if Sungwoo was one of their kin all along. But Sungwoo mocks him by saying that a wolf like him cannot be akin to a cow. The werebeast tells him that those concepts are old, and now all beastmen belong to the same species. Sungwoo asks him if he is one of the four werebeast leaders. The beastman leaders asks him about how he knows about the four leaders, and Sungwoo says that he just knows about minor details. Sungwoo imbues his Grim Reaper Scythe with Demon Bombardment. He then uses it on the Werebeast Leader. But the Werebeast Leader somehow managed to block the attack and he throws some chains towards Sungwoo. The chains envelop the Grim Reaper Scythe and Sungwoo gets a notification that his weapon has been sealed for a short period of time. This beastman is called the Red Rider and he prepares to finish off Sungwoo. Sungwoo has only 7 minutes of Grim Reaper's state remaining while his werewolf state has 14 minutes left. His weapon is sealed but thankfully it didn't cancel his Grim Reaper's state. Red Rider tells Sungwoo to brace himself for a huge impact. Sungwoo is thinking that this guy is quite powerful and he cannot drag out this fight any longer. Red Rider can read Sungwoo's expression and he knows well that Sungwoo is getting impatient. Sungwoo compliments him for having an ability which tells the state of animals. Red Rider informs Sungwoo that he was a vet in his human years and it's a basic skill for a vet to read the expressions of animals. Sungwoo can easily capture him with his minions but they are currently busy with other beastmen. Sungwoo looks back but it seems like the beastmen are holding his minions back. Sungwoo asks him if he prepared this plan to engage him in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Red Rider says that he is correct and he made this plan because Sungwoo normally fights cowardly. Red Rider mostly fights without weapons but this time, he is using equipment to get an equal playing field against the Necromancer. Sungwoo says that Red Rider is a coward as he's a fighter and he's trying to fight a mage-like character in the melee battle. Red Rider tells Sungwoo to shut up as he talks like a coward. Red Rider feigns a punch and he lands a kick on Sungwoo. Sungwoo felt the impact of the kick and he's getting a bit nervous. Red Rider uses another powerful attack on Sungwoo. Sungwoo got hit pretty badly this time and blood starts coming out of his mouth. Red Rider pulls him up to ask him what he is going to do next as all of his underhanded methods have been dealt with. Red Rider prepares a strong punch attack to get rid of Sungwoo, but this time, Sungwoo easily catches his punch with his bare hands. Sungwoo informs him that his time of playing around is over as he just got all the experience points he needed to put the Red Rider in his place. Sungwoo's strength stats alone is 52 and if you add the bonus stats acquired after becoming a beastman, then there is no need to be afraid of this Red Rider. Sungwoo breaks one of the hands of the Red Rider with a strong grip. He then does a follow-up punch barrage attack. Red Rider is in extreme pain but he can't block any of the attacks. Sungwoo kicks his face into the ground. Red Rider has not hit the dust yet as he got another trick up his sleeve. Red Rider pulls out another syringe. He injects himself with the syringe. In a few seconds, he starts brimming with power. At the same time, the Grim Reaper Scythe of Sungwoo has been unsealed. Meanwhile, inside the building, the test subjects have been dealt with. The refugees are amazed as Ji Si Yun killed so many beastmen on her own. But there is a test subject hiding among the other dead bodies. He jumps out toward a refugee to kill him. Han Ho comes in between them and he blocks the attack of the test subjects with his invulnerable body. Han Ho then rips him apart using his bare hands. Ji Siyun says that the interior of the building has been cleared out and Han Ho comes back to his normal state. Ji Siyun goes toward the windows to check out the situation outside. 
The situation on the outside is not looking well as there is poisonous rain everywhere and the buildings around them are almost destroyed. Sungwoo is hiding from the Red Rider so Red Rider tells Sungwoo to fight him like a man. Plus he got his scythe back so it must be easy for him to deal with the Red Rider. Red Rider is the fourth ranked beastman and he's like Sungwoo who has gone through his first awakening. At last, the Red Rider finds the Necromancer and they start juking it out. They keep on attacking back and forth. Sungwoo is running out of time so he imbues his scythe with demon bombardment skill as he needs to get rid of this beastman as soon as possible. Red Rider jumps up to avoid the demon bombardment skill but he has already been poisoned and blood starts coming out of his mouth. Red Rider falls down to the ground. He starts shouting at the Necromancer as he is using some cowardly skills again. Sungwoo tells him to grin his teeth as his situation is about to get worse. Sungwoo uses Twilight Attack on the Red Rider. Twilight Attack is a master rank skill. It costs 40 mana and 20 souls. It uses the energy of the souls to move at a fast speed. It inflicts strong magic damage on enemies at the landing point and binds them with the ghost's hands for 10 seconds. Red Rider gets caught up in the Twilight Attack. Sungwoo activates Ghost's Hand skill on the Red Rider which completely binds him in place. The lackeys of the Red Riders are getting anxious as their leader just got trapped. Red Rider is in despair and he orders his lackeys to bomb this place. They can't afford to let the Necromancer live, but Sungwoo says that they are already too late for that. All of a sudden, a red portal appears near them. Another beastman with a cane comes out of the portal. This beastman is another fourth ranked beast and the others call him the White Cardinal. There is only one minute remaining until the Grim Reaper Scythe runs out of time. Sungwoo is thinking of running away but at the same time, the White Cardinal tells the Red Rider to run away. The White Cardinal starts coughing up blood and he keeps on telling the Red Rider to run away. All of a sudden some bolts of yellow lightning pass by them. Other beastmen get confused after seeing the lightning above them. Sungwoo has an idea about what can be causing this lightning to emerge here. A notification pops up which tells everyone that an unknown energy is making their bodies intimidated and all of their stats have decreased by 5. Two yellow colored hands appear above them and they start ripping the space apart. Han Kangsok appears out of the space and he tells Sungwoo that these bastards tried to stop him from meeting him. But this is expected as Sungwoo is the biggest star of Korean server and everyone wants to meet him. Han Kangsok makes his appearance on the battlefield. Xion says that all of these beasts are weaklings and they think they can take down anyone if they group on him together. Han Kangsok throws the head of a beastman on the ground. Red Rider recognizes the head as it belongs to the Blue Cardinal of the Beastman clan. There are two different teams of beastmen stationed on buildings behind Han Kang Sok. These beastmen have a weapon called Thunder God's Mace. It is the same weapon they were previously using to bombard the surroundings of Sung Wu. They finally activate the Thunder God's Mace after powering it with their magic. Thunder God's Mace shoots a huge beam of energy toward Kang Sok. Kang Sok pulls up his weapon in time, then he uses it to pull up a huge chunk of rock in order to block the beam of energy. Han Kang Sok tells them that they made a wrong choice of attacking him. Then he splits the rock into two parts. He throws both parts of the rocks toward the beastmen stationed on the buildings to blast them off. Han Kang Sok focuses his attention on the white cardinal who escaped him once before. Kang Sok uses his weapon to shoot a lightning bolt toward the beastmen. White Cardinal uses a skill called Psychic Barrier to envelop himself in a protective layer. Red Rider is quite angry at Kang Sok and he asks White Cardinal about this monstrosity and White Cardinal tells him that the enemy they are facing is Han Kang Sok who is the number one ranker of the Korean server. They are in a tough spot as the number one ranker is in front of them and their number two ranker is right behind them. White Cardinal opens up another red portal as he knows that they cannot face these two monsters at once and they need to cut their losses right here. White Cardinal and Red Rider try to run away through the portal but Han Kang Sok is not having any of their crap and he uses lightning bolt at them. Red Rider gets struck by the lightning and the White Cardinal tries to pull him inside the teleporter. The portal closes down and the White Cardinal safely exits the battlefield. Red Rider was not so lucky as he got roasted into beef by the bolt of Han Kang Sok. Han Kang Sok is not happy as he lost one of his prey. The Beastman transformation of Sung Woo dispels as he ran out of time and he is feeling a lot of pain. He now knows well that the penalty of transforming into a demigod is quite huge and he's feeling weaker as all of his stats are reduced by 10. 
Han Kang Sok compliments Sung Woo for his half god transformation. Sung Woo knows well that Han Kang Sok is a permanent demigod unlike him who temporarily transformed into one for a limited time, and he thanks Kang Sok for his help and asks him about what he's doing here. Han Kang Sok says that he was just coming here to say goodbye to him, but too many beastmen blocked his way, so he had no other choice but to eradicate them. Kang Sok points towards Song Wu after telling him that he is famous for a good reason and he hopes to continue to work together with him in the future. Kang Sok is impressed by Song Wu as he defeated the Iron Golem boss just two minutes after him. He further says that he is glad that he made a good friend like him. The system forces cooperation like this so they will have to work together often in the future. Song Wu directly asks Kang Sok that if Demigod is a class and Kang Sok asks him that he just transformed into one few moments ago so he must have an idea about it by now. Kang Sok says that Demigod is not a class. It's like a power that you can obtain if you meet certain special conditions. He got it as well after meeting certain conditions and even he don't know how to obtain the full power of a Demigod class. Kang Sok says that it is all he can tell him about the Demigod. With that being said, Kang Sok and Xian bid farewell to Song Wu. Sung Woo is still thinking whether Kang Sok really came here to bid farewell to him or if he had any other motive. Maybe Kang Sok sensed his demigod state and came here to check it out. After a few hours, some helicopters belonging to Yongdong Po Guild arrive there. Min Hum Sung comes out of the helicopters along with other crusaders and he apologizes for being late. Sung Woo tells them that it's okay as their surveillance team informed him beforehand about the basement assault which saved his neck. Min Hum Song says that he is happy that Sung Woo resolved this huge incident by himself, but there is another big piece of news they just got. It turns out that an angel statue was discovered in Seoul. After that being said, all of them get on the helicopters to return to their base. Han Ho is quite happy as they just got a powerful cannon from the Evolution Society. The treasure they got is the Thunder God's Mace. It can shoot a powerful lightning bolt and it uses mana as bullets. Jisun says that it uses up a lot of mana with every shot, but she is glad that they finally got their hands on a siege weapon. Min Hua Song informs them that they scavenged a truckload of weapons from the beastmen. Song Wu tells her to send one of the three Thunder God mazes to his town of Suwon and moderately divide the loot. After the loot is divided, Song Wu got all weapons belonging to the Red Cardinal. The first weapon he got is a heroic rank fighter shackle. It can seal all of the opponent's weapons for a short period of time. The second item he got is the Mountain Goblin Shield. This shield can nullify magic attacks three times and it has a cooldown of three hours. He got three more werewolf syringes so he can transform into Anubis three more times. Plus, he turned the Red Rider into one of his minions so now he has another powerful summon on his back and call. Min Hua Song comes to Song Wu to tell him that the angel statue was discovered near Nam San. Since it's an installation object, it can only be moved after 24 hours of initial discovery. Han Ho asks her about how much time is left until they can move it. And Min Hua Song tells him that there are only 17 hours left and they are currently preparing their transport team for this task. Ji Xian says that she is happy that now they can rest for at least 17 hours and Han Ho asks them if they have an air conditioned room as he wants to take a nap along with Righty. After some time, they are resting in the room and Han Ho informs Song Wu that the town of Suwon grew a lot and the average level of players in Suwon is 8. Sung Woo is happy as the town of Suwon has a lot of production classes like blacksmiths, chefs, and leather workers. Everyone back in Suwon is helping each other which is contributing to their synergy, becoming stronger by every day. It turns out that the movement of the pirates is again being suspicious near Ganghua Island. Koreans know well about what is going on in China as they have a lot of captured pirates and they can use their mobiles to check the condition of Chinese second server, but there are still a lot of chances of another pirate invasion. Han Ho asks Sung Woo that if he thinks that the pirates will come again, and Sung Woo tells him that they will, but they're going to take a lot of time to replenish their ranks. Ji Xian says that their entire advance force got annihilated, so they will first try to become stronger than before. Sung Woo says that it's a pain in the ass, but they need to get this union stronger for a bigger invasion. All of a sudden, a notification pops up which informs all players that the first part of the mainstream chapter 2 has ended. It turns out all monster armies were annihilated in this time. The system reveals the rank of players who defeated the monster army bosses. Sung Woo defeated three bosses, Han Kang Sok, Doctor, and the Prosecutor defeated two bosses, while other ranked players in guilds managed to defeat one boss each, and there were a total of 14 bosses. Hano is a bit happy as this long and frustrating boss raid chapter is over, but Sung Woo reminds him that it was just the second chapter and there are more chapters to come. 
After some time, they get a notification about the start of the third chapter. This chapter is called Selecting Factions. The system congratulates all survivors from the Korean server as they manage to defeat all powerful bosses. The players can now choose between two factions, known as Angels or Devils, in order to continue the struggle for the survival of Earth. Hano says that selecting Angel faction is the right choice, and no one in their right mind would select the Devil factions except one person present in the room whose stats match with that of Devils. Another system message pops up with five guidelines. Players can sign a contract with a faction through the stone statues of angel or devil races. Player can receive promotion quests through the statues and upon clearing them, they will get a shoulder pad of a certain level. Each faction is given a faction quest and all players receive great rewards after that quest is completed. A lot of large-scale dungeons will be added in this update. And lastly, the current event will last for 7 days, and the schedule may change depending on the situation of the game. Sungwoo says that the system is dividing the players into two groups and making them have a competition. The judgment of good or evil is pointless whether they choose angel or devil faction, since the system will be toying with them on both sides. Angels and devils are beings that represent good and evil, but Sung is still confused as he's not sure if these devils and angels are the same as their fairy tales. Hanho suggests that maybe they're aliens, and these aliens can be playing with them. The aliens might be making fun of the humans by giving them popularity votes, and Ji Seon confiscates Hanho's phone as he's watching too many alien conspiracy theories and he needs to touch some grass. Sungwoo is thinking that these are just theories and the truth will become clearer as the game goes on. After a few hours, the angel statue is about to arrive and Min Hwa Song alerts everyone and tells the snipers to be ready for any kind of ambush. Min Hum Song informs Sungwoo and his party that everyone knows about the statue and there are many groups eyeing for it, so that's why they have to be extra careful while handling it. He's not sure if anybody is so careless to attack them, but there is no harm in being cautious. For security concerns, only a few members of the Union are allowed near the vicinity of the statue, and Min Hwa Song tells Han Ho and Ji Seon to wait at the gate. After a few hours, a helicopter arrives with a huge container. After landing, the container is loaded onto the truck. It turns out the prosecutor was personally safeguarding the statue, and he applauds Sung Woo for going through all of that beastman trouble. The prosecutor orders his men to open the container so that Sung Woo can check on it. After coming near the statue, a notification pops up which informs them that they are facing the traces of the absolute race of angels. Sung Woo says that this angel statue almost matches the fairy tales from their world, and the prosecutor says that it's carrying a sword and a crown in its hands. Sung Woo is thinking that there must be a meaning behind this sword and crown, but he don't know about it yet. A notification pops up which tells them both to put their hands on the statue. Both Sung Woo and the prosecutor put their hands on the statue without any hesitation. An angel party contract message pops up in front of them with four points. It informs them that they will be a part of the angel's party and they can use the exclusive bulletin board. They will be given a party quest. Their defense will increase by 10 and a buff will be given to them as a basic condition. They can obtain plenty of extra gold if they kill a devil player. The prosecutor says that the game is splitting the players into two factions so they can kill each other. Sung Woo says that he is correct but no one will refuse these contracts because of the immediate buff the statues are offering. A new notification pops up which asks them if they are ready to choose the angel party. They can't withdraw after a certain period of 7 days. If they leave the party later on, they could be given a penalty for enraging the angel. Prosecutor is thinking that he has no other choice but to choose one of the factions, but he is not sure if choosing the angel faction is the right choice, even though they found the angel statue first by accident, but humans are bound to suffer great losses as they will be tied to either of these statues. But he is glad as he chooses to select the same faction as Sung Woo. Sung Woo selects the angel faction, but assistant notification pops up which informs him that he can't choose the angel faction, as he is currently possessing a filthy item called Crystal of Chaos and he can touch the statue again after destroying it. Sung Woo is quite pissed at the statue as it is straight out dissing him. The Crystal of Chaos is a legendary ranked item and it is one of the best items Sung Woo ever got, so he cannot easily give it up. Moreover, Sung Woo can feel a dim sense of uneasiness emitting from this angel statue. All of a sudden, a hidden quest called the Third Choice pops up in front of him. He needs to destroy the three faction statues. 
After destroying them, he will activate a third faction. The system states that these two races are not on the side of humans. Their goal is not the advancement of humanity. Rather, it's to utterly destroy humanity in order to fulfill their ambition. Thanks to Sung Woo's item, which belongs to the Chaos Attribute, he will have to stand up on his own to ensure the preservation of humanity and his victory as he escapes from the hand of the Absolute Race. The system further warns him that the Absolute Race will be enraged after Sung Woo accepts this quest. Sung Woo is now sure that he needs to accept this hidden quest and he presses yes on the system menu. All of a sudden, a notification pops up which informs him that he has enraged both factions. Both factions have issued a wanted order to all players to kill Sung Woo. Angel faction has put up a bounty of 20 million gold on his head, while the devil faction has put up a bounty of 15 million gold on his head. The prosecutor starts trembling and he asks Sung Woo about what he has just done. He informs Sung Woo that the status window is telling him to kill Sung Woo right now. It turns out the prosecutor already chose the angel faction as he thought that Sung Woo was choosing it as well and Sung informs him that things have gotten a bit complicated. The angel statue is pumping prosecutor up and he's bombarding him with messages to kill Sung Woo. Sung Woo tells him to not worry as he will soon resolve that issue. Sung Woo pulls up his Grim Reaper Scythe and he uses a slash attack toward the prosecutor. The slash attack was aimed at the angel statue behind him and it manages to destroy it. The prosecutor asks him about why he destroyed the angel statue. Sung Woo informs him that they have a hidden third choice in this chapter. He further informs the prosecutor that they cannot win this game by submitting to an unknown being of evil nature. Sung Woo walks toward the statue after telling him the truth, but the prosecutor is still trembling. He is thinking that things are getting out of hand as he got another notification informing him that the angel faction has registered killing Sung Woo as the faction quest and reward of killing him is now increased to 50 million gold. Sung Woo goes to the statue as it is emitting a light after being destroyed. Sung Woo gets a legendary rank consumption item called the Angel's Wing Piece. The player can move to the Angel statue within a certain range when used. The Devil Faction members are unable to use this. It can be used as the last emergency escape if the Stone statue is destroyed. Sung Woo is thinking that this is an amazing item and maybe he can move to another statue if he used this. So basically, it's an item which can be used by the losers to escape from the other faction. Sung Woo previously heard about another angel statue nearby but it was first found by the pirate leader and maybe he has it in his possession. It's an opportunity in disguise for Sung Woo as he can directly assault the pirates and get rid of two birds with one stone. After some time, Sung Woo is a bit taken aback after watching Han Ho. Han Ho shuns him for being arrogant and now he made powerful enemies without even discussing anything with his party and Han Ho is thinking about cutting ties with him. Han Ho tells him to look at the new notification window. It turns out that the Angel faction has issued a quest for the entire server. Players can choose between three options. The first option states that players can stop Sung Woo and they will receive a lot of buffs while fighting Sung Woo. Plus the players who contribute the most will get some legendary treasures as a reward. The second option states that they can choose a third faction but as a penalty they will be hunted by both light and dark factions. The third option states that they can just be bystanders and wait things out. Han Ho yells at Sung Woo for being a dimwit and he's drawing to kill him so he can get his hands on these juicy rewards. On the other side, Ji Seon is barely holding back her sword as 50 million gold reward is too much even for her. Ji Seon tells Sung Woo to listen to their opinions before making a big decision like this but Sung Woo tells them that it was an urgent matter, that's why he took a quick action. At the same time, the prosecutor arrives there along with his guild members. He is looking quite furious and he tells Sung Woo that the angel statue was an item founded by his guild and he asks Sung Woo for an explanation for his action. Sung Woo knows that explaining everything in detail can be a bit tricky, so he tells the prosecutor that he is not 100% sure if he made the correct choice, but he has a grim idea about these factions. The prosecutor says that he trusts him but this situation is different as the new quest rewards are quite tempting and there are many players around them who will jump at the first opportunity to kill him. It turns out that the crusaders along with other smaller guilds are quite tempted by the system rewards. Their stares are getting more intense and Hano asks Sung Woo that if he is sure that the union is still their ally. The prosecutor informs Sung Woo that he is the leader of a big group and he cannot bear to become enemies with a faction god. Sung Woo says that he understands well as this situation has become very complicated even for him. The prosecutor informs him that they may even go to war with Sung Woo right here. All guild members get ready to unsheathe their weapons. 
Han Ho asks Sung Woo to say something in order to defuse this situation or even he will cut ties with him. Sung Woo has no idea if he can win against the prosecutor because he has a lot of powerful players with diverse skill set under him. The prosecutor tells Sung Woo to ease up as he has decided that his guild will remain neutral for now. Sung Woo thanks him for trusting him as all of this is his fault in the first place. Prosecutor tells him to hurry up and form the third faction so he can join him. After a few days, Spearman Kyung Soo is ordering around the other townsfolk to check around their surroundings for any suspicious people and organize all items which were recently sent by the Yongdongpo Guild. Han Ho's father asks him if his son and Sung Woo are coming back, and Kyung Soo replies with a yes. After some time, Sung Woo arrives there while riding on his wyvern and he's being escorted by two helicopters. Sung Woo makes the landing in the town of Suwon. Spearman Kyung Soo rushes over to greet Sung Woo and he informs him that no one from their town chose the Angel faction after reading the notification and they chose the third option. Sung Woo is relieved after hearing it as he has now a safe spot and there are some people who believe in him. Kyung Soo further informs him that he has bolstered the defenses around the town in case someone tries to attack them and he is at ease after knowing that the Union sent these helicopters to support them. Sung Woo says that he is wrong as these helicopters are the trophies they collected on their way. It turns out they were attacked while they were trying to reach Suwon Town and after investigating these pilots, they came to know that they belong to the Reconstruction Guild. The Union is an assembly of several guilds. The prosecutor trusts him but it does not mean that the other guilds will respect his decision. Previously, Min Hum Sung told Sung Woo that he along with the Yong Dong Po Guild received a huge penalty after accepting the third option. And there are not that many people around Korea who will accept the third option and lose all the free buffs Angel Faction is giving them. Sergeant informs them that there is a big fuss going on in the community forums. There are countless attention seekers who are saying that they will kill the Necromancer. Some brain dead players are doing strange type of live streams to attract attention. Sung Woo tells them to not worry about it but he also knows well that things can go wrong at any given time. Sung Woo tells them that all of these attention seekers will become quiet once he succeeds in his mission but as he was about to say something else, he gets a unique sensation. The world tree seed comes out on its own and it starts levitating in front of him. Sergeant and others are amazed after watching the seed glowing in yellow color. A notification pops up which informs Sung Woo that he completed a certain condition by choosing the third faction. He has now earned the qualification to become the progenitor of a new party. If he plants the world tree seed right now, it will grow into a divine tree that will bless his party. Sung Woo just needs to complete the third faction quest and succeed in party establishment. Before this, Sung Woo was trying to figure out where he's going to plant the world tree, but right now he has no other choice but to plant it right here in Suwon Town. Sung Woo needs to protect this divine tree until it fully grows since it will be disastrous if it is destroyed, and he has no idea about how large it can grow so it will be impossible to hide it from others. He needs some of his most trusted town members to safeguard it, and he is thinking of planting it in the square which is in front of the town. The next morning, the army under lieutenant starts digging the ground under the instructions of Sung Woo. After a few hours, they manage to dig up a big hole in the ground. Han Ho tells the military guys to leave some space unscathed for the helipad. Sung Woo tells them to give up on the helipad because they lack space. But Han Ho shuts him down after saying that he is the one who captured these helicopters in the first place and he's not going to give up on this precious piece of technology. Spearman Kung Su informs Sung Woo that he is thinking of installing a watchtower rampart around the world tree. The Yongdongpo guild sent them two thunder god cannons so they are going to install them as well. Lieutenant suggests that they should install one thunder god cannon on the summit of Mountain Paldao Summit. They can hide it with something like a camouflage on regular days. After a few minutes, Biker Gang arrives there. Bike Gang leader Taesung informs them that there are no other new monsters nearby. There are still some kobolds crawling underground inside a building but stronger monsters like the dire wolves have almost disappeared. It turns out the biker gang have removed damaged vehicles from the roads and they have also secured a shop around the town of Suwon. The funds to operate all of these facilities are raised smoothly by Han Ho's father who is in possession of a special rank finance item called Vault of Pledge. This item can automatically deposit some of the gold from contracted players. A person can register a contract by putting his hand on the vault. 
The vault owner can decide the money collection ratio, and the gold earned by the contractor automatically gets deposited into the vault. Currently, the money collection ratio is 10%. There are 226 contractors, and current gold in the vault is around 1,655,048. Most of the town people have already accepted the contract registration willingly, but deep inside Hanho knows that his father has a suspicious past, so he must be stealing money from the vault. Jisun says that life around this town is quite peaceful, but Songwoo says that they cannot stay here for longer as they have missions around the country. After a few hours, the ground is perfectly made for the plantation of the World Tree Seed. Songwoo takes out the World Tree Seed and it is glowing with yellow energy. The townsfolk become amazed after witnessing the world tree seed. Sungwoo plants the seed and he gets a notification which states that a magical being has begun to take root in this land. After a few minutes, the seed releases a big flash of light which can be seen from far away. A hidden quest notification pops up. The title of this quest is for the sake of the divine tree. The players need to protect the world tree until it grows up to a certain size. The first fruit of this world tree will give a permanent buff to the one who eats it. This is a divine tree but it's still quite weak so the monsters who have sensed its presence will come in groups in desire of its power. The players need to protect the world tree until it becomes strong enough to protect itself. The world tree can take nourishment from the slain monsters and the more monsters they kill, the faster it will grow. If the world tree is destroyed, an unrecoverable disaster will happen around them. This same quest has been given to all 226 players in the town of Suwon, and Sungwoo is quite pumped up for this quest. The common players from the town become a bit afraid after hearing that they need to protect the world tree against the countless waves of monsters. All of a sudden, they start hearing loud voices coming from a certain direction. It turns out that a horde of monsters is approaching their town. A player from the watchtower informs others that the monsters are approaching them from 3 o'clock. There are a lot of ogres and kobolds are also coming out of the sewers. Spearman Kung Su says that this situation seems familiar to a defense game and he tells everyone else to move to their positions. He orders the tankers to the front and he assigns the archers to be stationed on the watchtowers. The player starts moving big wall-like structures to the front. Hano asks about these big structures and Lieutenant informs him that these are called moving castle walls. They can easily defend a big area after connecting them together. The magicians, archers, and spearmen start boarding the moving castle walls. It can be used as a turret. Hanho is quite amazed by it and he asks about who came up with this idea. Lieutenant says that there are many talented people in the village and they have prepared a lot after the beastmen attack on the Yongdumpo building. Songwoo and Jisun compliment the players for coming up with these amazing ideas and how everyone is equally playing their part. The magicians use wide area magic like fire blasts to get rid of the first wave of goblins. After that, they start disposing the kobolds using crossbows and spears. At the same time, Sungwoo orders his minions to come out of the abyss. The scale of their battle is quite big and it can be seen from far away. It turns out some unknown players are spying on Sungwoo. This player tracked down Sungwoo after going through great lengths. He is quite amazed after seeing such a big battle unfold in front of him. He first thought that it was quite cool that the necromancer went against the absolute race, but now things have changed as the necromancer has a big bounty on his head. He chose option 1 as the free buff was too good to ignore and now all people who chose the first option are searching for Sungwoo right now. He is currently live streaming this whole event and he told the location of Sungwoo to his viewers. He is personally a tracking expert so he leaves the rest of the fighting to other players who are watching his stream. Sungwoo already had an idea about these players so he sent someone to catch them. After a few minutes, one of Sungwoo's orc minion reaches the rooftop where the tracking team is camping. After bonking them, he takes them back to Sungwoo. Hanho informs Songwu that the Korean server is in a total mess as there are five different clans who broadcasted him live just now. And among them, there is a person who officially declared that he will kill the Necromancer. The title of this live stream says that he will blow up the Necromancer along with his followers. And there are 23,000 people watching him right now. This player introduces himself as Terror Kim. He is on level 16 and he is ranked 10 in the Sihuang region. He further says that he will massacre all followers of the Necromancer with the help of a nuclear bomb.
Terry Kim seems to be a bit more serious about his plan than he should be. He pulls out a yellow ball and asks Sung Woo if he likes bombs. He throws away the yellow ball while saying that he have been seeing the necromancer play with the explosive dead bodies all the time. The yellow ball he just threw behind him results in a massive explosion. A huge building behind them crumbles to pieces in a matter of a few seconds. The class of Terra Kim is called Terrorist. That's why he is number one when it comes to handling explosions. He has a specific skill which he uses to make bombs, and that yellow bomb was the weakest among the other ones he can make. He can also create a unique type of bomb after every 24 hours, and all this time he was thinking about where he's going to use that. But now, he is going to use it on the town of Suwon, and he is sure that even the necromancer cannot withstand its impact. He further says that everyone who follows him is a bastard, and he has no remorse even if the whole population of Suwon perishes along with the necromancer. He is determined to level the entire area with the necromancer, and he will make sure to get the bounty placed on Sung Woo's head. Hanho says that something is wrong with this guy's head as he could have just came here in secret and thrown that bomb but he is on stream doing these weird publicity stunts and maybe he is just a bluffer. Ji Seon says that maybe what he is saying is not a bluff and they should be prepared to stop him. Plus, they are in a situation where they can't move their base anymore, which is a major disadvantage. Sung Woo is thinking that this guy has got some screws loose as he's not only just targeting Sung Woo, but he's going to kill everyone in town in order to get experience points and rewards. Sung Woo double checks their whole base for any bombs and he finally comes closer to the World Tree Seed. Spearman Kung Soo reports to him saying that there are no threats nearby right now. Monster mobs have been appearing every now and then which is proving to be good for them. Sung Woo advises them to be extra vigilant as monsters are the least of their worries. Most of the videos uploaded in the online forums must be bluffs but there will always be someone taking this opportunity. After a few minutes, a notification pops up stating that the seed of the world tree has grown up by 11%. Sung Woo is thinking that there has not been much progress after it reached 11% and GCN asks him about what are they going to do after creating the third faction. Sung Woo says that he has no idea about it, but he knows for sure that this was the best option out of all available choices. Sung Woo knows well that there is an ending to this game. He has not seen angels or devils appearing in the prophecy crystals, but he don't think that they will help the humans to get a good ending. That is why it is right for humans to decide an ending for themselves. Besides, Angel and Devil factions are not allies of humans. Just by seeing the quests, he can tell that they are treating humans as existences lower than them by ordering them around. Even if the third option didn't exist, he probably wouldn't have chosen to follow the other two sides. Spearman Kyung Soo is a bit angry as the vampires previously killed his friends and he asks Sung Woo that if they will be able to find out the person who created this game. He really wants to meet the creator of this game who didn't inform the humans about what was going on which resulted in the deaths of countless people. During nighttime, the guards are stationed on the watchtowers. All of a sudden, a big explosion occurs which sends them flying from the watchtower. The whole town gets alerted after hearing the sound of the explosion and Spearman Kung Su orders his men to inform Song Wu about the situation and he further orders his men to fly the drones to find out about the attackers. It turns out that the attacker was Terror Kim and he is laughing out loud with his men. Terry Kim says that their defenses are a bit lacking and he was expecting more of a resistance from the infamous Suwon town which is supported by the second ranked necromancer. Sung Woo comes face to face with Terry Kim but he warns Sung Woo that he already prepared everything in advance and he advises Sung Woo to run away. Terry Kim prepares a big explosion and he says that he's going straight to the climax without any explanations and he tells everyone to take a good look at the ending of the necromancer. The radius of this scale is quite huge and it can totally destroy an entire apartment. A warning notification pops up which informs them that a dark red storm has been called upon in the area. The players of Suwon Town are afraid after watching it and Song Woo tells them all to get down. Song Woo tells Raidi to come up and he jumps up using the shoulder of Song Woo. Raidi jumps up right next to the bomb and he blocks the blast using a shield. Tara Kim becomes confused after watching this. He don't know the reason why his bomb didn't explode and Raidi lands right in front of him. 
Sungwa says that this bomb was a skill, not an item, and he has the best shield to counter skills like these. It turns out the shield Righty just used was the Mountain's Goblin Shield, which Sungwoo previously got after defeating the Red Rider, and this shield can nullify three magic attacks and it has a cooldown of one hour. Tara Kim is in a desperate situation, so he tries to go all out with his next attack, but before he can do anything, his hands get blasted. It turns out Sungwoo used Dwarven Hand Cannon. Sungwoo looks back to find out that the defenders of his town are looking afraid, and their morale is hitting rock bottom as well. Sungwoo calls out the cameraman who came with Tara Kim. Sungwoo powers up as he tells the cameraman to record everything from now on as he's going to make an important announcement. Sungwoo says that he is making three promises to all players in the Korean server. He is going to hunt down and kill all bastards who have announced that they will come to kill him or have prophesied his death. At the same time, Tara Kim tries to pull a sneak attack on Sungwoo but he gets blasted off. Sungwoo goes on to say that he will even kill those bastards who swore an oath to join the Angel or the Devil faction. Sungwoo shoots down every single person who came along with Tara Kim to make his point clear. Sungwoo then revives those players to tell the people who are watching the stream that their suffering will not end, even after their death as he will revive them and torment them for the rest of eternity. But if they join the third faction he's about to create, then he will personally guarantee their safety. Sungwoo is thinking that he is not a good leader as he has not much political knowledge, so it's better if he shows them his strong side. This is the only way he can stop these hyenas from coming after his group. After some time, the attention seeker streamer who was saying that he's going to kill the necromancer performs a public apology on his live stream. He says that his brain was in the gutter and he's sincerely apologizing right now. He further requests that if any one of the friends of the necromancer is watching this stream, they should kindly forward his apology video to him. He further says that he is planning to join the third faction along with his friends. Minhua Song, who is watching the stream, says that she don't know how these brain dead players think that they can kill a person who is on second rank in their server. There is a recent popular post by someone named Miss Choi, who says that these bastards choose the first option while thinking that they can kill the second rank player, or someone else will kill him for them, and all of them will get rewards for free. And right now, they are begging the Necromancer to spare them, and soon, the Necromancer will clean up this whole community from opportunist trashes like these. Min Hwa Song says that this time, the Necromancer did a pretty good job, and the whole server is in an uproar. All the bad comments have disappeared and Sungwoo is getting a lot of appreciation posts and his popularity is skyrocketing through the roof right now. The prosecutor is quite embarrassed as he also chose the Angel faction but he had no idea that Sungwoo was going to make his own faction. He had no other choice but to split with Sungwoo after choosing the Angel faction and now that decision came back to bite him in the ass. Prosecutor orders Min Hwa Sung to recruit more players and form a new scouting team which will be tasked with finding other statues. Min Hwa Sung asks him if he's thinking of making the necromancer his enemy because Sung Woo has declared that he will kill everyone in the angel or devil factions. Prosecutor tells them that he's not that much dumb of a person and he is thinking of using the statues to negotiate with Sung Woo since he is a reasonable person. Prosecutor knows well that he can't make any rash decisions right now and he needs to get stronger or he will be swept away by others. Min Hwa Sung informs the prosecutor that another angel statue was found in the Gimpo area. The prosecutor is quite happy after hearing it and he tells her to tighten the security and start the transportation operation right away. Min Hwa Sung says that this statue is a little different from the previous ones. Unlike the previous angel statue, this one has four wings instead of two. The prosecutor is thinking that maybe there are ranks among the angel statues as well. The monsters kept on raiding the town of Suwon for the next few days. Most of these monsters were low ranked, that's why even Han Ho could kill them with a single punch. The minions are making a quick work of these waves as well. Han Ho and Ji Seon are trying to hold back some trolls but Spearman Kyung Soo spots one more orc coming from the opposite side. The biker gang easily takes care of the orc in a tactical way. They have been fending off large waves of monsters for a very long time, which in turn is helping the world tree grow faster. And right now its growth rate is at 99%. The average level of players is the town of Suwon is soon going to hit level 9. And if they keep on going like this, all of them can soon reach level 15. A notification pops up which states that the growth of the world tree is almost complete and Sungwoo thanks the town's folk for their hard work. 
Another window pops up which informs them that the world tree has reached the first stage of growth. All players who contributed to this quest will receive a permanent status bonus of plus one strength. And those players will be given a blessing for the next 24 hours. This blessing will increase their acquisition rate by 20%. After reading the new system message, Sungwoo goes up to the world tree. After observing it, Sungwoo says that this tree looks no different than any other ordinary tree. Sungwoo touches the world tree and it starts glowing with strange energy. An apple comes out of the tree and the system informs Sungwoo that the world tree just bore its first fruit. And only those deemed worthy can take this fruit. This mystical ranked apple is called the first fruit of the world tree. This fruit is imbued with mysterious power of the world tree and the one who eats it can gain a special power. Without wasting any time, Sungwoo starts munching on the apple. A system notification pops up which informs him that after eating the world tree fruit, he has been linked with the world tree. This is a passive skill called World Tree Linked. Songwoo may gain a certain amount of increased stats whenever the world tree grows and he got a skill called Return. Songwoo can return to the world tree no matter where he is. This skill has a cooldown of 24 hours. Songwoo is thinking that growing the world tree is the best option as it already granted him some stats plus a return skill. He couldn't dare to even try to raid the pirates before since escaping from their clutches might be difficult and he will now head to them once the world tree becomes stabilized. The second phase of Grow the World Tree starts. The world's tree energy has spread even further now and now it will draw in more powerful monsters. All players inside Suwon Town got this notification as well and Lieutenant says that now this quest became even harder and he don't know when it will end. The scout team informs them that their magic drones just detected something coming from their northern sky. These invaders turned out to be the herd of wyverns and they are coming in full swing. Spearman Kyung Soo says that there are too many wyverns and he's wondering if they can even hold them back or not. But Sung Woo says that if this thing had happened in the past then the whole town of Suwon would have perished. But right now, things are a lot different. After a few minutes, the wyverns reach the outskirts of the town. The alpha wyvern is personally leading this pack of wyverns. After coming near the town, they start revolving around the alpha wyverns which in turn makes the town folk more anxious. Han Ho asks why they're just circling around instead of attacking them and it's making him dizzy. Sung Woo is thinking that maybe the wyvern alpha male is gauging his strength. The alpha wyvern is committed to only observing and controlling the wyverns and he almost never participates in a hunt. He is so cautious that he will retreat the moment he feels like his opponent has the upper hand. But this time, Sung Woo will use every single one of them as a fertilizer for the world tree. The Alpha Wyvern gives out a loud roar and the Wyverns start rushing toward the town. After the air raid begins, Spearman Kyung Soo orders his men to wait for now. Once the Wyverns close in on them, Spearman Kyung Soo orders his men to shoot one of their camouflage Thunder God's cannon. The blast of Thunder God's cannon is so strong that it pierces through several Wyverns in a single shot. The townsfolk become motivated after the Wyverns drop dead on the ground. Sung Woo orders his ogre champion skeleton to come out of the abyss right above the wyverns. The ogre skeleton uses his single punch skill to obliterate countless wyverns. Each dead wyvern gives 600,000 gold, which is more than the gold dropped by several high ranked bosses. Sung Woo uses werewolf injection along with his grim reaper state and he tells alpha male wyvern that it's time for him to come down in person. Sung Woo just harvested 48 souls from the dead wyverns and he is thinking that this amount of souls must be enough to deal with the alpha male. For some reason, the wyverns start heading toward the thunder god's cannon. The magic users are trying their best to reload the thunder god cannon but the wyverns are almost upon them. But unknown to them, Sung Woo already placed a trap near the cannon. Necrobot comes out of the abyss and he punches the wyverns in the face. The wyverns start retreating so Necrobot steals the Thunder God's cannon from the humans. Necrobot powers up the Thunder God cannon to the max using his own mana which in turn shreds the wyverns into pieces in a single blow. The remaining wyverns give up on the Thunder God's cannon and they focus their attention somewhere else. All of them start attacking the barrier created by Hanho's father. The barrier will not last for too long and Hanho's father informs others that these wyverns will directly go for the world tree once this barrier is down. Sung Woo activates both Fell Blade and Death Response at the same town in order to cover the outskirts of the town with Breath of the Abyss. The Breath of the Abyss blocks the vision of the Wyverns. 
The wyverns start getting shot down by fire arrows once they get closer to the outer layer of the breath of the abyss. Songwoo gathered all of the souls of wyverns in his Grim Reaper Scythe for a single demonic bombardment attack. Songwoo warns everyone to get away as he's about to use a powerful attack. The demonic bombardment attack shreds through the wyverns like thin paper. Hanho and Jisun seize this chance to launch their attack on the wyverns who just survived the last attack. The wyverns are getting wrecked left and right, but Sungwoo don't know what the alpha male is up to. Jisoo Yun spots the alpha male and she informs others that he's about to shoot something. Alpha Wyvern spits an unknown green liquid from his mouth. Some drops of this liquid drop on the fully armored trolls. This green liquid turns out to be corrosive acid, which easily melts the troll skeletons. Sungwoo thanks the alpha male wyvern for getting rid of those trolls as he was thinking of replacing them with his newly killed wyverns. Sungwoo takes this fight to the sky along with his party members. After witnessing it, Lieutenant says that this is no fight for humans, and Hano's father wants everyone to get back from the drops of this acidic liquid. The alpha male gives a serious look as if he is cooking up something new. But instead of attacking, it starts running away, and Jisun informs Sungwoo about his escape. Sungwoo informs his party members to not let him escape, and they all start chasing after him. After coming close to the alpha wyvern, Sungwoo uses his twilight raid skill on him. The twilight skill completely binds the alpha wyvern, rendering him motionless. They don't have much time left, so Sungwoo along with Jisun rush toward the alpha male at max speed. Both of them attack the wings of the alpha male in order to drop him to the ground. Alpha male could no longer stay in the sky due to the damage to his wings and he starts falling down. Finally, he drops down to the ground with a big bang. Sungwoo tells him to grin his teeth as this is going to hurt a lot. As Sungwoo gets closer to him, he tells him that from today onwards, he will be the conqueror of the skies. But Alpha Wyvern is not going down without a fight, so he tries to bite Sungwoo. But Sungwoo manages to escape his mouth before he can completely close it off. Sungwoo then slashes him with the Grim Reaper Scythe, which deals a lot of damage to Alpha Wyvern, but his resistance is still too high. Jisun tells Sungwoo to get back and he obliges to her request without any question. Jisun uses her skill to find out the weak points of the Alpha Wyvern. In just a few seconds, she is able to pinpoint all of his weak points. She then starts slashing off the weak points of the Alpha Wyvern using both of her swords. Alpha Wyvern has suffered a lot of damage so his unconscious body falls down to the ground. Jisun tells Sungwoo that it's almost over as the Alpha Male cannot move anymore and Sungwoo thanks her for her help. He then orders the Death Knight to deliver the final blow to Alpha Wyvern. The Death Knight uses the Dragon Sword to kill the Alpha Wyvern and they receive over 4 million gold for killing him. The system further informs Sungwoo that a special reward will be given to him for hunting the monster ruler. Sungwoo receives the title of the Sky Conqueror, which increases his agility and stamina by 2, and his physical defense increased by 10% while his wind resistance increased by 20%. There are only 2,733 days left until the dragon egg hatches, and they received 700 days worth by just slaying this one alpha wyvern boss monster. The rewards don't just end here as the B-grade experience card Sungwoo received by killing the Hell's Moving Armor activates by itself. It informs Sungwoo that he has reached the experience points threshold to level up, and it asks Sungwoo if he wants to use this coupon. Sungwoo agrees to use the coupon and he levels up to 21. At the same time, Jisun informs Sungwoo that they have taken care of all straggler wyverns as well. The world tree starts emitting a blue light. A notification pops up informing everyone that the world tree has reached the second stage of growth and it increases Sungwoo's strength by one as he is linked to the world tree. Spearman Kung Su and Hanho's father are quite amazed after watching the growth of the world tree. Hanho says that he don't know why, but the color of the leaves looks off to him. The system window informs Sungwoo that the world tree has developed propensity due to his influence, and Sungwoo is not sure what this propensity is. A new window pops up stating that the world tree has obtained a new ability called Divine Tree Shadow. This ability allows the Divine Tree to form a strong magic barrier throughout the area which will serve as a strong protective shield, and it will restrict unwanted ones from entering the area. The world tree obtained another ability called the one who holds the souls. Whenever a person blessed by the world tree takes the life of someone else, the souls of the dead will be bound to the world tree. Hano's father says that this looks more like a ghost tree which eats souls instead of a world tree. 
Han Ho mocks his father by saying that he must be getting nervous as he had only one barrier ability but now he had been ousted by the world tree. Han Ho's protection skill is off, so his father takes his sweet time to commit some domestic violence. Sung Woo is now at ease because the world tree was so weak before. If that brain dead Tara Kim had thrown even a single bomb at it by surprise, then the world tree would have died right there. This new ability of the world tree called the one who holds the souls is completely similar to the abilities of his Anubis form. Whenever he turns into Anubis, he cannot use his most powerful skills as all of them require souls, and he had to kill the lackeys of the boss in order to acquire those souls. But right now, the world tree will suck the souls of fallen enemies and then he can use those souls right after transforming into Anubis. Sung Woo is amazed as well after seeing the growth of this world tree, all of a sudden, a dark and bright ray enter the radius of the world tree. It turns out the angel faction has increased the bounty on his head by 70 million gold, while the devil faction has increased it by 25 million gold. Plus his influence has grown a lot so the bounty quest has elevated from server quest into a world quest. Starting from now, the players from all over the world will aim for his life. Han Ho informs Sung Woo that he has gone viral worldwide, but not in a good way. Sung Woo is thinking that it is really bad. It forcibly turned into a world class quest since they know he cannot be killed by the Korean players. Han Ho tells Sung Woo that the Chinese pirates must be having orgasms after getting this quest. Ji Seon shuns Han Ho by saying that he should mind his language. But she knows well what Han Ho said has some truth to it as the pirates already hated him and now there's a reward involved in it as well. Hia Yeon from the Gong Ha Island informed them that the pirate community is going crazy about the necromancer and they are saying that they will punish the necromancer for his sins. They have already figured out a way to capture him and they have 3000 players ready under the angel faction. They are boasting that they will conquer Korea right after getting rid of the necromancer. Han Ho informs Sung Woo that greed has taken over the Korean community as well as most of the players are rooting for the pirates to kill him. Sung Woo tells them that they have no choice but to wait and watch how this situation develops. The whole town was on edge and now they are resting. The townsfolk are quite safe as the barrier of the world tree is more powerful than their previous barrier. Han Ho is getting pissed after reading the posts as some posts say that the pirates will hold a grand parade before finishing the necromancer. Plus, they will do this on a live stream so the whole world can watch the end of a pathetic necromancer. Jisian says that she is sure that not only the pirates want Sung Woo dead as the other high ranking players from other servers will try their luck as well. Sung Woo says that the whole world must be curious about the one who defied both absolute races. Sung Woo is thinking that if these players were after him then there was not that much of a big deal. But it seems like most of them are after the Korean server as well. He is pissed as the angel and devil factions are controlling the quests while they are not getting any compensation. All of a sudden, a system notification pops up stating that the world tree's attention is on him and a quest has been created. This is a party quest called the counter-attack strategy. The goal is to broadcast the scene where he severely damages other factions. As a reward, a party skill and a party item will be given to him. It further states that the absolute races are wary of the rise of a new force. They are deploying all type of tactics to keep the necromancer in check by ridiculing him in a variety of ways and declaring a war even before the new faction is established. This will leave a negative impact on Sung Woo and the reputation of his faction. That's why a response from Sung Woo is needed. He needs to prove to his enemies wrong by having more people witness it through the broadcast. There is a condition to this quest which states that he needs to attack his enemies before they strike him and if a scene of him being defeated is exposed then he will be given a penalty. Sung Woo is thinking that maybe the system is trying to make this quest more intense by putting the condition of broadcasting. Sung Woo takes out his legendary rank Angel's Wing Piece which he received after destroying the first angel statue and this item can teleport the user to the location of another angel statue. Sung Woo says that he needs to teach a serious lesson to these pirates. The Divine Tree Shadow skill is active around the town of Suwon and the Barrier Shield has health over 150,000. There are only 226 people currently allowed inside the barrier. The townsfolk are feeling quite safe by having this barrier. Spearman Kyung Soo further informs Sung Woo that the range of this barrier is 2 kilometers and the allowed players are free to enter or exit the barrier. Sung Woo asks Han Ho's dad if he's using the vault item well to fund the city operations and he replies with a yes. 
Hanho's father further informs him that they have accumulated a lot of gold. They already have enough batteries and purifiers, so now they will purchase some drones from the store. Lieutenant further informs them that they will be purchasing auto parts as well. They can even make a siege weapon or a blueprint item. Sungwoo tells them to not hold back on the spending of the money and it will be great if they can make weapons like the Thunder God's Cannon. Hanho informs Sungwoo that he received a report from Guanghua Island. It turns out the pirates will start a parade at the Memorial Hall base tomorrow at 3 p.m. And the beastmen who were expelled or treated disdainfully will also participate to strengthen their solidarity. Jisian says that they look desperate as all vermin are joining hands right now. Sungwoo says that he will have to attend this parade secretly and mess them up real bad this time. Meanwhile, at the office of Yongdongpo Guild, the prosecutor is on a bit of an edge. It turns out they moved the angel statue to their base and it gave them a quest. They need to clear the devil faction members from the metropolitan area. Their goal is to destroy the devil statue in the northern district. As a reward, a faction skill and a rank point will be given to them. The angel faction will obtain blessing once the battle begins and this blessing will increase their defense by 20%. The same quest is given to the devil faction as well and the quest will fail once the angel statue is destroyed. Min Hum Song says that the angel statue is trying to impose a war on them, while Min Hua Song informs them that there are no big rewards for this quest. But they have no other choice as that guild in possession of the devil statue must have gotten the same quest. The prosecutor asks them about the identity of the guild which is in possession of the devil statue and Min Hua Song informs them that it must be the reconstruction guild. After they failed to raid Song Wu, they held them responsible and now it's hard for the prosecutor to avoid this fight. A crusader bursts in the room with bad news. It turns out their guard post of Dasan area has been ambushed. The surveillance team that witnessed it stated that the crusaders were not killed by monsters but a player. The prosecutor becomes pissed after realizing something. A war quest has been given to everyone belonging to the devil or the angel faction. As a reward, the attack power and defense power of the winner faction will be increased by 30% for seven days. Both factions need to conquer three areas which include Bukhansan, Kwangwon University, and Chongyangyi Station. Every single player who belongs to either Devil or the Angel faction can participate in this quest. After the announcement of this quest, a lot of movement starts throughout the Korean server, and the prosecutor is afraid that this quest can easily escalate to a big-scale war.